Welcome everybody to finals day here at the Masters Tour Spring Championship. We've had two whole days of group action and now we're down to the quarterfinal stages. And we need to talk about those our so our, those things is subtle. There we go. Customary botch. Uh, subtle, what have you made of the first two days of action? I thought you were just introducing my multiple personalities. Don't worry about it. It's, it's fine. I was, I was going to go with it. Yeah, it's been it's been a great event. It's uh, been a long time since we could talk about you know two days of action to lead us to this point. And I really do think it's of benefit to the tournament as a whole. Longer time to get your teeth sunk into the uh, the stories and the trends of the tournament. Get a bigger sample of games for uh, deck lists to be seeing what's working and what isn't. And just more hours of Hearthstone equals more good in my book. So I've been a big fan of everything that's gone on so far. And uh, I think we've got a fantastic top eight ahead of us. We absolutely have. Um, quick review of what's going on. We are playing to get into that World Championship. And there will be two people qualifying for it. That's the important stuff for today. Um, obviously 50,000 on the line. But that shot at 350,000. And the World Champion title. Um, always the big deal, which means that the semi-finals will be particularly interesting today. And obviously winning this quarter-final means you're one step away. So already looking pretty close for these people. They must be getting pretty nervous already. Yeah, a bit of a throwback to some of the old Hearthstone Championship Tour events where the semi-finals were those win and in games and the finals are just playing it out for the title of champion. But what I will say is with only a few of these events this year, being a uh, those chances to be a champion of something in Hearthstone are getting very, very sparse. So I'm sure the players will be very, very motivated indeed to take one of those home. We are looking at Conquest, of course. If you followed any competitive Hearthstone over the last few years, I'm sure you are very familiar with what that means. If not, we'll get our teeth sunk into it as it comes up over the course of the day. And if you have not been following along, if, you're, if you've been taking a break from Hearthstone and you just got a live notification on a fine Sunday morning, afternoon or evening, depending on where you are, and like, oh, check out some Hearthstone. This is the latest expansion that Hearthstone has to offer for you. And I think overall it's been a very, very well-received one. I think the casters ourselves are very big fans of the uh, the theme and mechanic of the uh, tournament. If you have been taking a break, it's a bit of a nostalgia act, Wizbang's Workshop, in terms of Hearthstone's history. So it might be a good time for you to jump back in. Yeah, and how do you feel that the expansion has played into this tournament compared to previous rotations? Has it been a big rotation for you, or has it been sort of a, a bit of a tweaky rotation? How would you assess it this the time around? So the thing I love about this rotation, I'm not a big rotation guy because rotations happen and it the power level of the game naturally goes down, right? Because you're dealing with less cards total, which means you have less options, which generally means less powerful decks being output at the end of it. Um, I think they've done a great job with rotating cards out, but then introducing a single set of high enough power level that it's kept the power of the game feeling very high, which is what I like to experience. And I think... Also, we've got create we've created a meta game that players are very happy to sink their teeth into as well. Like most players, I think, if you pin them down, would say there are one or two decks that they really, really enjoyed playing because of the agency and the decision base that, that are present in the in the decks, which is what you really, really want for a high level tournament like this. Yeah, just a very quick recap of what we've already talked about. The last two days have been the group stages, which have got us down to this top eight. Uh, but yeah, getting back to the meta game as we've addressed the thing on the screen. Um, <laughs> I feel that this meta is really interesting in that I don't think we have perfect 30s for many of the decks yet. I think we've got sort of perfect 26s and 28s, but I feel like the players are still fiddling around. Yeah, and I think as we look at who has been successful and who hasn't in this tournament, I do think lineup discrepancies have had a little to do with it. You would be forgiven at taking a cursory glance at the lists and the lineups that have been brought to this tournament and saying that they look quite similar overall. There have been quite a few similar patterns throughout, but there are these very different tweaks that people are going with. There's different third and fourth decks, there's different band strategies, there's different builds of Shaman or Priest, for example, um, within the same archetype, just sort of three or four cards different from each other. Um, and I think those choices have had a big, big impact on getting players to this point. Particularly, the two I would shout out are Habu Gabu and Molestar mm -hmm. in terms of lineup edge, maybe bringing them to the dance in this one. 
Uh, but as you look at this top eight now, there is a very, very interesting range of lineups in there. You know, we've got the decks that are fairly ever present. You know, some kind of warrior, some kind of demon hunter, some kind of shaman. Most people have some variety of that. But some people have still skipped shaman because they had that read. As we talked about before, there was going to be lots of speaker stompers, neophytes, that kind of thing going on in the game. So some people have skipped shaman. We're seeing some giant rogues in here. We're seeing a sludge warlock in here. We're seeing various different varieties of warrior thrown in as well. Um, there's there's a lot to be talking about uh, going into this one. And that's good because that's what we're here to do is talk about a lot of Hearthstone. And we have got the vast majority of the Hearthstone that is going to be played today we are going to bring to you. And we're going to kick it off with Tabika and Habu Gabu. And I say it like that because Habu last night qualified in his decider match in something like 20 minutes. I mean, that's I haven't checked, but it felt like 20 minutes. He just absolutely destroyed for easy event. Yeah, it wouldn't surprise me if you could find a game, an individual game in the Bunny Hopper series that was longer than Habu Gabu's whole series, and it goes to speak to that uh, kind of lineup edge that he probably had in that series. Very, very destructive with some of his decks like the uh, Sludge Warlock. What is very good news for Tobika, though, is that he hasn't fallen all the way into the trap that Habu Gabu has laid for people. Mm -hmm. uh, Habu Gabu, through use of tech cards and through use of adding Sludge Warlock into his lineup, which is much burstier than some of the other decks uh, that you're seeing people bring, uh, is trying to prey on a few decks uh, uh, with the, the Pain Warlock, the Custom Warlock, as we are referring to it as, being one of them, which Tabika does not have. Decks like this, like a, a Control Warrior, the Hybrid Warrior in this case, like uh, the Reno deck with several two obs, but not two obs all the way down, this is resilient enough that Habu Gabu is at least going to actually have to sink his teeth into a game of Hearthstone, right? He's not just going to play a game where his opponent does 67% of the damage that he needs for him and he only <laughs> has to do the last 10. However, just to be slightly facetious, um, Tabika did fall into the trap of bringing Rogue. Um, so we'll see how that goes, because I've not been impressed with that deck so far. It looks very shaky to me, but here he is in the top eight, so he's doing something like right. Yeah, and certainly through Nature of Conquest, that uh, has to be picking up victories somewhere along the way, because I don't think it's picking up too many bands. You can look now at Habu Gabi's list of Zarimi Priest, which is very different from what you normally see. He is playing the Glowstone Gaia Worms, which have Forge on them. A lot of the time, you're just looking to quick draw them and kind of bypass the Forge. But habu has gone with the interesting choice of then also tossing an Ignis in there, so that in some very slow matchups, he can drop the Forge on one of those Glowstone Gaia Worms, drop the Ignis, go for maybe a high-value weapon, with 5 or 10. He was even talking in the interview about how uh, against Pain Warlock you can drop it and go for one mana poisonous weapon in that scenario as well to try and get over the edge. And there's also uh, that Razor Scale thrown in there as well which we were also very lucky to hear from Harbu about his thoughts and just all the different cards. Because uh, there's a lot of mana cheat in modern Hearthstone. It's a thing that some people <laughs> like. It's a, lot of some, a lot, uh, it's a thing that some people hate. Um, but uh, Habu Gabu is coming with the tools to make sure that there are no zero mana molten giants. There are no uh, massive clergy funnel cake turns coming out from opposing Zarimi priests. He is going to be making sure, even called out Warrior in particular, right, with the Garrosh's gift into Brawl as a thing that he can now make cost seven instead of six. Uh, by using the dragon as well. So it was great to hear from him on just his his targets for some of these tech cards. Yeah, and then there's just the raw, basic version of the deck, which is most of it still, which is really good against Warrior, which is where we're at first first game of the day for Habu. Got a, a matchup advantage naturally here. Of course, yesterday we will point out... That, sorry. He did just draw those guy worms back to back, so the quick draw was really quite relevant as well to win the, the final game of the day. What do you what do you yeah. think about that, well, first off, uh, shout out to Habu as well for being fully accepting of the fact that drawing uh, Drifter into Gaia Worm into Gaia Worm was just a little bit fortunate of a way to uh, close out the series last night. But this opening hand as a set against Warrior is fantastic. Duplicating Funnel Cake is such a huge boon and picking up another one. Yeah, you can see. Uh -huh. I think a very similar noise came out of Habu Gabu's mouth as came out of mine one turn earlier because that is a three dupe pip the potent with one of those cards being a funnel cake. I think the only thing that would really make this start stronger for Habu is if there was a clergy thrown in there as well. Yeah, even having the, the snake oil to be able to try and find the 
the card draw that he does need, this hand on its own, we're, we're both excited by it, but it doesn't actually get you there without something happening. Um, it'll get you a long way towards getting there, and any card draw with double funnel cake will get you there. But on its own, not quite there yet, so curious to see how he develops from here. Does he want to get the card draw straight away, or does he just want to start getting those so dragons slapped onto the board? So first thing I do want to make sure we're paying attention to with, with that statement in mind is on its own, just playing pretty much your entire hand here, which you can do with the funnel cakes, is a buttload of stats on the board, mm -hmm. is I believe the technical term for it. You have three Chirurgeons and you have two gift wrap whelps, which will represent actual attack on the board as well, mm -hmm. which is very, very nice to have, right? Warrior clears of that standard do not come out super early. Right when when you're actually dropping that much health on the board as well, uh, through the the health buffs that you're getting from two or three chirurgeons, depending on uh, how you choose to drop them, that's kind of hard to deal with. Yep. And he is going to yeah, just use um, as much stuff as he can. You, you've taught me this over and over again, and I still instinctively don't like let it be believed. <laughs> you just dump the maximum numbers you can on the board every single turn. Yep. Creating another three dragons means it's Yeah, and to be fair to you come. and to be fair to Harbu, this isn't technically turn off your brain and play max stats every turn. He would have got more numbers by just uh, spending three on more one mana dragons as opposed to the pip. But this does mean that, say, that board that got played did get cleared over one or two turns. I don't think it was ever getting cleared over one, but maybe you can piece something together uh, with Aftershock and Bladestorm over the course of two turns then if that does get cleared, you, you at least have a monstrous refill still to come here. But no thoughts of holding onto the funnel cakes or anything like that. Just get it all oh, no. You Play Use it. everything yep. you can use is kind of where I was going with that. Um, yep. He's trying to work out, could I, could I have done that slightly Ooh! differently? Oh my goodness. There's Ozarimi. Yep. You've just seen your opponent use lots and lots of stuff. So what do we play? Salesman on one. Yep. Uh, then coin pip. Then one Chirurgeon, one gift wrapped whelp. So yeah, we're too yeah, far right. away. So it is going to take us to at least turn six, no matter what, to get the Zarimi active. There's no way to accelerate it faster than that, I don't think. Unless we draw, of course, there is still one funnel cake remaining in the deck, which might be able to make some magic happen. Is there any um, reason to try and disguise it, like wait till turn seven to do it? Just so that your opponent doesn't... I mean, they, they know it's in your deck, so they don't know you've got it. Because you play a scale replica on five, they know exactly what they're up against. Or just doesn't it matter? Do you just kill them anyway? Yeah, I don't think it matters too much, because... Warrior understands the assignment here, right? They have to keep the board clear so that they can't get hit by those two turns. I don't think they're going to be spectacularly greedy in any spot. You can make an argument that if you conceal some information, they might get baited into just like jamming Bran on curve or something like that. I could see that as an argument. But the fact that it just delays you one whole turn anyway, I think you are just going to try and set it up for, uh, for turn six. Because okay, I, I was obviously distracted by the... Um... The, get the gift in hand <laughs> to be good. I guess is why I went down that line of thinking. Yeah. Turn off my brain and just make things happen. So much better. Right, but it's not like if you just, you know, played, if you cycled the, the snake oil and you played your two one drops yeah, and you went yeah. face with everything. It's not like they wouldn't then play gift into brawl, right? They would definitely still play gift into brawl yeah. on that hand. Oh, <laughs> so close! So close wow. to specifically being the scenario that Haru called out in the interview yesterday. Yep. Exactly what you were talking about, exactly what he was talking about. Razor Scale shutting down the gift. Oh my goodness. Which is just not a thing I would think was that relevant, and he specifically highlighted it, and here it is. It's quite ridiculous how good he is in this game. And it would almost immediately win the game if he was able to play it this yeah. time. Yeah. Which... Like obviously, he was never going to get it off the uh, the draw two. That's always going to get you Zarimi in a one drop at that point, as long as Zarimi is still in the deck. It does, of course, then guarantee drawing the Razor Scale if you already have the Zarimi in your hand, which is uh, kind of a cool interaction as well. So, yeah, this is enough stuff. So. 
no need to play more stuff because if this doesn't get dealt with, Zarimi wins, so that's fine. Yeah, my point of contention here would probably be what? Um, I forgot the name of the card. Uh, Trial by Fire, which is actually yeah, not in the deck for, uh, for oh. the speaker, so that makes sense. Yeah. So the, the, the one thing that was wrong with it isn't wrong with it. That sounds good. Big fan. Mm -hmm. Abu looking pretty nervous. He, like, to be, he's just not getting through here, but... I'm, I'm just trying to calculate if this is lethal now, but I think with a 2-6 dirty route and a frozen 4-6, it's probably not. You would hope it isn't, because Tabika has the information that the Zarimi is there, so you would yeah. hope that a play was not made that just left lethal on board. That being said, even without the lethal, how we can just do damage with this guy and, and stack things up, say do it again. Might want to choose to forge even and get Ignis going. Or we might just want to Zerimi, have the extra turn, and do a lot of damage, which is, again, something that you've told me time and again that I still refuse to listen to. <laughs> taking two turns is generally more powerful than taking one. I'm not, I'm not sure what you're struggling with on that front. I mean, you pay three for wild growth, so you're paying two for an extra turn, a five-seven. Ah. Yeah. <laughs> uh. Here. Yeah, buff sequencing. You've got a lot of counting to do as well, um, which I was trying to do in my moments of silence. Obviously, the 1 2 trading in is fairly obvious to make the board space, and you have to decide where to go from there. But now we are left with uh, 5, 7, 11, 12, 15, 20 in play. So, yeah, Tobika has calculated this really, really well here because even with what? the Gaia Worm. You can only trade one damage into the extra if you'd like. Because there's so much health on the board, it's actually very difficult to trade away your minions to make space uh, for those sources of damage. It's 23, right? Is it 23? Five, seven, if you trade seven, in your 2-1 and then you play the guard. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah. Yes, 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 yes. I was just counting the damage that was on the board as it existed. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I think you would lose to specifically Zilliax here. Um, but not don't think you lose to anything else. Which is why he's played it this way. Ah. Uh, where? It won't go anywhere. That, uh, that funnel cake being given to Tobika could actually end up being kind of crucial here because... I like the way this setup is happening, where Habu's just like, okay, draw all the cards, try and save up some direct damage in my hand, forge the uh, the Gaia Worm, this is the way I have I have Ignis, I have Forge, I have tons of damage I can throw at my opponent's face. If they play Gift into Brawl, that's their entire turn, so they then don't have any armor to gain, and I probably just kill them, right? However, being able to gain two extra mana from the Funnel Cake might just be able to make some magic happen. Sure, yeah. Especially this early in the game. I mean, it feels like it's not early in the game because you're looking at this monstrous board, but it is still pretty early. An extra two mana is a lot this early, especially for Warrior. No shield block in hand, though. Well, if you go, so if you go Gift for shield block, that's three. Play the Funnel Cake, uh, which three adjacent minions are available. Uh, so you will have then spent four and you get three back. You'll be back up to six. You can then play Sanitize at the end of it, but that's still not good enough to clear the 5-7 and the 5-10. That does not help. Essentially, I'm trying to find a way to play yeah, yeah. a better removal than Brawl, because Brawl is going to leave one minion up that you then have to uh, allocate the rest of your mana to deal with. Yes. With Guy Worm Ziliax in hand, that's a lot more damage still to come, depending on what lives here. A little thing moved. Oh, that's crucial, right? Still one short.
you can get the Ziliax down if you play the Drifter and then the Guy Worm right, but you just can't get the extra point of damage. Right, so you may just want to load up the Ignis instead, or is it better to go for the board first? I guess next turn you can go Ignis into 5 mana weapon for yes. a ton of damage if you hit Wind Fury anyway. It's just playing Ignis now would give you the option to go for 10, which is kind of universally good, even if it isn't immediate lethal. I think that's probably mm -hmm. the big dilemma here. Right, let's see what he chooses to go for. Yeah, that looked tenny. That looked very tenny. Apparently there was um, a 6 damage in there, I didn't see what the first thing was. But he the picked first it, one was... he must have liked it. <laughs> Yeah, I was going to say, the first one was picked so quickly, you get quite suspicious that it was uh, Wind Fury more than anything else, right? Yeah. But Harbu really uh, settling in now, saying, okay, we're playing the long game. And I I'm glad I set this up going in, because this, this set with the, the Forge on the Gaia Worm and the Ignis, this allows Harbu to uh, grind out games with this Priest in an additional way. I've talked about how the conventional lists do it, which generally comes from... Uh, the the Titan and then the discovered legendaries from the Titan abilities and then using power cord synchronize on various iterations of those um, one of legendaries that you can find to be able to do some some crazy stuff that you can piece together. But Harbu here nice. just showing, hey, all you got to do is put a forge card in your deck and you're chilling. Yeah, and it's great, right? He, he gets to make a board here that is just going to be terrifying and yep. then just you know, hit you with your ten drop. Um, in a lot of worlds. What? Something that fascinates me about this matchup is that every board space, not now, but every board space matters. Oh, takes the guy work. Okay, 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 okay. I thought you wanted to synchronize the drifter, so I was surprised that the uh, razor scale was going into play because then obviously yes. the drifter cannot cannot cost zero anymore. But actually, just takes the extra burst damage. All right. Finding extra uses for the guy worm. Um. Pretty good, right? Just five burst damage. He really rates burst damage. There is a lot of it in his lineup. And he is the yeah. only player to really do it that way this time around. Obviously, yes, Shaman has burst damage, I understand. But he's managed to find burst damage in his other decks as well that aren't Shamans. And I have to do it. I, look, I, you know I have to do it, right? You know I have to say it. Go on. There's an inactive Reno in hand. There you go. Are you happy now? No! It gives me... Look, being this right all the time is a curse, okay? I take no joy from it. Okay. You, you, you do a very bad job of hiding your lack of joy. Yeah, that is a lie, to be fair. But, but lying's fun. Remember yesterday that I said that Habu Gabu had a year when he was quite good that was quite good? Yeah, yeah. So, the, the last year of, like, the open-ish Masters Tours... Fury Hunter, Habu, and Bunny Hopper were three of the top four win rate players that year. <laughs> they all made it to this. That is quite a good year. Yeah, Habu, really Habu's... good. So his, so his quite just... good year as he wins that game was um, six tour stops, three top eights, 36 wins, 14 losses. <laughs> it's pretty good. It's pretty it's good. 72%. 72%. And you can see uh, you can see that level of skill coming through at the end of that game there because I, like an idiotic boob, wanted to just make uh, more additional four sixes, which, by the way, would have also won that particular game in the world of results where it happened. But say there was an active Reno in hand, for example. Well, at that point, that's one of the only things that you're going to end up losing to. At that point, having extra four six on the board that turn is useless, but an extra five damage burst over the course of the game is much more important. Uh, crucial mechanics knowledge as well that forging actually transforms the card into a new card ID. So when you do use the power card synchronized, you get the forge version back in hand so you can use the battle cry as expected. So you can see here with that setup, Habu had everything covered because even with the Glacial Shard coming down, preventing all the damage from that Wind Fury weapon, which we uh, did get to catch was Wind Fury at the end, uh, still had that big enough board set up without the additional Drifter to be able to represent that damage from hand with the Gaia Worm anyway. Really, really nicely done. Yep, absolutely. Um, I think the Warrior will have fairly good matchups the rest of the way, but getting, getting the Priest out of there, getting the 1-0 lead, fantastic news for Habu. And now we get to look at his Shaman deck. Um, the 
the creativity doesn't stop. I know that other people play this, but this is a whole lineup full of things that we're not quite seeing all the time as we see the jive insect shaman. Yeah, jive version of the deck for Harbu Garbu. Like I said, other people have brought it, um, but even then there's a little bit of variation going on. Um, Harbu is playing a Blood Mage Thanos in there. He's playing a uh, Cactus Cutter as opposed to the Dry Scale Deputies, which is a point of debate as well. He's got two Jazz Bases in there, which isn't always a thing. He's got one uh, Conductivity in there, which is sometimes two, because sometimes you play two copies of Conductivity and then have the Discover spell tossed in there as well. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can just do that full hand refill of random stuff. So this is kind of what we were talking to, uh, talking about, sorry, at the start of the broadcast of even within these decks that are kind of agreed on to be good, most top players agree that some form of Burn Shaman is really good. There's still immense debate, even breaking it down at the first point of the flowchart, Jive version or Spell Damage version, and then even within those two branches, there's then little micro discussions about whether it's two of this, one of this, this card instead of this card. You know, the, like, that idea of there not necessarily being perfect 30s is, uh, I think, a very a very astute observation from you. And I don't know how much of that is to do with uh, Casey taking a little bit more of a backseat this time around. Just going to throw <laughs> that out there. No? Yeah, that's yeah. the point. Wait, yeah. Where's Casey's perfect 30 for us? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so something I haven't actually been on broadcast with you specifically when I've said this yet. So I'm going to say it again for the third time. Um, in the olden days, I was I was taught in this sort of situation. <laughs> you, you play flash here, and then you reflexes, and then you make a load of tempo with um, spirits, that sort of thing. That's not quite as good anymore as a thing to do for tempo because there's a lot less to find in there, and you're not playing natural. So many minions naturally in your deck as well. Is that correct? You sort of need to hold on to combo a bit more. So I think you may be doing that thing that you do sometimes where you are confusing individual pieces of advice you've received with mm -hmm. uh, no real context applied. I think generally the tempo flash kind of plays with the older version of the deck came against like other aggro decks where yes. like a hunter a hunter who like threw out a couple of four ones over the first couple of turns right and no, you no just way. play yeah. your fl yeah. you just play your flash into your lightning reflexes and then you'd, you'd counteract it that way. I think more tellingly, the old version of the deck had better tempo plays for turns two, three, and four in it naturally, right? With, like, it played mm. natural copies of Feral Spirits. It played natural copies of Turn the Tides. Um, so you, it played Piranhas, which would could yes. sometimes just be oppressive boards of right on their own. So I think this is a build of the deck that is just much less able to play for tempo in general. Um, and yes, those cards have been removed from the Discover pool as well, but I think it's much more telling that they're just not in the deck naturally anymore, and the deck just kind of has to be a lot more all-in on just an, an outright burn strategy. I think um, Habu here having a long thought, because how do you want to do this? Um, save up for a lot of damage and then go for triple, triple drive in one turn, or do you want to just take it a bit more steady? Which, which way are you going first, I guess is the question. You're going to need to unload both sets of stuff. You're going to need to unload the hand damage. You're going to need to do the combo. Um, when are you going to set that up? <laughs> Big turn. I'm going to go out on a limb here and place an argument that you don't win too many games of Hearthstone where you totem pass on turn 5. But maybe Habu Gabu can prove me wrong. He has a lot, a metric lot of damage next turn. Yes. The, uh, the moving target is already 49, though. It is, but if he can do, let's say, 30, just for the sake of that's how much this deck does on turn 6 quite often... And in the process, set up his Jive Insects for the turn after. How about that? I mean, that sounds lovely. Mm -hmm. But does this hand do 30? Yeah. That's eight spells, right? Yeah. I'm, I'm confident. Okay, I mean, I can tell. I'm often confident. I'm not often right, but it doesn't matter. Being confident <laughs> is all it is. 
Strong and wrong. It's the Neil Bond <laughs> brand. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm less confident now. <laughs> Noticeably less confident now. You're not getting the spell damage back. You better start chucking it. Yeah. yeah just wonder if he, if he finds a jive here. Does he? He doesn't have the mana, right? No, no, no. Absolutely not. Very rare. You're going to make a jive oh. insect turn happen without the jazz base. Double flash in hand, though, for later. And he did do eight damage. <laughs> <laughs> it's nearly thirty. I was close. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, to yeah, but just to go... He did pull the plug when he saw the double flash, right? He just decided to wait for later. Yes, yeah, I think so. Um, but to go back to the point on the Jive Insect, like, the Jive Insect is almost a very separate thing to the rest of the burn, because, like, for, for no bigger reason, Jive Insect is specifically a fire spell, by the way, so it's not like mm -hmm. you can discover extra copies of it. It's not like it's getting discounted by Flash of Lightning either. Um, so most of the time you're going to need to get that jazz bass rolling to have any kind of effective Jive Insect turn uh, at the end of it all. So they do kind of play out as, as different tools. Like if you can get the jazz bass down early, obviously you can then do the thing where you play a flash, you play all of your lightning bolts and everything else right. as your overload cards for the jazz bass and then break the jazz bass at the end of that turn and get a zero mana Jive Insect thing going. But that's a very, very specific, like perfect scenario pan out for the deck that does uh, not happen particularly often. I feel like it's close to what he's going to have to go for here. Um, double flash, of course, will allow everything to cost basically zero apart from the jive. Mm -hmm. Which might be useful, of course. Well, might be useful, because on the way, the pop-up box will generate enough things for the, uh, the conductivity to do the, its work. Something that top players do, a l will pay a lot of attention to, that players like me do not, is... Here's a board. It's got some naught ones on it, but it's got four attack. You're going to have to t decide whether you want to take four or deal with this mess. And at the same time, you know, keeping hand size sensible. And the top players do get so much damage from these two ones and two twos over the course of, you know, a day's hearthstone. <laughs> a day's hearthstone, yeah. Because at some point the warrior says, well, you know what, I just don't want to kill that stupid 2-1. I'm going to take 2, and one day that matters. Yeah, I mean, that's the part that you do have to process, right? Is that even every small minion that you end up playing, even if it can be cleared easily, it still costs them mana to do so. And that's mm. mana that's not being spent on gaining armor, or drawing cards, or various other things that they can do, which are actually far more detrimental to your long-term game plan. Yep. We could playing something alongside them out here, so that if there was um, the temptation to just conductivity jive here to do 24, it's a good chance it only does 8, which would be absolutely catastrophic, so fends that off. Whereas taking 24 would have been kind of awkward. Yep, very fair. But with the jazz base lined up now, and double flash in hand, there's a lot of great options available for Habu to actually do the thing we're saying was kind of difficult, all in one turn. Yeah, double flash is available this turn, still has enough mana to drop the jazz base. The only issue with that is it doesn't really address the board that he's been presented with particularly well. You can play one pop-up book this turn as well to be able to deal with it. Mm -hmm. Looks like he is going to go single flash, though. So on the double flash front, the only thing that really affects that's going to have any significant impact on you is conductivity. Yeah. Uh, you can also uh, find uh, Elixir, which it can have an impact on as well. But in terms of the natural cards in your deck, that's really the only one it affects. Every other card that you're interested in costs one anyway, or functionally zero, as you would hope Crash of Thunder costs. Yeah, Elixir obviously is, is interesting because that's an, um, if you do decide to go a different way, you can get a lot of card draw out of that. But yeah, um, with the Jive, not likely to be happening this time around.
And here come the Stompers. Yeah, I was talking about this a lot on day one, right? And I think we had a discussion on day two about how much Stomper people were expecting mm. in the tournament. But I think with Shaman being... Shaman being a deck that everyone expected, but also... I don't think anyone really wanted to build a strategy around ban Shaman, because it just didn't work that well. Yeah. Um, and Shaman just having this sort of one glaring weakness, which is it really holds up a glowing neon sign of when you should play your spell disruption cards by playing Flash of Lightning, which is yet another reason, by the yes. way, from Harbu's side to actually do them one at a time and spread them out as he's now currently doing. Yeah, I got there, but I was, I was letting you finish. I should have interrupted and made myself sound clever, honestly. <laughs> um. Shut up, shut up! I want to make the point. I'm smart. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Exactly that. Yeah. Everybody already knows I'm smart. It's fine. <sighs> so, what's the plan for the rest of this turn? Yeah, just, you've actually got some work to do yourself here, right? From Habu's point of view, you've got to actually get rid of some of this. It's starting to become annoying. Yeah, I can't let him keep just stacking armor and drawing cards. He wants to push this point of damage. He really wants to push it. I, I mean, I I adore the fact that he's thinking about it this hard because it could be absolutely crucial for sure. Yeah, and the, the problem what's now... Doing? Yeah. Five, five cards left remaining in deck, yes. So now he's used Stomper to disrupt on the flash turn now he can play the Reno the Reno also disrupts the lethal because it limits the amount of spell damage spots that you can put in play and also uh, limits the amount of rags that you can put in play to precisely one so um, he now has back to back disruption tools uh, for a couple of turns from Tabika and this is going to buy uh, him so much extra time to uh, just gain extra armor or set up win conditions of his own from here yeah how many overload cards here for Habu in the deck, um, having drawn the the Titan? It'd be kind of fun, but yeah, getting the Fizzle for another go at everything. That's it. Habu has successfully spent four of his ten available mana. Mm -hmm. oh. Well... <laughs> Better get opening them packs. That looks like Tabika is back in. Our uh, spectator is not currently, which is, uh, I suppose, at least good news for the player involved. And. It's time to get boomed. I mean, that was yeah, probably high-end result for Habu, and it's still a disaster, right? Yep. Uh, worth noting as well, I've been a little bit critical of the amount of Glacial Shards that we've seen in this tournament, particularly from some players who are banning Demon Hunter, but it is worth pointing out the argument to the contrary, that it can actually have an effect on other matchups as well. You see here, if the Shaman is going to be going with the Jazz Base and the Rag uh, version of the deck, that delaying that popping of the weapon can be absolutely huge for you if you can time it right. Yeah, um, and that is timing it right. There's absolutely nothing Habu can do here. I mean, there's plenty he can do, but none of it's actually going to do 55 damage or even resemble it um, into the card draw that Tabika has available. And every turn you wait and don't just start committing all this damage is a turn that you risk losing that entire hand and the remainder of your deck. Yeah, exactly. You've got to find ways to do this as quickly as possible. Um, looks like he's just going to go in and do some damage with this combo. Yeah, it makes sense. 16 damage to kill the minion. It's okay if they don't have a million card draws in their million card draw deck. Yep. If you got all three go to face, that would probably be ideal, because right now the the cost for your opponent to deal with this is two mana on a blade storm, and it's all gone, <laughs> yeah. right? Which is... So uh, the extra eight damage to face and leaving the 7-7 seven, seven in play would actually have been uh, somewhat beneficial there for Habu, even more so than the extra damage. It is looking a bit bleak. There is still... The... I think you went through this yesterday in a match. Um... 
As long as the snapshot survives, games can still change, maybe. Yeah, huge maybe. But a maybe nonetheless. It's just a way of hiding your cards from being eliminated from the game. Do you want <laughs> this in a bigger size? Well, the warrior's down to only 45, Sotl. This is okay. But things are living. Oh no, never mind. More, more card draw. It's fine. More, yeah, more card draw. A little bit strange though, because now there is the uh, the two two in play, right? Where you can't uh, mm -hmm. use the blade storm. Do you still have that sanitize <laughs> available? <laughs> okay, yeah, fine. Get rid of that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the rope starts going. You just find a solution and go with it, right? You hate how it looks. You're like, you know what? This can't be very wrong. It kills that thing. Yeah, very awkward in the end, not necessarily through any great fault of uh, Tabika's, because those last two cards are the uh, the remaining TNTs. Uh, his Bran was bottom three, so obviously he's yeah. only getting the, uh, the three TNTs thrown in there as well. So he has had some awkward hurdles of his own to overcome in this position. Went for the card draw knowing he was incredibly likely to uh, at least hit one or two. Uh, or at least hit one of those TNTs and end up hitting zero, which then made the uh, the end of the play look a little bit silly. But I think the uh, the plan to begin with is reasonable. Here we go. Dodged. Didn't dodge. No, and it's gone. That <laughs> TNT destroyed ten cards. Well done, TNT. Yeah, and and Habu realizes the value of his ten cards being destroyed. Means that he's lost this game of Pathstone and he goes to one apiece. Um, again, nothing too punishing. The Warrior has good matchups against Habu. I think Habu took the line of of many people, which is, well, ban one of Warrior and Demon Hunter and sort of don't worry about the other and see what happens. Yeah. Um, with the other two decks. Yeah, but in the end, you know, I think the point that I made last time around was that uh, I can't remember the player involved, but they kind of had, I think it was Fury Hunter actually who had all of the best possible outcomes post TNT go his way, right? Like, mm -hmm. the the cards that got hit were the best possible ones, and the, the snapshot dodged the entire time, and then it still just was not particularly close at the end of that. Uh, so when you do just throw two, uh, three TNT in your deck, and one of them ends up hitting the snapshot like an absolute sniper in this scenario, uh, you are going to have absolutely no chance at all, which Habu Gabu recognized and conceded. But for Tabika, well done. Great use of the TNT. For, like, forget about Darby Allen. Forget about Mr. Brody Lee. Tabika is the greatest TNT champion of all time. Great. Anyway, moving on to the next game of this Hearthstone match that we're going to be watching. Um... Rogue. Talk to me about Rogue a little bit, Sotl, because I, I, if I talk about Rogue, I will probably get fired for saying words about Rogue that I shouldn't. Obviously, the deck is fine, but it, it does feel a turn slower than all the other top decks to me. I'm not sure whether slower is the criticism I'd go for, but it has felt quite inconsistent to me in general. Um, and so Inconsistent, you know, as I've had this discussion with you many, many times. Inconsistent and consistent are not words that are used properly in card games in mm -hmm. general. Con the idea of consistency can't really be separated from win rate in my mind in any kind of meaningful way. And Rogue does have a decent win rate against a somewhat expected field for this tournament coming in. Um, so I guess to like clarify that point a bit more, for me, the spikes when it hits aren't as immediately game-winning as some of the other spiky decks that you can go with, right? Particularly mm. with some of the tools that Habu Gabu has to fight against it. So I'm kind of with you, I'm kind of with Raven as well, who I think has been a little bit critical of the deck. Uh, I'm not a huge fan of the, the Giant Rogue. I, I was expecting to see it in this tournament, and honestly, I think what the the two that we've ended up with is probably about the right number of where I expected it to land, because there yeah. will always be people who have faith in this style of explosive rogue deck in general. Um, and they tend to be decks with massive skill edges anyway, so it may just well be that you know none of us are on the level to get the, the maximum output out of the deck. But so far, I still remain pretty unconvinced of the uh, the Giants rogue package. I think that's what I meant when I said it's a turn slower. When it does its big spiky thing, that is quite often a turn slower than the other things when they do their big spiky thing. Which means that there's a lot more ways to remove it. Even though you're removing bigger things, you're removing 8-8s instead of 4-6s and that sort of thing. 
they're not coming down on turn three like Greece does, for instance, sometimes. I mean, they can. <laughs> I mean, uh, yeah. Okay, yeah, we're talking scale, but yes, they can. Y y you know, the, the deck very specifically just has to play a three drop, and then magic can happen. So I think turn yeah. three is not the right turn to criticize for it not being a thing. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Um, no sludges drawn for Habo. This is sludge lock. This is not pain lock. So not drawing sludge makes this really, really awkward. And on the other side, drawing the thing, as Sotl just called it, has Somewhere. happened Nobody on turn three. You know how you know how pleased I'm going to be if this turn is now oh, insane after you very yeah. specifically. Okay. Yeah. Any shadow steps just to make me look dumb? Thanks. Nope, just an everything must go in the end. Ooh, good outcome, though. Very nice good outcome. outcome. We have seen some ridiculous outcomes, which made this one look slightly disappointing, but it's still a great outcome. Yeah, yeah, yeah for sure. We've seen some absolute nonsense in this tournament from that. I feel like four drops might be better than five drops, which I know is wrong, but that's the feeling I've been getting so far. Monsters form is so tempting here, but I don't know, just jamming a POSIC is also tempting to me and waiting to see next turn if you can pick up a sludge or a location or something. Yeah, the fact that the 7-7 seven, seven can't actually attack, you really yeah. do have to make sure you're grasping with that, right? Because I think up against this board state, it's very easy to say, well, hang on, I can't just play a 4-mana four 4-4 four four on this turn. That's not going to cut it. If you start doing other things like monstrous forming and stuff here, which is what he's going to do, you, yep. you throw away so many outs to get back into it, but obviously also you keep the game alive. So, you know, there's that. Yeah, just double trade through, play your 10 7. I think this is reasonable. does somewhat force Tabika to go back on the defensive. Like, you don't have to allocate any mana to solving the problem, which is frustrating, but it does at least uh, force Tabika to respect what will be a giant yep. soloing minion. Maybe prevent you from taking seven to face this turn. Yeah, this is a very slow start for the Sludge, though, and a, a, a decent start for the Rogue. Tabika... I mean, so to be to be fair, they did play like Harbu played Flame Imp on one and has had Waste Remover in hand, right? It's just like weirdly the Rogue has gone incredibly quickly and made that Warlock start look slow. I still say it's slow though, um, with no Sludge on wheels, no Forge, no. Um, what's the other thing? Help. <laughs> just no, no disposal system. Yeah, there you go. The the big three. The waste remover is kind of rubbish without those other three cards. Without one of those other three cards, any one of them, it suddenly becomes really good. Of course. Sure. I like the way we're at the stage. Though it is just a four mana five seven. <laughs> That's a bad thing. I like this choice from Habu, just removing any uh, Shadow Step options, any Breakdance options from Tabika, understanding that, like, okay, they uh, they played the the Gatekeeper and clearly did not draw into a good hand because nothing scary happened afterwards, right? Yeah. So just let's just make sure that no shenanigans with Step or Breakdance can happen on that Gatekeeper. There's no more rebuys. Uh, but fortunately, the, uh, the Pit Stop ends up getting the work done here anyway and this is going to be an OT uh, an OTK board set up once this giant comes down one more time yeah and obviously um, proving me wrong just for a change the rogue Tabika got here 
kind of convincingly, honestly, out of his group. Um, just getting the, the exact stats to make sure I don't get it wrong, but came through Group C, yeah, beat Fury Hunter 3-1 and beat Insane 3-2, and that was his day. Just beating two of the the name players in the tournament. So yeah, somebody we're not particularly familiar with, but if he puts down Habu Gabu as well, yeah, obviously um, going to be very worth his spot in that top four. And so this is the problem we can run into, right? Like we've been we've been gassing up Habu Gabu the uh -huh. entire day, the entire weekend so far, right? No shot, no shot. What do you mean? How is that possible? How is that a thing that you're just allowed to do? That's ridiculous. Hit Wind Fury now. You deserve it. You deserve it. Wow. No. Well, the talks okay. are really smart. They know exactly what to do. That was ridiculous. Anyway, uh, what was I saying? You, you're right, saying about but, the uh, downsides of gassing up habit. Yeah. yeah, this can happen, right? Where when you take risky meta swings, sure, when you queue into like the conventional lineup that you expected to queue into, you look like a genius, right? When you queue mm -hmm. into stuff that you're not necessarily hitting uh, with your, your off-meta decks and your tech choices, you're just playing a worse deck than everyone else, right? That's what playing an off-meta deck means when you're not getting the yes. specific advantages that you're shooting for. Um, which you know, can then be seen in scenarios like this. Yeah, you are weaker against the field in general. I mean, this was, I think, a bad draw. I know, you said, I know he got the flame in, which isn't the worst thing, but it is just a few two. Chips a bit of damage without the sludge. That chip damage is kind of irrelevant as Tabika goes to within one game of the semis. Um, but yes, it's absolutely a, a valid point that it's not played on ladder, which is the widest field of decks for a reason, right? Yeah, and I, th you know, I think you could give Harbu Flame Imp into Disposal Assistant into Forge into five seven that game. He's still not beating what was it three eight eights on turn five and four eight eights on turn six. That's what Tabika played that game. I don't think he'd be beating that personally with that draw. Maybe it's enough damage yeah. quickly enough that you could just shoot uh, Chaos Creation over the top. I don't know. I'm not going to sit here and do all of that maths, but um, I think yeah, this this is kind of why I countered the idea of it. Of, of Rogue being too slow. I don't think it's an issue with being slow. If you can put 24 power in play on turn 4 and then do it again on turn 5 and again sure. on turn 6, which, you know, Tabika was able to do quite comfortably there, uh, despite not really hitting anything with the second gas keeper, uh, second gatekeeper that he played. I don't think speed is necessarily the issue. When it hits, it goes very, very fast. It's just in what percentage of games can it actually go that fast? Because... We even saw, we're getting very deep into the weeds here, but hey, it's finals day, let's do it. You saw you saw on that first gatekeeper that got played, right? The first gatekeeper doesn't even really do anything when it hits giants, right? Because you haven't drawn enough cards at that point in the yes. game for those giants to cost zero. Um, so the first one really summoning the four drops is the best that you end up with, unless you can then shadow step the gatekeeper right like you go coin gatekeeper shuffle your whole hand shadow step the gatekeeper replay it and then that hand hits giants then you can start playing giants but at that point you probably don't you don't have mana left over for breakdance you don't have mana left over for projectionists so it is very specific niche hands that go super hard on turn four but i think once you get to turn five or turn six you start doing some pretty disgusting things that are well in line with what other decks are doing it's just, um, you know, the matter of how often you can end up doing that. Yep, okay. I stand semi-corrected. I mean, I stand corrected because it won for the third time in this tournament, so sure. Um, and as we learned from America's Grand Masters, the way to settle arguments is through single games of Hearthstone. Absolutely, yeah. yeah me and yeah. TJ taught you well. That's how numbers work. Don't like go back to Schrodinger's cat and ask if it's okay when you open the box once and it wasn't. It's it's either there or it ain't. No? So it works. Curious to see how the speaker stomper gets used. I assume wait for flash play it. I'm trying to think of anything more complicated than that, <laughs> but yeah. I doubt there is anything. By Jove, I think they've cracked it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Pretty smart me. Fine until I think, Sotto. Ooh. I want a 3-4. Oh. I want a 3-4. Yeah, why not? Yeah, now do you want to stomp? Yeah. <laughs> Habu Gabu muses to himself. Well, now, do I want to stomp? 
<laughs> if only there was an ethereal voice somewhere off in the distance asking me that question. Uh... <sighs> Turns Sounds out he does. Like a good play. Ooh. Double location. Double location and a dry scale deputy? Okay. Not bad. But also, any merit to flash again? Probably not. A little ambitious, I think. I think you need to save your second flash a little bit. Uh, I thought I was wrong. Okay. Yeah. In here first, he gets you to trog. You probably have to trade into the 2 2 here and play the trog and just trust maths to work. Did you see Harbu's previous game? Imagine, uh -huh. tra okay, it does trade. Okay, fine. It's all fine. He's managed to build another of these really annoying Ooh. boards that doesn't go far. The duplicated crash as well is huge. Oh, the deputy. I mean, it, everything it copies is just ridiculous. I know crash is particularly ridiculous because it's another zero mana, but there's so much good stuff in there. Mm -hmm. With, I mean, it, it's, it starts to... The idea is to build the unnerfed version of the deck, right? You just get all extra... Get back your extra one drops that you didn't have before. They were taken yeah, if, if if only you could just refind a bioluminescence from the ether as well. Sure. Yeah. I was talking about this with TJ uh, yesterday, I think, but it is, you know, it goes to show that they do plan at least a little bit that bioluminescence went away at the time pop up book came into the game because no, those two cards cannot exist in the same game together. That's that's not going to be okay for anyone involved. They could have let us have one day. Come on. <laughs> <laughs> just pre-program the nerf into the the patch. I just yeah, say, yeah, you've yeah. got 24 hours. Go. Yeah. Uh, most depressing that we can't do that. But yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the pre-planning was absolutely fantastic there. Because uh, that would have been silly. But I wanted to kind of do it. Yeah, once you bring it up, you do just kind of want to do it, don't you? Yeah. Coin would be great, wouldn't it? You just coin out flash because you know your opponent's going to flash next turn and you just nip ahead of them every time. On turn four, probably. <laughs> coin flash lethal on two. GG! Good night, everyone! Ah. <laughs> <laughs> uh. Pop up book's got a lot. I think, I think we're going to see a lot of this card. Even when this deck inevitably vanishes at some point. Mm -hmm. As a defensive unit, just kill your thing, put some really annoying frogs in the way. That's just a card. Yeah, I completely agree. Immensely powerful card. And really kind of a perfect card for what a pure combo deck wants to do, which we haven't necessarily seen a great deal of recently. I know people say, oh, we see combo decks all the time, but like, you go back to the conversation of the previous version of Nature Shaman, right? That right. actually played minions on curve. It, it, it appreciated pressure, it got chip damage with weapons, it played early minions, it fought for board for the first three or four turns of the game, right? It was a, it was a tempo deck with a wild combo finisher, which is what a lot of the best combo decks have been recently. Yes. Um, just ask, like, Fury Hunter about like Bomb Warlock, right? Like he is the most temp. He was probably the best player of that deck in the world, and the most tempo-based player of that deck in the world at the same He's time. He's just put six one ones on the board on like turn three and just yeah, yeah, yeah. with them. And who yeah, cares yeah, and then the you bombs? just die. Yeah. Exactly. 
Um, whereas this is more of a pure combo deck. It can't really win through board on, on any occasion if it's not the, the rag version very late in the game. Yeah. So the the idea of a card that deals damage and puts taunts in the way, it's very uh, it's it's a very freeze mage pilled card, right? Where it's just a thing that does damage and also stalls the game for you. Tries to bypass the idea of the board by putting taunts in the way to block damage that you don't necessarily have to deal with otherwise. Yeah, there's probably some control deck there with it as well because volcanoes ridiculous. Uh! And... What's, what's okay, the it was just a quick sanity check on how many sludges were in the deck right now because it was very important on this particular moment that we were paying attention to such things. Of course, things. 12, yeah. yeah. It's a yeah. number. Mm -hmm. I recognise that number from previous iterations of dying on turn 5. And now the animation. It's sped up a little bit, I think. So how's your day going? Well, while we just go with this animation, yeah. Um, it's, it's, it's good, it's been good. Watching some Hearthstone. Which is, a, which is a volcano slowly go off. Wow. That is, much like my current co-caster, a very irritating tosser. Indeed. Just unable to use that turn. But and because, like, even more so, because it's unable to be used th this turn, it's also kind of probably odds against to be able to be used next turn as well, because now it's the only card in your hand with 10 mana available, which is kind of irritating. Yeah, it just gets worse and worse, usually. I've, I've been in this spot with a tosser, and he just won't comply. Okay. Habbo is in the position now, though, where... If this 5-7 somehow lives, he gets there. But also, Tabuka's just got everything now, except refusing to flash. I'm surprised he hasn't sort of flashed and gone for it at some point here with the reflex in hand. Okay. Snake Oil. So you can spend either 4 or 6 mana on drawing cards plus playing the Gem Tosser. I think I think you want to. I mean, he knows what's in the deck. He's going through the deck tracker now, looking at what the five cards are that are left. That's important. Exactly. Yeah. Furnace field means he can always use a gem toss. So I'm going to say without knowing what the five cards are, because there is a trade yeah. in there and other cards. Right. It should be good. It can hit a three or just the snake oil, and then you can do it with tap and the snake oil instead, right? There's, there's always going to be a way yep. to do it from here, for sure. Ooh, okay. That should okay. be lethal. That should be lethal, I think, yeah. So there's, what, 16 going face, plus another 10 yep. with only 24 left remaining on the board. Yeah, that looks lethal to me. Yep. Well, you work things out so strangely. It was exactly correct. Yeah. I don't know what other way there would be to calculate that. What, what, um, what you, you work do? out, so you do 16 and then your opponent is on 6 and you've got 10. And 3 of three off the 10 leaves 7 and 7 is more than 6, which kills them. Did anyone Your way is definitely that? more succinct, but it's... Okay, uh, fine. As long as we agree that my way made sense and yours is confusing, you're allowed to have your confusing ways. My confusing way is... Foolproof. You don't have to add 16 and 8 together. But ge genuinely, this isn't a bit, I don't understand what you just said. I'm not even playing ignorant. Like, I okay. actually don't understand yeah. what you just said. <laughs> but it's sure, if, it, yeah. If, yeah. If, if it works for you, buddy, then we're all good, okay? You get to the point where the opponent's on 6, they've got a 3-3 three, three in play, then you add the 6 of 3, which is 9, rather than having to add 16 and 8, which is two big numbers. <laughs> sure. More importantly, Harbu Garbu found the way through. I think the more important maths there was the calculation with the the trade the tradable versus the tap. Yes. Which order do you go in first? Um, and I think knowing that Furnace Fuel was available, that was absolutely the right decision. Because if you hit Furnace Fuel, you pointed out straight away, uh, which is the kind of maths that you are instinctively very good at, even if there is some that you do very stupidly, uh, that you you uh, pretty much hit your odds at that point every single time with uh, with one drops and Snake Oils left remaining in that deck. So yeah, you clean game for Harbu, and we are going all the way down to game five. You can also tap into the Snake Oil that you just put back in your deck, which is also yep. important. Yep. Okay. Now I've shown how clever I'm not once again. We are down to 
the final game. Loser is out. The winner is one match from the World Championships. It's kind of an important game, Soto. It does feel that way, doesn't it? There is just a little something in the air. Habu Gabu has himself a miracle salesman. Tabika just looking at the way this is lining up. Cactus Cutter is nice to spend two on. There aren't uh, too many plays other than the two mana minions that you're happy with playing on two. So yeah, does choose to hold on to it, just probably for the purpose of drawing a card. Just checking my lists one final time, even though I do know them pretty much by now, uh, to see which is the, the faster. And is Habu's jive going to be a hindrance, or is just doing 24 going to get it done quick? I feel like it slows you down having that in your deck. Yeah, I think so too, a little bit, but um, largely you can ignore it, right? Like, the conductivity isn't necessarily that much of a hindrance. You can make something happy, happen with it. Um, so the, the jive insect is uh, one of Raven's classic single cards in the deck, which can sometimes be uh, negligible in some matchups. I think, honestly, the uh, the bigger part of it is just the card draw starts, right? Like, you really want to hit, uh, in Harvey Garby's case, the Needle Rock Totem, which is absolutely done. Basically, most both players want to be drawing cards on basically every single turn. If they can't be uh, making tempo, which is the number one thing that they'd like to do, but as previously discussed, very difficult to do with both of these versions of the deck. Another thing to look for, in my opinion at least, is look for even small amounts of damage. If that 3-4 can go face twice, it might be a whole turn or even two turns quicker you can pop off. Yep. So, little tiny bits of damage are absolutely snowball -y, in my opinion, in this matchup. Absolutely true. Harbi Gabu has gone card draw into Jazz Base, into more card draw, gets the overload in there as well with the Ancestral Knowledge, so he's starting to crank up those discounts. Flow Rider, probably the best card in your deck to draw off Ancestral Knowledge on most turns. I want to take the reflexes because I'm greedy and want to play Flash next turn. Well, actually, on six, I want to play Titan Flash. But that sounds slow, now I think about it. The issue with that as well is that without an AoE in hand, you're going to be using Titan for uh, deal 3, heal 6, right? Yes. Like, Titan Flash is at its best when you get to draw the three overload cards, which I do not think Habu Gabu is going to have the luxury to do this yeah. game. Also, he has a little tiny bit of time um, because to pick his use coin, which means, we are, mm -hmm. uh, we, which means that Habu is actually going first now. Sometimes in yeah. this matchup, as I, I sort of joked about earlier, but it does happen, your opponent just cheekily coins out a flash before you're about to do yours and beats you. Um, but with a coin gone, Habu, at least his internal clock doesn't get messed up by somebody trying to sneak out a coin. Yeah, the irritating part of that, though, is that the coin was used to play the spell mm -hmm. that was drawn from the Cactus Cutter, which, you know, the, basically the coin was used to create this 3-4 that's been attacking Habu Gabu in the face every single turn, which I think is a fair trade from uh, from Topeka's part. So, Jazz Base, double crash, flash in hand, reflexes in hand, opponent has a board you can't deal with very easily. What I'm trying to say, is it time to flash or do you wait? Looks like he's going to wait. Don't think so. Yeah, it's just, it's not that effective a turn is the, is the issue does at least get to uh, trade off the 3-4 finally. Okay. We could do a good job of getting the locations sort of going. You said about card draw. There's, there's no better card draw when they get rolling than those in these decks. They just take a little bit of time. Yep. They, uh, the locations draw cards, which tend to draw cards. That's about as effective as it gets. It took a while to get there, didn't it, with the perfect 30? Um, which we haven't got yet. We had wand makers and shutter blocks and weird things in this deck for, for some time. Mm hmm. Which made sense. Like, you, you get those cards because they say battle cry on them and you put them in with your thing that gets battle cry things and it all, it all sounds great. But things still just getting tuned up a little. Drawing cards that make more cards sounds, sounds wonderful. Drawing cards that draw more cards, specifically, as opposed to drawing cards that make more cards, which is what it already did. 
Yep. <laughs> At this point, though, that's kind of more a flash out of desperation because the hand is otherwise stalled yeah. than it is a flash with any necessary uh, inclination of killing next turn. And now you've got to play the other flash just to draw a card. Forget the the discount. It's just can I find something that isn't photographer fizzle? And the answer yeah, is kind exactly. of no. I kind of agree with that. The hand was just as stalled after the first flash as it was before the first flash. So if you're committing to the first, you've got to commit to the second. Committing to the second psychologically is much braver. You know, there's no actual uh, identifiable difference between the two. But when you're two-two in a situation where you're trying to go to the World Championships, and you know if you play both flashes and you have none left in your deck, that's probably you just gone for the day, gone for the tournament. If it doesn't pay off, the second one is a much harder sell to yourself to actually play in that spot. But I think it was probably the best decision for Habu Gabu in that spot to go for. Yeah, yeah, you can see it's, it's such a good decision now because Tabika's going in with all this damage. He's, he's been forced to have a go for it. Of course, from his point of view, don't forget, he's Habu's in a fantastic spot. He's got 10 cards in hand. He's got a loaded up Jazz base. Yeah, he, he's got everything ready to kill Tabika with as far as Tabika could see from his limited information, so he's now being forced to have a go at it. And he only needs 15, so this Lightning Reflexes does not have to be particularly cooperative. Oh. But I think it needed to be more cooperative than that. Yeah? Because that is now all of the mana. And no Bolt. Yeah, Bolt off the rebuy there would have been lethal, but Habu Gabu is now actually in the game because oh. those crashes... Those crashes could not get cheap enough to pay that off. Lightning reflexes is the burn, though. That feels so miserable. It really does, because obviously that's just two cards burned for the price of one. He tried so hard to fill his hand what? up with good stuff, and then the burn is there. Do you have to just heal for six and say that you're alive? And just stick Titan on board and win oh, from there? No. That can't get there, can it? But then knock in your hand. Oh no. Apparently not. Reflexes. Okay, 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 finds the other reflexes. That's huge. Bolt off the first is the best outcome. Yeah, so you are face. saying there's a chance. I'm saying there's a chance. I'm also saying watch that timer bar because some of this can take some time sometimes. Did see card draw in there, so just did the due diligence to whether or not you have to take the... the... Oh, the card draw finds Jive Insect from the Flow Rider, though, and has a Jazz base. This board is getting cleared, so Jive Insect gets played. Yep. If the board's clear, the Jive Insect gets played. That's another eight. Three more crashes is 12, which leaves him at seven. I think the rag is one over if it gets played, and I've counted this all correctly. And I think I have without even counting the weapon damage. Habu finds a way over the line with the Jive Insect right at the very end. What a finish to this game. Oh my goodness, Shaman versus Shaman. It's the matchup of champions, Lorinda. It really is though. Like every time it feels like that happens. Like, there was a game with Insane, I think against Tabika actually, where Insane was about to pop off and Tabika was just like, nope, I'm using coin and I'm going first. Unlucky. And this was kind of the opposite of this. Habu declared that he was going to go for it. Made Tabika go on a turn just with an Inza as his only reductions. And that got Habu through this. But he also had to work out so much there. Um, ended up having to start with the Flow Rider because there was just nothing else in his hand that could do it. Hit the reflex that he was looking for. Um, obviously, he would have a better handle on the odds of that than we do. Um, and then the reflexes into do things, into jive, into... I'm going to call it exact lethal. I know it was over by about six, but it was exactly <laughs> the number of things hitting you in the head. It was the right number of things that hit him. He played all of the cards and then the opponent died. So that's exact lethal as On far the as last I card, see. and there was no, yeah, there was no sort of short, no, no card wasted is what I mean. No, no fording waste. Had to do yeah, it. but so Tabika was in a very frustrating spot on that previous turn where, like you said, only Inza was the discount that were being used. No flashes had been found. So needed 
all, either all or all but one of the possible discovers that could hit a lightning bolt to hit lightning bolt. Because lightning bolt is the only actual mana cheat card, right? Because lightning bolt costs zero because it comes from Inza, but it also discounts every crash in your hand by one. So every Lightning Bolt that you played that turn was gaining you mana. And unfortunately, his first discover off the... He got a Lightning Bolt off the Flow Rider, which was the outcome that he needed. But then he got Crash of Thunder off the first roll of the Lightning Reflexes, which was uh, a an outcome that kept him alive in the game, but he then needed to hit specifically Lightning Bolt off the second roll of the Lightning Reflexes to stay in the game. If he'd hit Lightning Bolt off the first roll of the Lightning Reflexes, the game gets a whole lot easier from that point. But even after missing it the first time around, still had outs, missed it the second time as well. And then uh, Habu Gabu just being a much braver man than I, just saying, no, forget this, like clear the board, heal, and stabilize business. I'm going in. I know my outs, and all I've got to do is find this one remaining lightning reflexes, and I'm a big favorite to uh, find lethal this turn, and he calculated it absolutely beautifully. Yep, I could watch that matchup all day, and we're going to watch quite a lot of it today, most likely, because it's in a lot of these lineups. Um, we're going to have a quick look at the top eight bracket, and then we're going to try and bring you some extra content for this round, I believe. So... Oh, yeah, good, that... good. So it means, yeah. what, Pjadnica and Gamer RVG is, uh, is still ongoing then in that case, I would imagine? Yeah, so they're in Game 3 right now, which uh, we can't just jump in during Game 3, which is why I'm sort of stalling slightly. I don't mind admitting it. Um, they're going to get into Game 3. We, we, we're after Game 3, we get to show Games 4 and 5. As it's one all, there will be at least a Game 4, which means we will be able to bring you at least some action from every match today, which has made me very happy, honestly. Yep, we'll be showing every other game that is available in full. So we'll see Moldstar Week U, we'll see Bunny Hopper Insane, we'll see both semis and we'll see the finals. So yeah, great news that we uh, get to dip into Pjatnica and Gamer RVG if that match is still ongoing. A little bit surprising actually, because I thought uh, that that cl that series with Harbu was uh, much more of a marathon than we were expecting it to be with, uh, with Harbu's games that we've seen so far. Yeah, absolutely. I, mean, I do believe we are about to jump in there. Let's see how it's looking. Um, here we go. Here we go. Yeah, that's our Anyway, show. we'll have it in a moment. Um, Game at RVG, of course, we got to speak to very briefly on the end of day one. Extremely excited to be getting once again close to the World Championships. He has been very close. He came runner-up in the championship event for America's Grandmasters, which would have got him in. Um, you know, somebody has to win it, Sottle. You can't just have them all lose just because it's America's Grandmasters. So he got close. Um, and he, he's, he's the person who's played the most Masters Tours of anybody, I believe. So, wow. Okay. Because he managed to play them all last year and he played all but one of the original ones. Uh, whereas players like Fury Hunter, Bunny Hopper sort of took a, took a year off. And here we are. It's one all we're jumping into, I believe. Yeah, a little bit of camera little confusion. Yeah, yeah. yeah, there we go. That The world all makes sense now. You love to see it. This is Seems extra like content. Are... Enjoy it for what it is. <laughs> we've, we've grinded hard to get you this last off-stream match that you weren't going to look at otherwise. But looks like we are joining uh, Warrior vs. Priest in process, and it looks very much like one of those games I was talking about previously. Uh, well, actually, a very specific game that I was talking about previously. Not only where you actually grind out a slower matchup using some tools... Uh, from the Armenthal, but actually that's a tier on board as well, which increases the chances that it could be that exact scenario I was talking about, where you play Armenthal, Armenthal dies, it has three attacks, so it's then revived from the tier that you discover off your Armenthal when you activate the ability. Looking very possible that that's what we uh, could have seen there, but uh, no Raden in hand discovered off the uh, the second uh, Armenthal, which can really bring that whole package home, but has found a Rhea Straza, which is... Uh fascinating addition to this little party trying to remove some duplicates from the deck now so we can get that nest active yeah only 10 cards left in deck as well as the first thing i glanced at when you said that um which means that it will get active at some point unless crazy unlucky things happen at the bottom of your deck uh get out of sort of four or five cards i think a deck full of duplicates when you get to answer about four cards is favorite to just have none anymore maybe it might be five cards um go on so Go on, do it! Sorry to interrupt you, but no. Pjadnica right now is arguing with himself as to whether he's supposed to tempo this Leroy. And I am the voice from the heavens telling you, yes, you are. No, coward. 
I mean, for all we know, he maybe hasn't played Samimi yet. I don't know. We, we, we are going in as blind as everybody else here. We literally just jumped into this um, straight from the Habu match. This was taking place at, well, is taking place at the same time. And also, it's one all, by the way. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Why is it one all? We just had a marathon match, and this is one all. Yeah, I don't know how decent the, the games were in starting, but... This one very well could have been going extremely long. Still the Reno in hand as well for Gamer RVG has not yet been played this game, which is obviously from Gamer RVG's side. He doesn't he's missing information in this battle. Uh, but Pyadnitsa does know that the Reno is a factor that can end up destroying the uh, the Riestraza portal if he doesn't line it up in the right order. Which is something that he can keep in mind a lot more so than Gamer RVG can. Yeah, you're not playing around with rear styles of portals here, right? If you're game RPG, it's just no. not a thing on your mind at all. What you are, what you may play around though, right, is worst case scenario legendary that I can't necessarily think of, right? You might yes. not necessarily, you might not think exactly about Rea Straza, but you do know that Reno pretty much beats everything, right, as a tool. Mm -hmm. So against a, p a piece of concealed information, you'll see now with like Gamer RBG, that was an extremely renoable board that he was faced down with. But he was like, well, I can use the imperfect answers in my hand to clear this board up and keep the perfect answer for the boards that I don't yet know about that could be coming in the future. Yeah, plus the half is in the deck. So yeah, there is mm -hmm. at least one more refill that he knows exists that he's going to have to deal with. Yep. Um, that wasn't just generated or something, so... Yep, trying to be greedy with removal. And I can imagine that this game has taken some time, actually, to get to this state. How much do you know about the Hearthstone brew hands, Neil? And why is the Nothing. answer zero? Yeah, okay. Because yeah. I've played against it about four times. They always die after playing their ice block. Sure. <laughs> So against Warrior in particular, you can get the the Hunter one is pretty good. Not for most of the cards, but one of the cards is Death Stalker Rexar, which is infinite value from that point on with the the Builder Beast, mm -hmm. right? That's kind of huge. Um, Paladin can be decent as well, just because you get uh, Librum of Justice, uh, no Librum of Judgment, which is the seven mana weapon, five attack, three charges. That's just fifteen extra damage that can go face. That's kind of cool. Um, Shudderwalk Shaman is pretty great because you can just set up Life Drinker, Shudderwalk, Infinite Chain with the Chain Gang as well if you have enough time to do that. So there are a few outs that against Warrior in particular can, can make some magic happen. Mage gets quite a lot of damage but it's slow, right? They get like Fireball and... Is it Ice Lance in there as well? They get Yeah, it's, it's very, very old school Freeze Mage. So it's Ice Block, Ice Lance, Frost Nova, Antonidas, Fireball, that kind of thing. Yeah. Relevant though, when uh, game is down to only 20 as the warrior. Yep. And with that in mind, actually, it's kind of time. Yeah, he, he, is this the turn where he's trying to force Nodin down? Just so he can actually win the game? Or does he just stall forever and run his opponent out of stuff? I feel like he might have to actually win the game. It's extremely scary with leaving a, an 8 8 in play, though, I would say. So I think you have to try and look for a shorter board than this. Like, you may be able to. I don't know, wait for the hearth turn, and the turn they play hearth, they might not do that much else. And you can sneak the Odin down that turn, maybe. But I think number one priority now is even more so than getting the Odin down, you have to draw some cards and get that Reno active, right? Because you have to deal with this Dragon Portal, or you're, you're just going to lose on value from this point. Something I always find interesting about quarterfinal day, or finals day, is that the quarterfinals, you're you know your opponent going in, so you spend all day or all night, or your friends spend all night working out all the nuances of the matchups. And then you get to the semi final, you probably haven't practiced it much at all, apart from your, you know, your prep for the tournament. But, right. So specific things are in the, exactly in quarter final matches, games can sometimes be very, very accurate. And we might see that here from Gamer. Wind Fury and Rush, no shield though, which means the trades kind of suck from Piatnitz's perspective. You really want a threat to stick on the board and threaten here, which is... Didn't really get any of the defensive tools, right? The Divine Shield, the Reborn, the things that actually make you stickier. Uh, Mill Rogue, okay. Um, okay. Okay. 
So with the gang up, <laughs> yeah, you are going to go to eleven cards. So you will then be ahead on the fatigue race. <laughs> yeah, you are also ahead on health totals. Just about. Kind Although of. Warrior can probably start getting there pretty quickly with the armor gain. I don't mind it, you know. I think this okay, is all right. Interested. But you, you called this it. This is right. a turn where sneaky Odin down, and now the race is on. So gamer will win this pretty quickly most of the time from here. Although his current hand isn't really doing that. No. And there is Bran hit. Victory. There is Bran Heelbot in this hand for Piatnitsa as yep. well. By the way, that that yep. is a that, that's an old school Bran. If you're not passing the uh, the full art, that is a Bran Bronze Beard. Your battle cries trigger twice in that hand, mm -hmm. which makes Starlight Whelp kind of exciting. Uh, a unique quirk of the way we're covering this series is I have no idea what was in the opening hand in this game from, uh, from Piatnitsa. <laughs> yep. I like the use of the word unique there. Gamer's lack of cards. Gonna lose one card. Don't wanna lose the gang up, right? Don't wanna lose the gang up? Lost the gang up. <laughs> Out. <laughs> Is that bad? Maybe that's still fine. Well... I don't know if it's fine. But Reno seems pretty fine now. Gamer will probably have all of the exact lists, like for Hearth in front of him, I'd imagine, as part of his prep for this one. What now? Wait, wait, you know Reno's not active, right? No, because I hadn't looked at the deck list properly because we jumped into the game. I just assumed it was active, but it's not. I have been talking for like three straight turns about how Gamer RVG needs to draw cards to activate the Reno. <laughs> I know. It's fine. <laughs> I just assume they're active no matter what you say, Sotl. <laughs> how is it not active now? Hey, you can't have it both ways. You complain when they're active too quickly. You can't complain when they're active too slowly as well. This scale rip is so annoying. Um, well, they couldn't kill one twelve twelve. Yeah. Can they kill this one? I, obviously, you can't play it now because it would destroy your other twelve twelve. But just take it and save it. It's not a bad card to play after they reno you, if they do. Must be just one duplicate left, right? The amount of care and attention that's going into this. I mean, it's impossible to know not having seen the first half yeah. of the game, right? It could be any number left in there. <laughs> Shadow step in the heel bot. Just step in the heel bot, right? Yeah, why yeah. not? Yeah, you highlighted it as, um, you know, important. I thought, nah, it's fine. The game will either just kill him or it won't get close. But yeah, that's all of that work the game has been doing is completely undone with the heel bot. Bladestorm's not the card, I can tell you that much. I don't know what the card is that need, is needed to make this Reno active. Yeah, I'm desperately trying to find anything that will help. But no, we just have to wait until Reno turns yellow, which is a thing that I completely and utterly forget to check every single time. I always have. How many two offers has he got is the thing I was trying to look up. Lots, all of them. He's playing all of the two drops, basically. Gamer, gamer is hard two odds. Yeah, yeah. Gamer is hard two odds, right? Yeah, he's got um, one bellowing, one heavy plate, one ignis, one sanitize, one reno, one odin. Everything else is twos. 
Yeah. So the only things being played as one ofs by choice are Bellowing Flames, Heavy Plate, and Sanitize. Yes. So we believe that there are two shield blocks remaining. Okay. Which is a good card to have remaining. Given that you have to have one, but yeah. Yeah, less so if you're dead, though. Less so if you're dead, indeed. Oh, Healbot's silly! Power creep doesn't exist, Healbot's just the best thing ever! <laughs> <laughs> Just put half in uh, Custom Warlock so you can roll heal bots at the end of the game once you've done all the damage to yourself. Yeah! And then you can't play your Mountain Giants because you didn't know how the card worked. Molten Giants, but yeah. Same thing. Mm, very lock. different things. They're actually. Giants. Yeah. Something to do with cards in hand and damage. It's okay. Wrong Isera, sadly. Pianita needed to hit some form of direct damage mm -hmm. from this dragon discover. The uh, the new Ace Era, which gave oh, you course, Nightmare yeah. immediately, would have represented some immediate damage, yeah. but that is the wrong type, sadly. Ooh! Glad you highlighted that. 19 plus 3, 22. <laughs> Just some more. And I'll then behave. heal some more. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Ah, I fully respect this. This is good. Having yeah. lost the brand and the gang up, right? Like, this is now the goal, is just to let the game resolve down to fatigue, but just stay significantly ahead on the health lead, and then as soon as you can kill, with, uh, like, cold light prep vanish or something, just go for it from there. Just like to point out this that you were wrong, me. by the way. What was I wrong about? Um, Bladestorm was one of the cards required to be drawn earlier. <laughs> Oh, true. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just, no, there is right. another one that we don't know what it is. It's probably shield block. So at that time, uh, there was two blade storms and two shield blocks. Yeah. And this is it. I can't see a way out of this. Nope. I know. Just play the Reno and it will kill all the things on the board. That's how it will work. Did that even get there? <laughs> what, if you could hack the game and make this work? Yeah. Which game is uh, trying to do? Yeah, I think you would probably still lose <laughs> to the to the cold light in the end. Yeah. Uh huh. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Just take a Zarimi. I love it. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Wonderful flourish at the end of the game, but yeah, it looks like these uh, these opening round matches are playing out some epics as they stand because that was uh, if that's fallen behind even the the Habu Gabu series that we were watching, then uh, goodness knows what's been going on in these openers. It looks like just the Demon Hunter left to win with now for Piatnitsa, which it has to be a pretty solid spot. Uh, I think if you're going into any series and you'll be okay, if I I'll give you right now. A point in the series where you just have to win with Demon Hunter to win to, to progress yeah, through to the next it. round. You'd take that, right? At pretty much any yeah. given point. I don't think there's too much monkey pouring involved in that that will uh, be able to curse you. So. That said, um, it's the old Hearthstone thing that happens in Conquest so often. Like, it does have two matchups that aren't particularly great. So, still big favourite, and you'd definitely take it. But it can definitely lose these. Um, the Warlock in particular can just kill Demon Hunter sometimes. Uh, the Warrior can just outvalue it, just get rid of the, the main shoppers. There is a hearth in this version, which will make it go a little bit longer, of course, but it can definitely lose this. It's not over, but yes, I would take having this Demon Hunter left over. Yeah, it's the faster version of the deck as well, the, the, the kind of more focused shopper version of the deck, the more aggro version of the deck, if you want to look at it that way. Uh, none of the sharpshooter shenanigans, just a hard stone brew thrown in there just for some uh, extra refill at the end, as you were just talking about, which, uh, you know, did, uh, did come in to play in the previous game in, in huge, huge ways. I know early on you were saying that Hearth had not had an impact.
but uh, hey, we uh, we finally got there. Yeah, absolutely. I think I think uh, we were talking about it yesterday, and you were saying, well, you know, it hasn't had a chance to have an impact against Warrior yet, and there we go. It had a chance just now, and definitely made an impact. So, raised itself out of the relegation zone slightly, just for a moment. Game it back on this Odin Warrior. Um, disappointing deck so far in this tournament, I think. It's, it's fine, but not necessarily the blockbuster I think everyone thought it would be. And I think that's a function of you ban Demon Hunter or Warrior and leave the other one up. And if Warrior's being left up, then you've got to have something to do about it because it's so good. Yeah, um, I think it depends a little bit whether you're you're lumping all of the decks in together as well, or whether you want to separate them out a little bit between the different varieties. Um, with like, because it, it's it's so hard to separate them these days because you know they're all playing um, they're all playing Reno. Most of them are playing Brand, but it's uh, you still have the variety that's all all one ofs. You have the variety that's mostly one ofs, and then you have the variety that's mostly two ofs. Um, but I think in general, Warrior has been getting beaten up quite a lot this tournament. Um, I had a look at uh, OnCrowd, who's been keeping some stats for this on the, the tournament, and it was cooking around like 33%, I think, in, in total win rate of Warrior overall, which is not where you want to be at all. Um, it is getting banned. OnCrowd does um, adjusted win rate, where you factor in a ban as a win, essentially, and that brings it closer to 50-50, because it is being banned in some series and then being beaten in others. Um, kind of indicating that a lot of players have come into this with either a ban warrior or target warrior kind of strategy. I think uh, warrior and shaman have been the two most common decks that have been looked at for people to try and have a go at with um, just extra resiliency tech, with the likes of you know Ignis in Habu Gabu's Priest, with extra hearths thrown into people's decks. These are extra tools that can get you over the line against Warrior. And then obviously all the speak stomps at Stompers and Neophytes and everything else that we've seen that can uh, provide you with anti-Shaman tech. I think that's been the two of the bigger talking points of this tournament so far in terms of tech tools. Yeah, and I think it's been quite a unique tournament for that because you're talking in terms of those being targets, which they, I mean, those tech cards are targeting a deck. I agree with the, um, the language, but... It's not traditional, oh, I'm going to leave this up and go 3-0 against it targeting. It's, okay, I'm leaving this up. I'm going to make sure I can deal with it somehow in all of my decks. And therefore, it won't it won't be too much of a problem targeting. Bring good lineups. And it's, it's been fascinating to see what people have chosen to do. Because they have to leave up one of these two powerhouses. And, yeah, they, they've turned the powerhouse into not a powerhouse. By just a few cards, seriously, in their decks. Just a little tiny bit of tech. Yep, they can make a big, big difference for sure. Um, but we look like we are just about ready to go with this crucial Game 4. Could, of course, still be going to a Game 5. Demon Hunter on the line for Piadnica trying to book a semi-final spot alongside Habu Gabu, who we saw go through a little bit earlier. Gamer RVG just gripping onto life as one of the last remaining America's representatives. So all to play for in this series still. And it looks like we uh, got robbed earlier of the uh, the old Death Knight as well, which we have not been seeing a great deal of. I haven't even really mentioned it throughout the tournament, which is when you know it's bad, because I'll take any opportunity to dunk on some Death Knight. But thankfully, yeah, yeah. <laughs> managed, I mean, managed to, uh, to dodge the Death Knight victory in this one. Probably for the best, because I will also take any opportunity to dunk on it, and that probably would end messily for us both. Just trying to find what the first game was, but I can't, unfortunately. I used to be able to. I'm just wondering if it was Death Knight versus Warrior in, in game one. It doesn't feel like it would have been, but maybe it was. That would go some time, right? It could very well, yeah. Rainbow Death Knight is the yeah. uh, the deck of choice from Piatnitsa, which can certainly grind out those games against Warrior if it comes down to it. But we live in the present, and the present says that Piatnitsa has Coin Weapon, which is the absolute dream opener. Has hit one shopper, though, so the fear factor remains that this draw could get yeah. busted with a second Patches draw. Patches. They're shoppers, sort of. Patches was a different card. It was a pirate. I know that. Oh, you silly. They're all patches. Everything's they a patches. patches. I know. It's like Warlock is custom Warlock. It's not pain Warlock. Drilly the Kid, that's just robot patches. Thunderbringer, big horsey patches. They're just all patches. Big horsey patches. Yep. Oh, dear. Oh, uh no! 
Oh my goodness! Pink Demon Patches has appeared in the hand. Well, now what do you do? Because Cry. your deck has two things that need to be killed and they can't even be played. I mean, you play Aggro Demon Hunter and just hope that it gets there. I mean, we have made the point numerous times this tournament, if you don't draw the weapon, you still do a lot of damage, blah, blah, blah. You can still play your shopper for five. Um, that's expensive, but your one drop still costs one, which isn't expensive. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit later on, you've got a weapon, you've got some damage coming in. Gamer's going to be very confused when he sees the weapon come down this turn. Or maybe he won't be. Maybe he'll realise exactly what's up when he sees the weapon come down this turn. I'm oh, sorry, game. We're we keeping you up. I think more likely we got him up. <laughs> the start, yeah. where the start time of this tournament would have been. Good point. worrying about the weapon. Which is interesting to me, because it is quite a lot of damage to be able to just swing away with. You've got two of them in your hand. If you don't equip one soon, you're never using either of them, which is presumably the plan to never use either of them now, but okay. Yeah, I think I'm on board with the spark bots. Like, if you can hit Reborn, Shield, or Wind Fury, then that's going to be a better outcome for you than playing weapon on this turn. And I think you have to live in the world where you're going to hit the good outcomes for the rest of the game if you're going to win, right? So sure, it seems like a reasonable line to go down. Yeah, yeah, you don't get prized for doing 27 damage or something, I guess. So that makes sense. Yeah, because if you, think, like, you play Umpire's Grasp on that turn, they play Craftsman's Hammer on that turn, and they just start clearing up your board. Yeah. And then you cry, right? Your damage is all immediately undone by the equipping of their weapon, yeah. and they're picking apart your minions, whereas this way you actually defend your board so you can do repetitive damage. Yeah. I agree now. You convinced me, Sotl. Good. So they were like, we're, we're sort of sitting here looking obviously at um, the busted hand, but Gamer doesn't necessarily know that because he hasn't seen the weapon, so... Yeah, he, he is know. seeing a kept card that isn't being played, though. So he at the very least knows something weird is happening. Yes. And this might explain... Yeah, he nodded there, actually, as if saying, so, yeah, okay, I thought that was what was happening. Sure. Yeah. Observer of Mysteries. That's us. It's our card. <laughs> You're observing mysteries every time we watch this game. Alright, time to go to work. Gamer sits forward. Try and stay in this tournament, make sure he makes no mistakes here. Get some minions of his own developed. Uh, take over the board. Already now one shopper dealt with. So just second half of the shopper and second shopper to deal with, and then he'll be very, very comfortable on his 25 health with weapons and safety goggles and Renos and shield blocks. and He's got it all going on. This looks really, Absolutely. really difficult to lose. It really does. I think it's going to have to be Magtherodons all the way down from here if is going to have any hope. Yep. No 6-5s. That ain't it. He can play four secrets next turn. <laughs> For the princely sum of six mana. <laughs> That's good, though. They're worth ten mana on average. I know they then four just secrets go away. are worth ten mana on average. Two and a three and a two and a three. Yeah. Okay. I don't know offhand if there's equal number of each, but it comes. But yes, obviously the, on, the ongoing thing here is I, I quite like the secrets and subtle things. <laughs> yep, accurate. 
<laughs> Gamers just look at that turn. Well, that that wasn't a Hearthstone turn. What, what are you doing? So he knows what the mission is, right? He knows that next turn he's facing another shopper, probably, and then he's facing. Oh, because what came from the shopper wasn't good. The Peanuts mm -hmm. didn't have to play the one drop. Mm -hmm. So he's just got to deal with the second shopper, which he will have an incredibly strong sense is in hand. Okay, so no freezing, no bait and switch. Just don't worry about him. Just let him go away. Get on and make you some armor, yeah. not dying. You can just like trade the 2-2, two -two, equip your weapon. Yeah. Don't hero power to play around hidden meaning and just let like I think the secrets are then guaranteed to dissolve and do nothing at that point. And you have a four two, a four one and a weapon against nothing. They might end up copying um Oh you gotta swing with a weapon, yeah, so Yeah yeah yeah. Yeah, kill everything. Yep. You're not under any pressure, so you're not under no obligation to give them any chance. Only plays one card, so no rat, plays no spells, so no counter spell, doesn't spend all your mana, so no hidden meaning. Doesn't go face, so no block, which was uh, no barrier. Which was no one. barrier, no explosive trap. Yeah. yeah. And that's the, that's kind of my issue with that card as a whole. I think it is just too easy in general to like play around secrets for one turn. To be fair, that's when you're playing from behind. Right, when you're playing from in front. If you are behind and there's two secrets and you've got to deal with a fairly big board, they can become quite promising now. They can, yeah, but I think... So, in the, those spots, you... Explosive Runes is somewhat relevant. Um, counter Spell is somewhat relevant. Rat Trap is... So, counter Spell is usually the most relevant and then yes. Rat Trap is sometimes relevant, right, in that order. Yeah. I think a mistake some people might make too much is that they play around other secrets and that makes their turn worse. Like, those three are the only secrets you even have to consider playing around most of the time, right? If you get towards the end of your turn and the Hunter secret still hasn't proc, then maybe you can start thinking about Hidden Meaning. Um, but I don't think it's particularly difficult to, like, test one spell for counter spell with most decks in this. As, uh, particularly with Control Warrior, which is one of the decks that you really have to pay a lot of attention to, right? They have so many cheap spells that they can potentially throw away now. <laughs> yes, so many cheap spells that Habu wants you to not have them, yeah. Yeah, 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 precisely. Well, the good news for me is we get to have this discussion at least twice more this game. Here we go, let's have some secrets. Reroll? It's got to be a reroll, yeah. You stink. Just end up with um, five to three tough crowds on the board. It's great value, right? Just get another tough crowd now and reroll again. There we go. It's two one ones for only three mana, and it's cost him no cards. I'm excited. <laughs> you uh -huh. This is kind of sad to watch, isn't it? Be fair. Have you ever seen anyone look more over um, anything than Gamer <laughs> RVG is over this game of Hearthstone? Like, he looks he like is... he would rather be doing anything else than playing this entirely one game of Hearthstone right now. Yeah, yeah, he just wants to play Game Five and find out if he's going to go to the semi-finals or not. He he's got a a small hunch that maybe <laughs> this this army of one ones isn't going to kill him. You've just left Razorfen Needle Rock alive and are continuing to play Hearthstone. Ah. Uh. This is difficult for gamers. It's not difficult at all. I could win from here. But the difficult yeah. part is maintaining enough concentration that game five you've still you're still concentrating, you're still zoned in. <laughs> And just not drifting out of the whole match because I understand what you just said makes a lot of sense. Yeah, that's the thing, right? Refocusing is very, very hard. It's it's a lot easier in most circumstances to just not break your focus in the first place. 
just remain focused for the remainder of this game and then keep going. Like getting distracted, getting complacent, and then having to like go away, reset, get a glass of water, splash water on your face, jump up and down, and try and refocus for the next game, which is actually super important, is going to be very, very difficult. So you just kind of need to continue to play fundamentally good Hearthstone. And I think he did, right? He decided, okay, well, let's um, have a plan. Uh, he can make any one of about 27 plans here, and they all win. But just pick one and go for it. And he decides to get up to 73 health. Against a deck that has 165 remaining. And... Hearth? Just doing my job now. Yeah, there's a Hearth in there as well. Yep. Which he's going to have to empty his hand if it's going to do anything, which might be his best way of doing something right now. Yeah, it's going to be empty hand into, let's say, exactly Shaman. If it's exactly Shaman and you have time, you could maybe make something happen, but Gamer RVG will play Odin at some point, which will probably remove a great deal of that turn. Uh, that Get time, sorry, not that turn. Getting rid of both rockers now, which is great. Preventing 8 million health being gained next turn, which is nice. Mm -hmm. Oh. I mean, I almost just wanted to hit end turn before the Odin was drawn, but okay, I guess we play, uh, play the Odin. If it's hidden meaning, it's hidden meaning. Yeah. yeah, one way to stay focused into the next game will be to just end this one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I genuinely feel like end turn might have been your best turn there if you didn't draw yeah. Odin with those with those secrets up. Yeah, just let them go. I guess, just... I guess, I guess armor up end turn to be uh, to yeah. be specific. Yeah, just don't mess with it, right? Just take the ten that's on board or whatever, and just don't mess with it. Yeah, yeah. I didn't count hand yeah, size. Yeah, draw maybe Odin, play Odin. A card. Yeah, he's had enough of that rubbish. Yeah, I think that's fair, honestly. I think that's a fair point to say, as soon as I see the Odin, I can't actually win anymore, because up until that point, if Odin was their last card, right? If Odin was Gamer RVG's last card, you can just stay in it, grind out, try and be annoying for as long as possible, find the hearth, and then if the hearth rolls the one to three, depending on how hard you want to cope, uh, different options that might actually win you the game, um, then you have time to do that as long as they haven't played Odin and they can't actually kill you. But as soon as that Odin comes down, that time, that window just completely vanishes. And uh, you're just waiting to die at that point. So I think, you know, we talked about the mental game a little bit during that. I am a subscriber to that idea where, you know, I'll, I'll concede ladder games a little bit early sometimes, right? Just to save on frustration, just to spend more time in winning games than losing games, um, which can help improve your win rate over time. But in a tournament... There are some players that will say, okay, I calculate this game to be 0% win rate, but I'm going to keep playing it even though I, just in case I'm wrong. I think there's less chance of that happening than there is of like me tilting by being sat grinding out an unwinnable game for 20 extra minutes, right? So I personally would just take the concede, save the mental energy and just go play a different game. Whereas I like to just sit there and grind it out to the zero percent make sure that the the spreadsheet gets all the way to the end and i finish mm -hmm. the game that i came to play mm -hmm. and then i tilt my head off and lose yeah yeah that so, sounds accurate you know <laughs> makes sense everything you're saying makes sense but different here we strokes are. for different folks eh indeed custom warlock versus the demon hunter a minute ago you were saying that um you'd like to have the demon hunter versus basically anything if you offered it at the start of the match and i did agree but I don't think you're favoured here. I think I think that Custom Warlock. I know I've got a a lot of enjoyment from that deck, but I don't think I'm biased enough to get this wrong. I think it's favoured against the Demon Hunter. I really do. Oh, you're definitely biased enough to do just about anything. So let's let's just make sure we're very clear about that to begin with. Okay. Your bias what? knows no bounds. <laughs> it's a very fun deck. But I'll go to the unbiased Sotl, who has never been biased about anything in his life. Um, so, who wins this? Uh, I like the Demon Hunter. I, 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 I like the Demon Hunter by a reasonable margin as well. Interesting. Okay. I think you have to have an incredibly explosive start to get there as the, uh, as the Warlock. And even if you do, there is game on the other side um, for the 
Demon Hunter. There's not much, right? Like, if you get the in, the giant board down, the, the literal early Molten Giants with Projectionist or with Forge, right? Uh -huh. There's very few things that can answer that, but you can still just about get there with the perfect going down swinging ha uh, hand in response. Um, but I do think there are very few hands outside of that that go quick enough to not be able to say, okay, you need to do 10 damage with an existing board to kill me, right? Like, that just seems fairly straightforward to do from the do the, the Demon Hunter side most of the time. Do it. You, sh you shouldn't do this, I don't think, but I want him to do it. What do you want to do? Oh, Projectionist Projection Blood Tree. Take five, yeah. Obviously, it doesn't help your horror, which is something that everybody does the first time they play the game, the first time they play the deck. Uh, but, yeah. You are paying the health, not taking the damage. So that's the easy part of the equation, right? I think you've decided you're not... You just don't do it. You're, you're playing the 3-2, so you might as well have the 2-2 two -two to go alongside it and play the 5 health and just trust. And with everything on the line, sort of, for a chance at a semi-final, you've, you've just got to have faith in the deck you've brought at this point. And if it goes wrong, it goes wrong. It's so difficult with this deck sometimes just to do the right play. But you can just die. Okay. You really want to play this fracking, but you really, really want to play this trolley problem, right? Yeah, drawing a spell is particularly upsetting here. And that spell being fracking is one of the most conflicting things for sure. A number of two drops in the deck is not quite as many as you'd expect. Probably fine. Well, there's there's one near fight in here. Um, obviously, there's the furnace fuels would really help if you if you got them at the bottom of the deck. There is double geode, but a lot of your one drops are like spirit bomb. Extra Ooh, that's a big draw. That is a big big draw. Okay, can you go into that more? That's why that's big. Because you're about to draw a 3-mana 6-5, which is the thing that your entire game plan of your deck is built around playing this turn. But without that through Fell and Flames off the top, you'd be in the situation where it would just be sat there while you take 8 more from this board. But with the Fell and Flames, you can carve another 3 off that total, which could end up being super relevant. Now that you've hit the Magtheridon, though, you might just decide to get extra freaking greedy here. Why? I don't want to get greedy here. I, I just want to not take three because I think that next turn the Magtheridon tidies up so much stuff. Are you hoping because to keep this so that you can rush in and kill the 8 8s if they play? Exact, for exactly that reason, yes. The Magtheridon clears up all of this stuff. So three damage here is irrelevant if you can prevent yourself from ever taking damage from an 8 8 over the course of the rest of the game, right? Which is a thing that doesn't get cleared up. Yep, killing the smaller minions so that um, there's no trade option for Gabe or RVG here. Yep, trade into the two attack. It always looks weird because the, the point is to remove damage from the board. RVG knows he should be able to puzzle out what's happening here. Yeah, I don't think there's any great mystery. I think the attack into the 2-2 is a little too ambitious unless you have the Magtheridon in hand. Maybe yeah. it would still just be fine. If you just if trade? it is just a better trade. He's gone all in looking for better things. He's realised that he's probably in trouble here, right? So, rather than just jamming down a card for that wasn't going to do much, and the speaker stomper just decides, okay, I need to find giants. I can't win this game by this six. Isn't getting there. Nicely worked out, I think, for gamer there. It looks terrible because he didn't hit, but I think that was really good. 
Yeah, I agree. And I think this is now 10-7 from Pjatnica in response to the trade. 10-7 will set up lethal, right, with the combination mm -hmm. of Magtheridon and Burning Heart on the following turn. Yep. Nothing there for Gamer. So Pjatnica might be going to the semi-finals, Sotl. Certainly with the hand that we can see, is there anything that Gamer can tap into? I don't think so, not without an active Forge already in play. Tap will not take the Horror down to zero, so even if a Forge was drawn, A, the Horror wouldn't be playable with it, B, it wouldn't be big enough to challenge the Ziliax anyway. Yeah, Popgar, Symphony's too much mana, and all the other stuff is, is stuff that hurts you. Like the Rook. Trolley Problems. Like Trolley Problem is one off as it stands, and once you play Trolley Problem and draw any cards, you're not going to be able to get the way through anyway. Okay. So yeah, Gamer RVG is just going to say you don't have the damage, which is the only possible option he has. But we can see the damage is there. Burning Heart for three attack, Magtheridon for three damage to everything. Ten attack from the growing Ziliax. And after a brutal Game 4 for the Demon Hunter, Game 5 is going to get there for, for Pjatnica. Gamer RVG falls at the top 8 stage. It's another nearly story for Gamer RVG, joining the end of a very long list of nearly stories for Gamer RVG. But he is going to crash out at the last 8 stage, and it is going to be Pjatnica going through, I believe, directly now in a into a semi-final with Habu Gabu, who we saw win earlier. Yep. Just checking my notes, yes, that's exactly what we get for the first semi-final. So, it, will that be fast or will it be slow? We've got, we've got both worlds going on there. Um, but part of the slowness here was obviously the matchups involved with Gamer, with that Warrior. By the look of things, we didn't see the first two games, but that's how it feels like it came across. Gamer there put in a lot of work in that last game. It's weird how this game can make you look like an idiot when you're playing well. Like, everything he did just didn't pay off. <laughs> Because he didn't, that's how Hartson is sometimes. Um, but he, he'd, he'd got a hand on how he was losing and trying to solve the problem. Uh, but yeah, it's uh, all the way through to the semi-finals. And not one of the names we're really familiar with coming into this event. But hey, we might have to get familiar with him because he's one win away from going to the World Championships. Yeah, um, we even tried to dig in and you know found the Twitter. There's not a lot going on on there either. Yeah. Um, seems to be a, a wild competitor previously, but bit of a um, bit of an enigma. Not too much is known about the uh, the wild Pjatnica, but we do know they're very very good at Hearthstone, and they are going to have to continue to be that going up against Habu Gabu in the semi-finals, because Habu is on the uh, he's back to the back to his best, which seems to be a thing that he can turn on and off at will. Strangely <laughs> enough, of just being the best player in the world at this beloved game of Hearthstone that we all treasure. So. I mean, that is an admirable skill to have, and one that Admirable never had, weirdly. Um, but it's, uh, hey, 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 he's back, he's back watching. I had to throw it out there. What do you, what do you want from me? It's great. I just work here, all right? But yeah, it was a fantastic series overall, fantastic pair of series overall. We had the, uh, the honor and the privilege of sticking around here and doubling you up on content with a two for one, but I think we've wasted enough of their time by now, don't you, Neil? I do indeed, especially as the next two matches contain Molestar and Bunny Hopper. So let's get a move on, let's get into that next match and waste no more time. We'll see you in three.
Everyone, welcome back to the Hearthstone Masters Tour Spring Championship. And we are getting ready to get into another top eight match here. Uh, I am Dragon Rider, joined by TJ. How you doing, TJ, after we got to actually see both of those first top eight matches? Yeah, at least the second one, right? Um, and you can see just sort of the level of play that we're... Uh, we've come to expect for a top eight of this caliber uh, back and forth matches across the board and a marathon of a cast for yeah. subtle and Narinda to, yes. to kick things off. Uh, but looking to seeing how the rest of the day progresses. Yeah, absolutely excited to see because we still have quite a few very exciting players to watch today as well. So uh, we are going to be getting into another match here. Uh, if we can, jump in and look at uh, who we're going to be taking a look at in this next match. I am excited for this one. We have Molstar versus uh, Wikiu, which a lot of people very, very familiar already with Wikiu, uh, very kind of well-known player from the uh, previous year and maybe even beyond, uh, but many people not as familiar with Molstar. Uh, so just a little bit of background for Molstar uh, representing Team Swagoy. We did see him kind of showing off that uh, team jersey on day one when he uh, got that win, but uh, has been very competitive over the last handful of years, if not even longer. Definitely not a stranger to Hearthstone or competitive Hearthstone, uh, but hasn't really done anything on this scale. Has qualified for multiple Masters tours, but I would say not to this uh, level of the Masters tours. Yeah, this is the this is the big time. And uh, looking at the favorite card and favorite deck, no surprise given the lineup for Molstar, even for this event, Shield Block, favorite card, just a classic. Favorite deck, Control Warrior, which in, in some form has existed in almost every metagame in Hearthstone. And is one of the few players, obviously the archetype itself is you know, uh, subjective, but uh, bringing a full control lineup, one of the only, or the only player bringing a full control-ish lineup uh, to the field, uh, which is cool to see, going against the grain a little bit, and having success, uh, coming out in first place of Group B uh, with some very impressive performances. That we have Wikiu, who we've seen a ton over the past year, two years, and um, does have a, a, a more, I guess, I don't want to say control style lineup, but um, like skill expression lineup. And one of the players also in the top eight, that's bringing the Odin Warrior. So not high, even though there's a Reno in there, it's not the Highlander version, right? It doesn't man um, uh, or any of the top tier battle cries that you want to do. It's more control-esque. And the finisher, of course, is that Odin in these situations. And we're entering this match or this game in progress. We started it towards the end of the last one just to keep things moving along in the tournament. Um, but we're still getting to witness at least some of game one and we're already deep into it. And uh, this is a tough one to evaluate coming in in progress because <laughs> no idea what's happened so far, how juiced <laughs> this Sif is, how much burn is potentially left in the deck. Well, we has got a pretty big health total to work with, so that's one thing we can evaluate. Yes, yeah. So we are coming into this game. Wikiu on this warrior, Molsar on the mage, and yeah, uh, very deep into this. As you said, we did just get to see an Ignis come down here for Wikiu, uh, picking up this large weapon. Uh, some damage looks to be building up in Molsar's hand there. There is a Flame Geyser. Uh, there's a little bit more damage. Uh, there is the Sif and Reverb already in hand, but my question is how much damage really needs to come together for this uh, 30 armor on the other side already for WeQ? Yeah. <clears throat> okay, let's get the uh, the final treasure as well. So, I mean, we're, we're not looking too bad. Um, the the is the falling slide is that the, the uh, treasure the excavate yeah 
So that uh, that'll... that's uh, okay. It it is burn damage. Yes. Um, in, in a sense, deal three damage to a minion and the enemy hero. Um, okay, Infinitize and Max two picked up as well. So that's some additional potential burn. Just to, at this point in the game, the 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 longer you take uh, to get there. Oh, Amon Thule picked up. So just trying to present some type of threat, and it looks like this game is going to be sort of a, all right, well, we can use entering fatigue, can try and piece together burn, survive is the big one, and try and grind weak you out as this game moves forward. Great bow too. Okay, that's uh, that's very cool from the legendary pickup from Amon Thul. This is uh, shaping up to be a very powerful turn. And still getting a discover here. Instantly picks light show. Yeah, I think just trying to find anything that uh, basically reads deal damage to Wiku's face at this point uh, is what Molstar is going to be looking for. Uh, so. There is going to be a sanitize here to clear up that board with if that's uh, just wind all fury, of the armor. Is it, if that's Wind Fury, it's lethal. It's not Wind Fury. Oh, it's, it's totally just, lethal anyway. It's just lethal <laughs> yeah, anyway. <laughs> because the, the yeah. recast of the verse just... rip doubles up. It, it doubles up on the right. attack plus armor and then doubles up on the attack plus armor again. Um, in the attack, getting up to 46 damage. So we keep uh, skating by uh, at the end of this weapon. And had that one planned out, obviously, uh, with holding on to all those armor cards. And unfortunate that uh, Molstar ended that game with Sif still in hand. Um, but it, it can be tough because you do have to, you know, find ways to defend yourself. Um, you have to juice up the Sif. It takes a long time. Here, just by nature of the deck, so many ways to gain life, and, and 50 at the end of just that final turn, and then with the rock stars, just finds the ability to get lethal damage. Verse Rift is so much to gain the double attack, then you recast the, the verse rift again to gain double what is it, 10 attack from each verse rift because <laughs> you gain two yeah. armor. And then you gain armor again, and then armor again from each of the rock star. And it, you just sort of triple dip into everything. So very impressive uh, uh, damage there at the end. Yeah, you know, for uh, for such a long, grindy game, I can't believe how fast that went. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, of course, we jumped in <laughs> the very end, really. But uh, yeah. we didn't get to see much of that for how long of a game that seemed to have been. Uh, so we'll be getting to see the rest of the match here, but just to talk about their lineups overall really quickly. Uh, Weak U's Warlock has been banned, and on the other side for Molstar, the Death Knight being banned. Uh, only two Death Knights in the tournament overall. Both of them uh, did actually get into the top eight that we're seeing today. So uh, one was not banned and we didn't see it on broadcast earlier. And this one is being banned. So now Molstar uh, coming into this game number two uh, with that warrior and Wikiu on the other side with the demon hunter. So we did just see Wikiu take a win on the warrior and uh, control warrior Molstar's favorite deck, so we'll see if he can get a win on that this first game. Yeah, this can be a pretty tough matchup uh, for Demon Hunter, as we saw in the the uh, assuming they don't get um, the 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 right shoppers or the shoppers period. Um, and if, if you slow down on tempo or pressure for even just a second and you give the warrior time uh, it can be a pretty tough battle um, but opening hand for week too shabby I see a Pazic uh, um, in tech as well to get the grasp uh, pulled out of the deck no shoppers in the opening hand uh, looking pretty good as a good tempo start uh, and a good base uh, to work off of in this match 
Yeah, and just to note as well, Wiki is running just the more aggressive uh, shopper DH. It's not running uh, any of the kind of Naga extra stuff. Uh, so lots of damage potential, but yeah, having the instrument tech already, uh, also just going ahead and saving this coin for something, but it's a little bit difficult to actually try to pull off an instrument, coining instrument tech and then playing grasp. It, still ends up being played at the same time, but already uh, cobbling together quite a bit of damage that can be pushed from Weak U. Uh, and I want to mention on the other side as well, Molestar's Warrior uh, is, well, the whole lineup really, but feels uh, more geared towards a lot of control, a lot of just slow grindiness. Uh, there is the Acolyte of Pains, a Fizzle, and a Rustrop Viper. Uh, the Viper to me is really interesting in this list because uh, as we've mentioned with some of the other tech stuff that's been happening in these lists, there is some freeze effects, but the Restaurant Viper might not seem effective necessarily against the Umpire's Grasp. We did get to see it on day number two where there actually was a point going for something like a Viper and getting rid of that Umpire's Grasp was just to actually save some damage and put something on board. So I'm kind of curious if we're going to get to see something like that in this game. Uh, but with that Umpire's Grasp coming down, there is no Viper here for Molstar. You can go for the Hammer and just uh, try to clear up the board a little bit, gain some armor. But there is the Blade Storm and now a Shield Slam in hand that are kind of ready to start removing some of the demons that will be coming out over the next couple of turns. Yeah, if I had to take a guess, I would say the Rush Rot Viper is uh, more for, like, the shot and jazz base. Because uh, yeah, that's kind yeah. of the one weakness of the warrior against um, any of the shamans in the field if they are running the jive. Yep. Uh, because it gets rid of that possibility to go conductivity. And if you're when you're playing warrior, that's really the only way uh, uh, it's consistent way that you're even going to lose to uh, the shamans. Uh, and there's some splash death knight at times too uh, for the weapon but it really yeah. just does three damage in this particular matchup but again weak you text bar um get the mag there on and sort of that uh with the observer uh and starting to piece together a good keeping the pressure up and piecing together a good amount of damage uh in hand so looking quite good at this stage, uh, Molsar's had a lot of decisions uh, to be made this game, right? Playing the Fizz on three, putting a snapshot in the deck, which is a pretty valuable uh, Fizzle in terms of this matchup, because it was basically uh, the snapshot to have a bunch of armor gain in it and a Blade Storm. Basically, just defensive. But there also was an opportunity to get an Acolyte of Pain down there, which would have almost guaranteed to draw uh, at least two cards uh, current board state. So. Um, Fizzle is putting an extra card in your deck, which, when you sure, you still cost two mana. Or is that um, potentially even better defense tools out of the deck? So, uh, even though they seem like small decisions, it's only turn three, so that can have a big impact. But once our soldiers moving on, still relatively healthy, uh, get saving these weapon swings out. Um, has trial fire lined up for next turn. Uh, to be able to deal with the board. But this pop be rough. It's not the best when you're going into turn six. Just because they can just play on the, the, the two bots. And, and then just take a look. The, the extra four damage from the pause. and move on with their lives. Um, but it, it it's one of the best proactive plays to be made right now. Yeah, it doesn't seem like there's a ton of going on in the hand right now that's more uh, proactive on the board. Really don't want to go for a going down swinging until it does potentially a little bit more either on board or clearing up uh, for a lethal going into the uh, face on the other side from uh, Molstar. So I don't know. Yeah, I, I see the pause that come down. There still is an observer. Uh, in hand that can bring out a couple of secrets and i don't know if we mentioned it but uh magtheridon was picked up from the uh, mini so we do get to 
uh, see Magtheridon at some point, uh, but it hasn't come down yet. And it also is getting an extra discount as well from the oscillator that has been played. Um, BQ opting to go for one of these Spirit of the Teams as well, push a little bit of damage. Uh, I kind of do really like leaving Molstar as well at uh, just a couple of armor. There is the chance that this board is going to get cleared, but I, I think at some crucial points in these games, like you were talking about, uh, leaving up a little bit of armor for the warrior means that they have to spend extra mana on that safety goggles. So that's potentially uh, another minion that they don't get to play like an Acolyte of Pain that they could use in combination with some sort of removal uh, like the Bladestorm in hand. But just making them kind of choose between what cards they're playing and when seems pretty great. Yeah, and I'm, I'm, I'm also pretty interested by the, this uh, this choice here from Molstar. I guess just playing more towards mana. Um, I'd like to play from Wiku to put on the that, that pressure uh, spirit because Wiku knows that it's it the expected play from Molstar is just to play out the two bots uh, to challenge and then try to remove the. F um, so just trying to get that damage. Now the Magtheridon is going to come out, because once again, Wiku ex uh, didn't play the Magtheridon on last turn. He would have just been for free to push the extra damage, because did expect the two bots out, and was going to use the Magtheridon even more damage. Up these uh, uh, Valkyrs, and continue pushing. And it is looking pretty rough, but... Is hoping that the observer is at least just going to buy some time. Uh, these are be to uh, attack into, and Molstar is down under twenty health. So, uh, what was the pick? Okay, I thought it was going to be sanitized for a second, but you're just going to have to go safety goggles. Yeah, we'll find out if the secret is ice trap there. Oh, that's terrible. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> it's the, <laughs> because it just. <laughs> it's, it, it, it doesn't mean it costs less. Yep. It reads cost zero if you don't have armor. So regardless of Ice Trap, it's... Um, nice little... Uh, so you, uh, play around that possibility. Yeah. I I'm kind of interested as well uh, with what's going to happen next. Uh, I guess at this point... You know, he's already played three cards in the turn. Didn't see a 6-6 six -six rat come down, so... Uh, didn't have to worry about dealing with a larger body after using other clear. It's just deciding uh, if he wanted to try to attack into uh, the spirit of the team, but yeah, there still was one hunter secret up, so decided not to attack into it, and I, I think that was a a good payoff there because the secret was the bait and switch so would have added more stats and still not died anyways yeah i think even if i don't want to say that i was going to say even if there wasn't a secret up there's actually some debate to holding the swing anyway to be able to get the stone skin armor down uh the potential for it for free uh, on the fall i mean to spend an um, yeah, so then you have yeah, six extra to work with as opposed to having to gain armor for, for um, but with the spirit and draw the three cards from the Acolyte of uh, Molstar stabilizing uh, but still stabilizing and Weak U knows that Molstar's just been able to react to every board and he's been able to create yeah, and that trend will continue because the cards that were drawn in the past turn for Molstar are Reno, which I don't think is active quite yet, but there is so much draw in this deck that there is uh, quite a bit there that, that 
likely will be active fairly soon, uh, but also Aftershock, Ignis, and the Odin. Although we have already seen throughout this game, we keep being very, very aggressive, kind of pushing a lot of this damage. Uh, the Magtheridon did wake up, so not going to be able to deal extra damage there, but the Ballhog just kind of filled in that role instead. And Molstar is just down to 10 health, is still going down swinging sitting in hand, but at this point, Molstar might just want to try to stabilize a little bit, gain some armor, and continue removing boards as he's been. He hasn't even forged uh, anything yet either, so the Ignis will not be offering any weapons at this point, although does find a sanitize. Not enough mana this turn to sanitize, uh, forge it, and play it. Although, it's debatable if that is even necessary with a board of just a 3-3 three, three, and a 1-1 one, one on the board. Yeah, just gonna gain armor. <laughs> yeah. Thing, like maybe aftershock is uh is gonna be good okay red card additional damage really uh, weak you doesn't really have any other choice just push yeah and what the the ball hog get this mac dared on uh, three recurring damage for the next few turns um but that's the last oh. duplicate wow for Moltstar, and that's going to be, I, I would say, game. Uh, I don't know what week you can get. Okay, <laughs> Instrument Tech yeah. is is got to be the best draw. Either that or the Umpire Grasp it's being slightly better. So, again, has the, the second shop um, in deck as well. All chance uh, to be able to get this done. Yeah, I suppose with uh, so much floating mana, even though there is uh, not much that the instrument tech itself is going to do, sure, you you get to get that instrument tech, get a 1-2 on the board that uh, maybe forces Molstar to use the hero power on that instead. But yeah, at this point, this is looking uh, pretty uh, set in stone here for Molstar. It says Hearthstone, so anything could happen, I suppose. But... Now the Forge Sanitize uh, has been played and the Ignis gets to discover a weapon here. So uh, seeming like a very good spot for Molstar. Maybe there's something that Wikiu can find here. Uh, had to attack already with the Umpire's Grasp. So uh, if an Inquisitor had been pulled off of the Window Shopper, then wouldn't be able to attack in a face. <laughs> this turn, but who needs that when you can just discover double Magtheridon and now sets Molstar to eight. Okay. And as well, this is it's scary. Yeah. What's the most amount of life? It's probably got to be hammer, the runic hammer. Yep. The, is it wind fury gain eight, this. or was it something else gain eight? I didn't get to see it. We know it has the armor on it. Yep. And in the snapshot was uh, there was blade storm. Um. Plate, safety goggles. Okay. Okay, just gonna remove the board and gain armor efficiently instead of re-equipping the runic hammer and taking the, uh, the additional damage from the board. Okay, <laughs> I mean, just pushing damage, six more incoming. Yeah. Seven more now with the weapon swing. Just 
Peeling off Molstar's armor turn by turn. <laughs> this has been a game where Molstar has just had to go on the complete defensive. Uh, just really can't play this Odin at any point. Just really has to keep making plays to try to stay alive and stay in the game. Um, both of the... Oh, Lifesteal. Okay. It is Lifesteal. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Uh, both my Theradons were played in the same turn and have now uh, done their damage two times. So they will be waking up on this next turn. And one red card has already been used um, from Weak U. So see if this is enough, but extra life steal and some armor. The other red card just drawn is Anne Kane. Is this enough? Still not enough, is it? No. There's 20 health. Maybe over the next few turns, you can red yeah. card Kane and hero power, and then the following turn after that, try and get with going down swinging. Um, so you'd be dealing six, nine, ten this turn. Yeah, this going down swinging, just waiting in hand here. I can push, push some extra on board damage if there is some sort of taunt or anything that somehow comes down later. But um, I still feel like there is just so much that Molsar can do. He has so many cards in hand, so many options. I'm gonna go for the Garrosh's gift and a shield block. Which works perfectly with the sanitize. I think this is definitely yep. a case where you're uh, you know, just going for these removal options uh is so much better in terms of going for something like the Garrosh's gift and brawl. Uh, because you do get to kind of guarantee that all of it gets cleared instead of leaving up 6-6. Six, six. Either way, you remove the board. That three damage from the ball hog is still going to hit him in the face. But then he has that uh, beautifully crafted weapon from Ignis to get him more life gain and armor at the same time. So uh, quite a bit of life has been gained. I don't, I don't see a way that like, you can squeak out this game. Yeah, that's just going to be uh, Oh no, th this is not the same as the Craftsman, or is it? Is it after your hero attacks or when your attacks? I forgot for the hammer, wasn't sure if it was worded differently uh, But that would have been 13 with the 8 armor gain So Molstar, going to tie up the series It'll be 1-1 one, one now And uh, that was a pretty impressive game uh, from Molstar So much pressure, but just Spacing out the resources, not overreacting to the small hordes, not afraid to take a little bit of damage here and there. They're able to stabilize uh, the game right when uh, the the big stuff because it wasn't a bad opening for Weeku whatsoever. Um, yeah. If if maybe if Weeku could have followed up immediately with Second Umpire's Grasp, Chopper, to just have that some pressure. There were were a couple turns that were a little bit uh, a lulled in the pressure um, then yeah. may maybe could have uh, had that one uh, but as it played out it, the answers were just there uh, for Molstar yeah and I think things like the crucial uh, drawing with still nine cards remaining after the draw of getting the last duplicate out of the deck and the Reno being active uh, for Molstar was also very helpful as well. So being able to kind of make sure that Weeku could not keep applying any sort of board pressure if he had drawn it as well. Yeah. And now we have best of three left remaining. Shaman on both sides. They are different. Uh, quite yes. a bit different, uh, actually. Um, for... Uh, Molstar, and then that Demon Hunter that we just saw. So we are actually are going to get to see the Class Mirror, uh, but a little bit different, whereas we keep playing that that Jive Shaman, uh, basically Nature Shaman with the uh, Conductivity plus Jive Insect uh, combination, whereas Molstar is playing that Shutter Block. That's right. It is... 
yeah, it is not a nature shaman. It is really very kind of focused on uh, going in on some control aspects and this shutter block at the top end. Lots of healing, lots of kind of tech, as we see here with this glacial shard coming into hand, uh, some armor gain, and things like that armor vendor, uh, potentially Watcher of the Sun, I would say, and the Ignis are some incredible, incredible, maybe even the uh, Zilliax as well, uh, incredible targets for that shutter block to hit. So definitely we'll be keeping an eye out on that. And the crucial uh, double dirty rat in the deck list for Molstar as well. Uh, if Molstar is able to use the dirty rat to pull out something like the Golgoneth and remove that uh, pretty quickly off of the board without giving Wiki additional uh, mana discounts. That can be huge. And also the uh, double baking soda volcano uh, can add quite a bit of healing. But on the other side, if Wiki can cobble together a board and get that uh, you know, jazz base to discount, get a board of Ragnaros, that is a lot of pressure that can come out in one turn that uh, Molstar would have to heal after the fact and remove the Ragnaroses at the same time. Be pretty difficult. There are some ways you can get like above some of the health thresholds, but if if this Jive Shaman, if it's given enough time, um, and Dirty Rat doesn't hit something crucial, um, like spell damage. Yeah. It can be tough to survive to that damage. You just have to keep building a board to make it that much more difficult, putting on a little bit of pressure. Uh, force some of the uh, damage from the Jive Shaman to come out um, it def defensively. So it is, for Molstar, it is about disruption. It's about keeping the, the health total high um, and trying to put on pressure where you can to try and get to the, the, the big uh, late game portion. Uh, where you kind of shine so see if it's going to work out it did start with uh the fairy tale force which is a great way to accelerate your game plan and find some of those powerful battle cries uh at a slight discount but that's not enough you look at this hand you're like yeah. wow that's a pretty good <laughs> arena hand um it, you have yes. to watch it all to see it come together there's ignis at a discount as well can get it forged not sure if molestar wants to play like a tempo ignis or say, save it late for later on uh, for the value with Shutter Block. I feel like this matchup's a little too quick to try and get greedy with it. Yeah. So might just see a forge here on the Watcher of the Sun with maybe an Armor Bender, and then uh, could see just going in with Ignis next turn, picking a temp and try to accelerate the game in, in that way. Or could just get the Watcher down now, yeah. It's more damage. <laughs> it's two attack instead of three. Mm -hmm. Instead of one. Yep. Oh, Pick oops, up a little you. bit of healing. Sure. I am looking at this hand from Wikiu, though. There is a discovered flash of lightning. There's a jazz base that is still sitting in hand. Uh, double lightning reflexes. There's a crash and a uh... lightning bolt. Uh, and a yeah. discover option here for even more like this damage is starting to come together very very quickly uh and then of course yeah. that golgonut that we mentioned as well this could be a very incredible uh turn maybe seven closing yeah. out the game i mean this might be a kill on turn seven um yeah. yep just close this, it out like yeah and <gasps> this looks like a setup without overloading on five and ignoring the board completely for golgonath uh, so he's just going to go with the the uh, Dirty Rat and finds the Zapper, which is a great pickup. Uh, so Ken just fit in the Ignis uh, with it. And none of these are like proactive options. I guess Lifesteal. And then yeah. um, uh, deal four well. damage. I don't know about that. Maybe you <laughs> yeah. just summon a four cost minion. Yeah. Oh my goodness. And Wiki draws the uh, Jive Insect in case he wants to go that route with this uh, base, uh, Jazz base already equipped. Gonna have to hit with it 
uh, this turn if he wants to be able to hit with it again next turn for it to be uh, ready to go, but still might just be able to close it out. I think we did see this as well uh, on day number two with this jazz base where the setup was very, very similar to this. Uh, there was a lot of damage in hand and even without being able to discover additional direct damage from things like the lightning reflexes, uh, the jazz base being able to discount and put uh, some Ragnaroses on the board was just enough to close out the game. I really suspect that we are going to uh, see that next turn, but is there any sort of setup, I guess, besides this five cost weapon uh, and maybe the armor vendor that Molstar can uh, do this turn to try to prevent that? Uh... Because you got to kill the Golgonet too, which is the yeah. tough part. Um, and summoning a four cost minion and use a pop up pop up turn is not necessary <laughs> because it's usually just going to yeah. get swept up by the crashes regardless. Oh, step four is not really. Uh, and yeah, if you expect the pop up to happen, uh, uh, just to try and as much as you can and yeah. stay on the following turn here we go we knows the assignment start with that uh reflexes does find a lightning bolt which is incredible for extra damage but also uh, the significance of the very cheap spells to keep playing discounted nature spells uh sure another jive insect oh my gosh where is all the extra damage here There's just so much damage in hand already with these other lightning bolts and crash, though. Plus uh, potential damage from the weapon, because, of course, the crash is just going to clear up oh. uh, that rat off the board. Pop, pop. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, that's it. It still gets another discover as well, if he gets yeah. it. It doesn't matter. Another lightning He's got bolt. It. There you go. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah. Well. At this I'm point, it's just crash, pop-up book, <laughs> swing job. Yeah. And you're uh, oh no, there's no connectivity. Never connectivity offered, but uh, no, but that's still going to be it. Right, because the uh, damage from the, the weapon end, as well. Yeah. Exactly. So yeah, just uh, one Ragnaros. Yeah, we we did see this in a previous series on day number two as well. Uh, sometimes the one Ragnaros is all you need, or even if. Uh, if Wiki had been able to find just one more pop-up book or one more lightning bolt, which there already were quite a few of anyways, uh, just that additional damage is enough there. Uh, and one kind of downside, I would say, to some of the decks like uh, on the other side from Molstar that don't get to just amass huge piles of armor to stop those big pop-off turns. nice lead in the series with um so obviously we're seeing variations of it uh but the umpro graph uh, a, a big engine for them but a lot of different variations yeah. To take it, uh, I think Wiku's got to be feeling pretty good. I mean, could be. Uh, but looking at the lineups, uh, I would say Wiku has won with the two kind of more uh, aggressive, bursty, um, or excuse me. Uh, yeah. Wiku has won with the more aggressive, bursty style with the Shaman. Uh, but still needs to win with the Demon Hunter because did struggle with it in the previous game. Uh, and after that, has a warrior. Oh no, already won with the warrior. Already won with the warrior. We got Mage and um, Shaman left for Molstar and just a Demon Hunter left for Wiki. 
yeah, I think I had the them backwards here. But yeah, so Wikiu, uh jumping in on the Demon Hunter now for this next game, Molstar, uh, staying on the Shaman. How do you feel about this matchup here? You think uh, this is favored for one or the other, or is it a little bit more even? I think there's enough defensive tools in the Shaman to... Obviously, it's not as much defensive tools. Um, uh, you can... Most of the field tempo, um, I but I don't really consider the shaman like tier one at the moment, right? Where I would consider this tier one matchup seems like it could be good on tech cards that Molstar has that are very good against the deck. Um, I just don't know if the deck is cons to get to those tech way to win the game afterwards. Uh, before week you can find enough damage. You don't have like a million armor gain to give you that buffer like Warrior has. So we'll see. It's going to be close. I, I don't think I can count Demon or out in, in many matchups currently. So I might yeah. get a slight edge to week you. Yeah, and this Shaman is not like the Shaman that we just saw for week you either. Right? This. Uh... This shaman is, as we mentioned, more of that shutter block kind of battle cry shaman. So uh, there really isn't the kind of big, bursty, huge uh, bunch of nature spell type turns. There isn't the potential of uh, the jive insect big turns, I guess, unless something like that gets discovered. But uh, most are definitely going to just have to automatically take the more defensive, I think, side of this matchup but pretty well situated to at least start off with that with this glacial shark that we come uh can see come down here freezing to prevent that second swing of the umpire's grasp for weq uh so weq just has to go in a little bit with uh, a different plan here kind of deciding between playing the miracle salesman or the taste of chaos I'm just going to go for the Taste of Chaos and try to discover something here. Fan the Hammer is some extra damage. Uh, or Sigil of Time could just be some extra draw. There are two Glacial Shards in the deck, so maybe Wikiu is, uh, is a little worried that Mostar might already have both of those. Just <laughs> ready to go. Already saw the one. Hello, I've jumped in. <laughs> welcome, welcome. Yeah, we're um, just, sorry, uh... just catching up with the game, actually. Just give me one second. Yeah, of course. Uh, just having a, a little bit of technical difficulty. So thanks for jumping in and uh, helping me out here, Raven. Yeah, we are looking at uh, Molstar on this. Uh, we kind of just uh, control heavy shutter block shaman. Going for some healing and discovers here. Could discover another baking soda volcano. Yeah, that is a There's lot already... of removal, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> if that's the already case, two it... in hand. Yeah, it is. that's probably maybe a bit. I mean, it's yeah. tough, isn't it? Because yeah. you could say it's too much removal, but also if you just kill everything Demon Hunter has, there's limited ways in which they can actually push damage, right? Yeah. Yeah, I do like going for the uh, the the not you know the eighteenth <laughs> removal card here. And going, try, trying to be a little bit more aggressive. Yeah. Hey, the window shopper being mm. available, nice and early. Obviously, WeQ is not going to be able to say instantly benefit from this, but still, just getting the tempo is going to be nice. That door was made yep. just for me. Mm. Decides to go for the window shopper. Uh, does find a bassist or maybe the one amalgam band. I'm not sure if the tough crowd gets picked here ever on on this uh, higher cost first discover option. Yeah, I also think like even just in this matchup, right? It's probably a, a bigger ask. I, I was looking at the uh, the amalgam though, but we keep going for the uh, max tempo now because even though that was technically a three cost obviously this mean uh, this specific menu gets reduced so it's a little bit better yeah. to get the tempo now but you do always have to look at that amalgam because i think it was up to three which is 
you're feeling pretty good about like stealth or divine shield or reborn, right? Like th those are the three sort of surviving options you can get. Yeah. You know, that's a lot of pressure being put on by WeQ, but you never feel safe when you're against the Shaman, do you? Because you know they're just like a turn away from clearing your board and dealing 20 to you or something, right? And that's just <laughs> as a defensive clear, never mind anything else. And there's a yeah. Volcano one. Yeah. I also, I just, I love this uh, whiz bang set where we have cards like baking soda volcano. <laughs> or, uh, yeah, that's that's something that we get to say on broadcast. We're talking about baking soda volcanoes. <laughs> yeah. Love it. Also, it's always um, great when it just lead, uh, sort of leans into, so I'm going to say silly things. And I think a lot of the time when you call something silly, it's a negative. But I mean it in the most positive way, right? Like I yeah. like silly things and they're great. So yeah, I uh, completely agree on that one. Yeah, they've got another option, but it, ah, those are the ones you don't really want to see with the ones, right? Like, yes, it can get poison, divine shield, reborn as something on board, but you never looking for this. Like, I think they were almost yeah. like just... Were they the same options each discover there? I'm not sure, but still, not the best. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> the mini, uh, yeah, got that one amalgam band, which did give stealth and wind fury. So now it can do a whopping two damage instead of just one. Uh, I mean, very that exciting. is literally double. That, you <laughs> know, is. if you could do double the damage, you'd take that. It's just you've got to put in the small print uh, that that doubling is of one. Yeah. But there's just, there's so much removal from right. Molstar. I Okay. The, the ball hog or additional uh, attack damage that could come out of weak use deck might just be able to be enough kind of reach that maybe he doesn't need to stay on board uh so <laughs> is that still no inquisitors were found i think inquisitor would definitely uh help as well in this case just trying to make sure that we you can deal as much damage as possible uh mm -hmm. without having to rely on staying on board uh, but did get to put down some decent sized bodies here and has a couple of secrets out on the board now. So Molstar has to consider what these secrets could be as there's one mage and one uh, hunter secret. Yeah, it's really tricky, honestly, because like, all Weeku you can really do in this kind of scenario, because Molstar's playing a bit more of a controly style shaman, is that just mm -hmm. keep putting waves of threats out. This, uh, the fact one of these secrets was mage was actually quite helpful. Uh, it might not be the one that Weeku is looking for, which would have, of course, been like, like forcing some kind of counter spell shenanigans here. But, um, but yeah, it's still not too bad. But look at that, just heal back up to full, play the board, and Molstar gets to just say. Yeah, try try again, I guess. But when seeing yeah. these shoppers being used up, it, you feel, you must be feeling great if you're Molestar, because it's like, okay, well, there's most of the shopper stuff done, and I'm on full health and have a handful of cards, right? Like That's a position yeah. you uh, quite fancy your chances in uh, if you're against Demon Hunter. <laughs> Abyssal Basis picked up uh, again, but this one being a uh, one one, not quite as impactful as that large body. <laughs> I feel uh, like this is, this is the story of the tournament. This, Maybe it's yeah. just me, I'm cursed, <laughs> but the amount of times I'm like, well, that's not what they wanted as a one one, but hey, it's something yeah. because I, I feel like people have just hit Mag on a lot less than I'm used to seeing on ladder, at least. I'm sure yeah. all my uh, opponents hit Mag on from both discovers. <laughs> of course. Uh, I mean, we do have the the much smaller sample size of just the amount of games that we've been able to to see for this tournament. Um, I also do want to note that the I feel like we actually have seen the secrets be quite impactful, even when people don't get to discover Magtheridon. As that previous turn, uh, Molstar didn't end up playing the one mana uh, pop up book that could have also gotten him an additional discover of another nature spell. Uh, because he was playing around that hunter secret and didn't want to play a third card and put up a rat sure. after clearing those other minions didn't want to then leave weak you with a, a six six rat so you know, have to kind of uh decide the risks there sometimes when you're uh, playing around those secrets yeah i think with that um normally when you're picking the secret option from the shopper uh you're not picking it because it's like oh yeah this is the best card ever you're picking it because it's like better than bad 
right? Which is normally what that <laughs> yeah. discovers led to. If you the secrets is the best bad option basically um and if you get any extra value from those secrets whether it's limiting your opponent or if the secret goes off you gain some damage or a bounce uh, that's that's a sort of you know a small victory you're going to take in that scenario because you are picking what i would still categorize as one of the options you are not looking for from shopper yeah yeah and also getting it in uh, this game in that context as the six five body too just to yeah to put a big threat out was uh, really impactful here. Uh, Weekyu now has drawn both red cards, but both shoppers and both minis, as you mentioned, already being used. Uh, so the red cards might just have to be used in a sense of uh, putting something on Molstar's board uh, into well, that uh, dormant, if he even plays them. Yeah, it's tricky. I think that it's definitely worth looking at because if you think about it, Weeku could basically make this dirty rat not exist for the rest of the game, right? Like very broadly speaking, with two red cards, and yeah. like that is a valid option because Weeku's not got a lot to work with, and also that rat's gonna soak six damage. You could just red card that and just push, right? It, you know, instead yeah. it may not work out, but it's an option. Whereas now that six damage and what? three minions i think traded in and i get it like weeku's not exactly got a lot to go with probably trying to store up some burst and maybe save those red cards for the first turns but when you have going down swinging anyway um i don't know if that was worth just trying to hold on to the board there uh, but it's always difficult when we're seeing like molestar's hand and it's like right yeah molestar's fine <laughs> it's okay you've really got to force yeah. yourself to be in weeku's mindset of how do i win this game as opposed to let's look at molestar's game winning hand okay so th this is what i was thinking is maybe he actually decided uh a couple of things first his board is probably getting cleared anyways so he's just gonna make the trades now uh, and save these red cards for the likelihood of large minions coming off of an ignis weapon uh that feels maybe a little bit more like this is how i don't you know how i keep myself in the game longer against those large minions that are a possibility rather than how do i try to end this a little bit faster before that it ignis weapon even gets there it's tricky though, isn't it? Because like the way I maybe it's just the way I think about things, but the way I would view it is, well, if you just traded loads of your minions away, Molstar yeah. doesn't have to clear the board, right? Because yeah. you've kind of done it anyway. So it's like the board's so small that it's not important. But regardless, Molstar's going to take the victory and even up the series. And that was just rough. And you see the like if you whiff on Shopper, it's not normally the end of the game, but it definitely can be if you don't have that strong follow up and also you get the um. You, you ha against that Shaman deck, which just has so much heal, so much AoE removal. It can discover more, as we saw it as well. So, yeah, it's a, a, a real tough one there, I think, for Weeku. Yeah, and you know, I think that's just uh, one inevitability of this variant of the Demon Hunter, uh, and potentially why we saw uh, some of the other players kind of opt more for the Naga version, is that there is a little bit more of that kind of follow-up in that version, whereas this, as we've talked about, once those shoppers come down, if all of those threats get removed, it's kind of just you're sitting there looking at your hands. Either it's empty or it's full of a, a bunch of cards, like what we just saw with red cards that you don't do anything with. And uh, yeah, you're not winning from that point. So yeah, uh, but hey, there's still the last game here. Either one of these players can still get there. Yeah, and that's what it's going to come down to, isn't it? We've got the Demon Hunter, of course, still for Wii Q, and then the Mage left for Molestar. So uh, this one, it's all going to come down to this. And again, it's just going to be another story. And I think this is generally going to be the plan for anyone who either has or will have to in the future face Molestar in this tournament is you've just got to try and just get through it, right? Because you know just not only from the lineup, but just the way Molestar plays is just very value-based, very steady, controlled play. And you just know you've got to just break through. And if you can't, you will just sort of peter out, right? Like we saw from the previous yeah. game from WeQ. So I guess I, I would say that Mage is probably the, the most, the deck more susceptible and maybe not quite as good at sustained uh, defense versus some of the other decks that Molestar's brought yeah and 
The the starting hand for Molstar here, getting Sif and Puzzle Master Cadgar. Maybe the Fleet Skater uh, can come in, but just initially, if there's a lot of early pressure that comes out from Weak U, which we have seen in the in the other couple of games, mm -hmm. this hand seems a little slow uh, to start things off. But once it gets to that mid game. Molstar already has some good pieces and tools to just keep things frozen, keep weak use face frozen or large minions frozen, and then uh, potentially have some things come out of Cadgar. But uh, sometimes Cadgar can kind of really feel like a, a hit or miss. <laughs> yeah, for sure. I do like this, though. I like the respect to just kill off the minion. Um, you know, it can start stacking a little bit uh, and push some damage. And also, we've seen it before in some other matchups, in some other games, where it looks maybe weird to, like, respect a small minion. But if the game starts spiraling out of control, it's not that that minion particularly kills you, but it's that you don't actually have the time or mana to kill them off because you sort of didn't use yeah. it early enough. So yeah, I do like this from Molstar here, just remove as much as possible from the board early and try and build on that. And I think we're going to be seeing this coin potentially held on to as long as possible to try and coin out the Sleet, for example, just because outside of that for now, there's not much for this coin to get used from because I don't think Molstar is going to feel good about, say, coining out, you know, like a ping or something, or even coining out this one two. Uh, although it has come for the discover options yeah. now, so we probably will see the elemental yeah. this turn. So, a light bomb, ice barrier, or the primordial glyph. I, I guess the glyph could discover you something else, but light bomb is also not a terrible option when you could be facing down uh, some other things. But it mm. feels it feels a little clunky and slow, considering it, that your rest of your hand is also exactly. <laughs> kind the of problem slow. is it's like competing with too many other yeah. cards, whereas what Molstar doesn't have. A cheap spells to just get rid of and use. Uh, there is the Frostbolt that's probably uh, Molstar now going to be staring greatly and expecting a weapon. If there's no weapon, then the Frostbolt either can be used for minion removal or it can be held onto and said, well, when if a weapon is equipped before I can win, then that Frostbolt can go face and just stop the swing. But I think uh, overall Molstar will be pretty happy at this outcome of just no weapon on curve, which means a lot less damage being represented. But you do have to keep an eye on that Zilliax in hand for Wiku because that can uh, escalate things quite yeah. dramatically. Yeah, Ooh, especially okay. with the, I guess from Molstar's perspective, the potential of what the spark bots could be. Uh, there is right. a lot of right, like targeted spells, but if Wiki were to find stealth, then that's something Molstar might have to consider and could play into uh, some of the potential discover picks, maybe even something like this explosive runes. Uh, and I'm just looking at the uh, the list again to make sure, but there is nothing like star power or anything that could answer a stealth uh, large minion. So. Right. That would definitely be something that uh, Molstar could have at uh, kind of the, you know, the back of his head here. The pain. <laughs> yeah. You see that? Oh. Yeah. I mean, it's still relatively safe, right? I mean, there are discovers, of course, that could cause issues. The tricky part there is, like, like we could. So, we could have tested for that, but is it worth trying to test? Because it does mess up the turn to an extent, yeah. I think. So, yeah, we'll have to see. Already a little bit upset at this coin coming out, but... Oh! <laughs> see, I, and, uh, I am not laughing at WeQ, but it's just it is funny to see the response. Um, the escalation of, oh no, I am now <laughs> yeah. the 6-2 stealth instead of a much larger minion. But Allstar doesn't really have an answer to it as of yet. Yeah. Ice Barrier could be a consideration just for a bit of a defensive option. There is still that Frostbolt available if he wants to take out the 0 3. Yeah. Oh! It did. Oh, lizard. Okay. Oh. And it's discounted, so we can come yeah. out next turn. I was just about to make the point that he just used the coin as well, which uh, delays the uh, potential Blizzard from yep. Yep. Cadgar. But who needs that? Now, Don't trust in Cadgar. You just find the Blizzard. This is so big. Because 
I have won many games on ladder to play is obviously much worse than Wii Q when they do this play and then just hold the Zilliax for too long. Yeah. For me, I mean, this goes way back to what Naxxramas with Shade, right? Of like, you've got 12 damage on a two health minion. Cash it in. That is my view on this anyway. Like just, yeah. and I'm really trying not to be biased from the Blizzard, but genuinely, if you get 12 damage from this minion, is that not just great? Especially being at two health, it dies to like a sneeze from Molestar here uh, to a lot yeah. of discovered AOE. So I, I think Weeku should put this in, but I mean, there's a universe somewhere where he doesn't, and that is awfully scary considering we can see this uh, Blizzard. And it's not that, like for example, there's a spark bot in hand, right? So it can buff mm -hmm. the Zilliax, but to survive Blizzard, but it's still frozen. Yeah. Oh, the old, thanks, uh, Arthur. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for reminding me, because I always forget. I need that reminder every time. Now, I I, I want to ask your thoughts on this. It feels like a, a real cutesy kind of play. I've seen people try this. Is there ever a thought to using the red card on your own Zilliax? to keep it from being removed? Uh, I don't think so. I, honestly, I was looking at the red card on the 0-3, funnily enough. You know, to like attack and then red card it and then just wait for a while and then it pops back up and you can get the buff back uh, again. Uh, that, that's something I was looking at, but um, I think what WeQ isn't looking at right now is this blizzard that's about to slap him in the face. <laughs> yeah. Oh, there it is. I think WeQ needs a <laughs> good draw. Well, don't need a weapon. You just pick up the window shopper. At least it is something to continue these threats. Uh, but as we see, again, with that uh, amazing caster vision, there's a lot of freeze on the other side now. That sleet skater that's still been waiting, that frost bolt, and now a cryo preservation uh, coming into hand as well. Those are the bad ones. Uh, no Magtheridon for extra damage. No Inquisitor for uh, <laughs> extra pop-off damage. Uh, that's an expensive Glaivesmith. Oh, again, like, I... Uh, yeah, I guess it's fine. I think my brain's just telling me to, to promote a bad play, which it often does with me, honestly. <laughs> but I just keep looking at it like, oh, this Zero one is very... Uh, small right what if you just uh, yeah. red card it and then later it's gonna pop and you get to swing for two but this is just it's a 26 one zilliax the tricky part here is most has to work out do is drawing cards good for most is the ice barrier enough likely well you can look at ice barrier plus other stuff of course like frostbolt the six five um or is it the Chadgar. Is it just play and hope that it casts the right spell? <laughs> uh, I mean, this is a 26-1, and the 1 is not yeah. being done this turn as of yet. <laughs> just... Yeah, and I mean, th this is one uh, benefit for Wiki having kept that stealth and not attacking when it was 12, mm -hmm. is that like you mentioned, uh, giving it that slight buff meant it played around a potential blizzard, but <laughs> if it doesn't get yes. answered now, it's just lethal. All right. Most yeah, I've never seen a good Khadgar, Khadgar in I don't my know. life. Frostball. Oh. Where is it hidden? Not to the Zilliax. Wow. wow. Yep, that's it. 52 damage right. Zilliax. Is it lethal? Uh, yeah, just about. <laughs> I, I think I need just... some help counting there, but just about. Yeah. <laughs> See, that was... Oof. That was so close, and the, the, I'm sure better players than me will will have opinions on the Zilliax staying in stealth, etc. But my thing was, well, if WeQ put him down by 12 previously, yes, it would be then killable because it wouldn't be stealth, like completely understand, of course. But I think, what was he on, like 17 then? or something or like it, it was pretty yeah. low basically so it's like you know that was still a good amount of damage so yeah we'll, we'll have to you know think about the alternate ways that game could have played out but either way the blizzard was there but the extra little bot buffing the uh, zilliax up to three 
uh, it kept it alive long enough to clutch. So yeah, it was a really there you go. So a twelve hit would have actually put Molstar down to uh, five in this instance, which still would have been an extremely threatening health total for Weeku to be able to clear up. But yeah, once again, I feel like I've just not seen a Khadgar save anyone's life right now. <laughs> yeah, and, uh, that no. theme seems to continue. But Weeku, what what a what a win! Yeah. Incredible uh, finish there. I, I think for me, the kind of standout play in that uh, was kind of that recognition of I'm just going to add this extra little one one <laughs> onto that Zilliax to keep that health. Uh, as Zotel is uh, reminding us in the chat, that Sleek Skater would have uh, targeted that and just given all armor back. So not. Uh, not worth really attacking with the Zilliax, but I think just the recognition of uh, actually using the extra stats from that added little 1-1. One, one. But yeah, we see there Wiku going to move up into the top four now. Uh, so we just have one more player to see who will make it into uh, the top four. And it's been an exciting day so far. We've gotten to see a lot of really great games, but there is still more to come. And I think one of the biggest things is to see which two players will end up qualifying for the World Championship. So that is still to come. We have a couple more games before then. So make sure that you don't go anywhere except for maybe to just grab a snack, use the restroom, and get ready for more Hearthstone action right after this.
Hello everyone and welcome back. I have returned already to actually go for maybe casting a full match of Hearthstone for me today as my first one. Uh, I'm joined by Same. TJ though, as TJ who's also welcome back here very quickly. Yeah. Uh, how's it going my friend? Yeah, the, the world of uh, of online casting gets difficult. Uh, <laughs> apologies for the difficulties earlier. Hopefully things are a little bit fixed. At least on my end, looking smooth. So hoping for a nice match of Hearthstone here, Raven. Uh, to finish off our quarterfinals. Me too, me too. And we've got some great players as well. We've got Bunny Hopper versus Insane coming up. And I think both of these players uh, showed throughout the course of this weekend so far that they are in a tip top shape when it comes to Hearthstone. I think Bunny especially impressing a lot of viewers, which is kind of funny because you know, we know Bunny Hopper is very, very, very good at the game. Uh, but I think just maybe because we've not seen a tournament for a while, it's nice to see that, oh, you know, first tournament major of the year Bunny Hopper yet yeah, still looking strong still looking in form uh, I don't know if I've ever seen an out of form Bunny Hopper to be quite honest even when Bunny Hopper was <laughs> split even more ways than <laughs> a, a, a tiny human baby I don't know what's more difficult that or uh, PhD or Hearthstone but, or a baby uh, no no when he when he was like in the thick of it for right, his PhD. Okay, okay. Um, I don't know. I don't know which one's harder. I, I only have experience in one of those. And spoiler <laughs> alert, it's <laughs> I'm not nowhere close. I was just to a PhD worried that we were in gonna, anything. I was we were going to get a conversation of what's harder to deal with: a baby human or playing Hearthstone? Because I was about to step well away from this conversation. Uh, it's it, it's <laughs> playing Hearthstone for sure. Babies are surprisingly resilient. Oh, well, that, there you go. You heard it from someone who knows. Uh, but yeah, check it out. <laughs> yeah. um, Insane's list as well. Again, I think both players have played really well over the course of this weekend. We are going to be seeing the Priest. And we have a, a double Demon Hunter ban. Uh, only one of these players has Warrior. Have you, have you made a decision uh, this weekend as to whether you like the no Warrior approach or whether you think the Warrior uh, approach for this tournament is uh, the best option? I think Warrior Approach is the best option. Um, I think Demon Hunter Warrior Priest <clears throat> is the core, right? Right. And then the and then the fourth deck is like debatable. Um, Death Knight go. It's Death Knight sure. It's my preference. Shaman, anyway. Shaman sure. Warlock. Uh, that's half. That's half of a sure. <laughs> yeah. uh, I would give it. So. You know, there's pros and cons to each, depending on what your strategy is, what you're teching for across your other decks. But if I if I was like building a lineup for this tournament, I would say that uh, Warrior Priest uh, Demon Hunter would be mm -hmm. my core. You go uh, for like the, the standard good stuff, basically. Yeah, the the standard good stuff, yeah. which I feel like is this meta game is all about the standard mm -hmm. good stuff. Yeah, um, I, and I, I, I think the results are are showing that at least to. Uh, a certain extent. I think the priest deck is I want overperforming was the first word that came to my mind, but I w I don't even know if it, if you could call it overperforming. I just think it's a sol it's a good deck. Well, uh and you could uh, build it in so many different ways. Yeah, I do find it fascinating when these players prepare for a tournament and a deck like Warrior exists because it's extremely strong. We all know it's very strong, but you also know that everyone's going to expect you to bring it. And then is that a weakness of itself, you know, enough to not bring it right? It's always been a tricky conversation because we've seen players do well that are kind of at least soft targeting Warrior, let's say. So, yeah, always something you do have to think about when building these lineups. But we are uh, off to our start of this series. Bunny Hopper on the top and the Warrior already being able to drop down the pig. And uh, Insane on their TJ's favorite deck ever in Hearthstone. Currently. <laughs> Currently, it's my favorite, favorite deck, deck ever. ever because it's the deck I'm yeah. playing. <laughs> it's the deck I'm playing the most by far. Yeah, already interesting decisions from Insane um, in terms of uh, plays in the early game. Obviously, he can go for like highest tempo, something that challenges the rock star uh, by going for the gift wrap. Well, um, but with scale replica in hand, knowing that you're you're going to have the Zarimi, right? Mm. I, just trying to collect as many uh, uh, dragons as possible to be able to play Zerimi as early as possible, I think makes sense. So coining out the Whelp Wrangler 
means that it has the highest chance of living and getting you uh, multiple happy whelps. Right. Is are already on track uh, oh. for this for this uh, Zarimi, maybe maybe not on curve, but uh, close to it, right? I was going to ask you: Is that is the sort of let's say level one plan as the priest in this matchup to just go dragon, 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 Zarimi? Hope they didn't remove loads of your board and gain loads of armor. Is that is that like level one of just what you want to try and achieve here, or is there more sort of? reliable longer term strategies in this matchup let's say yeah it's max tempo every turn yeah you just got it's kind right. of like just saying go all in straight away and hope yeah max tempo okay. while keeping two things in mind one if you know if you have a zarimi or know you're going to have zarimi dragons right make sure that you have the dragon yeah. count to be able to play zarimi when you want two is player is certain removal playing around certain removal right um, chip, chipping off armor if you think that uh, sanitize is is in the hand and, and going to be played. Mm -hmm. uh, making sure that you have enough health on board to make it awkward for Bell and Flames if you see a Forge come out. Um, keeping the health totals different for Bladestorm, uh, which Insane has done here. The Bladestorm would stop short and at least leave the Wolf Wrangler on board. Um, but outside of those things, max tempo. Mm -hmm. And then if things go wrong... That's when you say, okay, I'm going to rely on my bailout cards, uh, right. which is Amanthul, Um And Insane has, I'm pretty sure Insane has the, uh... no, Insane is just playing the, the, the Leroy in the top end. Amanthul is the only weird one. No Hearthstone Brew. Right, yeah, no stomper in this. It's one. the it's the double speaker stomper is the tech uh, yeah. for insane in this priest list, which also has it's more like, okay, I need to win with my tempo. Uh whereas Hearthstone Brew's like, okay, well, I have this really weird possible backup plan. Right. Um It's one so, of those cards, isn't it, right? Where you can choose to say, with this one card, I can just yoink a certain amount of games, <laughs> right? It's like the plan. Yeah. One other okay. thing with this matchup is mm -hmm. um, to go against the max tempo theory, right? Is to you, you want your uh, gift wrap well buffs to hit Zarimi ideally, or maximum chance to, because that's guaranteed damage when you take an extra turn. Right. Whereas getting those buffs on on smaller minions that you're playing in tempo, they could get removed, and it's not guaranteed. Um, so you 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 have more damage on on that second turn if you get the buffs on on Zerimi. it's that's not always the case right if you're playing against a board based matchup you're going to want max mm. stats um but in this matchup in particular i like having those buffs on Zerimi. so i think it's a really good point because it's something you can consciously try and control right it's not just you, the buffs don't just fly around it's like you can actually try and control of when you play and what you're playing and like what you're actually having in hand at the time so yeah i think that's a, a really good point to to make honestly and uh, meanwhile yeah. on the top side of the board uh, bunny hopper he's just kind of doing what you do right thinking about right is this aftershock just worth coming out now clear it up and move on or can he be a little bit greedy and get the acolyte down potentially Ah, uh, if you play the Acolyte now, then you don't have access to the Aftershock for next turn, uh, which right. is the biggest uh, the biggest issue. It, um, it's tricky, though, right? Because you have that weird scenario. I do think Aftershock is correct, of course, because the board needs to be cleared. But Bunny, yeah. because of the cards played, Bunny kind of just knows that there's just going to be a refill <laughs> straight away, right? So it's that thing yeah. where it's like, well, I'll play the Aftershock to help now. I'm still in trouble next turn. It's like me. I just sort of did not think about my problems for a while and hope they yeah. go away. Yeah, I guess he would have had access to the Aftershock next turn, but it would have been the whole turn. Yeah, um, it would have been full cost. And, yeah, so there's no... And, you know, there's been enough one-drops played at this point in the game to where Drifters are a possibility. Then what do you do? You have an Acolyte Pain, Acolyte of Pain fighting against a 4-6 and an Aftershock that costs 5. <laughs> Yeah. That can chip away three health of it. You're going to take that damage anyway. So I like the, how this is. All right, now we're going to get to see... This This is, I suppose, one of the tougher turns. Um, Pip, and then the the one drop after it. I'm guessing... Okay, Max Temple with the Gift Wrap. Well, we have another one. 
it's a happy well not what you want to see but this is insane having access to multiple boards in a row of uh of refill yeah and for bunny hopper it's, it doesn't look like the best draw in the world but like razor fen plus totem hero power is not the worst turn i've ever seen uh, facing down this helps with the card draw gains a good chunk of armor as well to be a little bit defensive wasn't a bad draw Yeah, I'm worried about. I, I guess the totem still does draw a card, but I'm worried about there just being no removal <laughs> whatsoever currently. Well, that's why uh, I kind of hand. like the uh, that option. I I I guess you could uh, go acolyte totem instead. Uh, I like acolyte just saying, totem. I just, think just absolute giga card draw and say right, I will get to the answers now. That's definitely a benefit. Uh, and again, the good thing about the uh, razor fen is it costs one. You can easily work that into pretty much any turn where you're going to gain armor. Now, is this just uh, the setup? Is this just kind of go up, like dump everything on board and then go for Zerimi next turn? Because there's also the Celestial now, so that gift wrap can get duped. Yeah. Which seems quite good. It does have skill to reload, but I'm not sure what dragons are even left to pick up. Um, I know there was a bunch copied uh, by the pip. And the Chirurgeon was copied by the Pip, I believe, I think too. so, because it's golden. Right? That's how I'm yeah. choosing to track everything here. The golden dragons are the ones that were copied by Pip. So because Scale of... Replica is just uh, a Chirurgeon at this point, if I'm not mistaken. Um, but it's just going to leave the Acolyte as is. Insane knows that it's going to draw a card. You know, there's no reason to even acknowledge its existence. Yeah, yeah. Is uh, at this point, right to Insane's plan right now. <laughs> yeah, and so it does have the Zerimi plus Leroy combo, but um, it's not going to be enough damage unless, like, this whole board, like the only things that are removed from this board are the low attack things. Yeah, there's what funny Hopper in it on board right now for insane just if nothing's touched yeah. you know nothing's removed there's i think it's 15 there so um there's also an interesting point where like if the board's left then there's no space right because nothing could currently trade itself away yeah and i bunny hopper's got to be thinking about that right it, yeah like if you leave this board as is you could just not play it it's going to be tough to not play the stone skin armor, which the Chirurgeon could trade into. Um, but Hammer is a decent pick. Uh, actually, no, there's not really any great targets to attack into. Um, yeah, if you attack into the 1-4, then it means it can trade itself off into the Acolyte. It can trade in. If you just face yeah. tank the 3-5 for fun, then yeah. sure, I guess. But yeah, here we go. Yeah, No trading Heads away up now. play. Yeah. And do you so, think this was w w would you ever call this a mistake from insane or is this just a back and forth between the two good players doing and they're both doing the right thing i think i would say they're both doing the right thing i don't okay. think you can hold back pressure like this because the it, the longer bunny hopper just sits there and does nothing insane's still pushing a lot of damage each and every turn it's not the strongest 100%. board but it's not it's not weak um, yeah. I think the thing like, I was Bunny Hopper at was would have like... to gain 10 plus armor a turn to just stay even. And eventually yeah. these things are going to have to get traded into or dealt with. Um, and so I think Insane's just happy to say, um, let's just keep this going as it is. You're just sure. giving me free damage at this point. From Bunny Hopper's perspective, it's the right thing because there was really no way to answer this board. Could have, like, playing the Stone Skin Armor was actively detrimental because. You, you could have died with multiple things being able to trade into it uh, because you could have straight traded the Sturgeon and you could have traded the gift wrap well. So you push all yep. the damage face 
on the following turn, you trade over the Sturge and the Gift Wrap Whelp. That leaves room uh, for uh, Zarimi and Leroy. Or the Sturge in first, mm -hmm. and that's Zarimi. I... The very next turn, you trade in the Whelp. That's the Leroy, and that's game yeah, over. Yeah, I think the only thing that made me ask, honestly, was the, you know, the 1-4 taunt on board? Because, like, it's pushing one a turn, and that could have been a, a space, right? Potentially. But yeah, it's. Uh, I, I do overall. I completely agree that you've just got to pressure, and if your opponent sort of passes, great. You know, Bunny's got to dig himself out of this, and uh, there's arm again. But the blade storm, like you mentioned way back when at the start of the game about how Priest plays this, you put a lot of different health targets on board, and we can see there's a one, a two, a three, a four. But even if that goes through, there is actually still the six on board, which is very nice. You can click with the weapon swing though, right? Sorry, the one's gonna stop. Sorry, I'm oh, me. Yes. I've got Defile Brain on. <sighs> I love this. Once Ooh. again, no yep. nothing to trade into. Oh. But once again, <laughs> the, 15 the, damage. The problem, so it, it feels so close, right? Because I completely agree. On one hand, yes, of course, Insane gets to push damage every turn without basically being stopped. But the only problem is the longer Bunny Hopper can survive this, I mean, there's 11 cards left in the deck. Like, he's getting close to, I mean, is Reno active next turn? Uh, if not. Uh, sanitize. Ah, sanitize. Okay. Uh, cause I was gonna say, but if you also, draw sanitize, you, yeah, I mean, you, you can. All bets are off. You can clear right? the board. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. That, that's what I was getting to, right? It's like, yes. It's good for insane because he gets free pushes every turn, but because he can't finish the game, Bunny Hopper's getting closer to the AoE to clear the board, and then suddenly it's another question of building a board and then going for the Zarimi again. Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, two good players playing Hearthstone kind of sums this up so far. Yep. Oh. None oh, of this helps. Yeah, I was gonna. I, I literally just eyed every single card. I'm like, right. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Well, the verse rift changes nothing from last turn because there was already yeah, a verse yeah. rift. Um. So bunny hopper, this might have to be just like max armor gain turn with no, nope. the rock star safety goggles, armor up. Sure. Star safety goggles. For a second, I will, because I, I'll be honest, I kind of couldn't see the the rays of Fenning Hand, but uh, I was even looking at right, is this like safety goggles Reno just for the armor at this point? <laughs> because, it, like you said, if you draw sanitize, you could clear the board anyway, so then the Reno doesn't quite do as, as impactful a job. But yeah, the rock star does uh, makes a bit of a better job of the gaining of armor, of course. Wait, no rock star. Okay. They could get traded into. Yeah, true, true. There's no way for him to kill it off again, right? Like he did last turn. Yeah. Yeah, bunny up, I think, just a flick of the hand there. He's like, well, yeah, there's nothing else I can really do. That's the max armor that Bunny Hopper can gain without playing safety goggles and without mm -hmm. um, uh, playing a minion, right? It's just yeah. playing the one verse rip, putting it in the pool for the second verse rip. If Bunny Hopper can get the finale yeah. on it, be because timing wise, this is likely to be the time when uh, everything yeah. has to be played right, like maximum defense has to come out. And again, yeah. nine cards left, and the sanitizer in there. <laughs> Ugh. Yeah. No tradable, no nothing to help dig. Yeah. So Bladestorm will remove more this time around. Um, because Insane did decide to uh heal up the Surgeon instead of the Happy Whelp. So Bunny Hopper could deal with the Happy Whelp with the weapon, then Bladestorm and take four damage off the board. And Bladestorm again. Um uh, yeah, but then you Bladestorm again, your Bladestorming just to take another four damage off the board, right? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, right now that sounds okay, in. doesn't it? <laughs> yeah. 
Sure. I wonder if you start with safety goggles just before you attack to, to gain max armor, but from Bunny Hopper's perspective, if he does that, he just dies, I, I feel, because you're still leaving six on board. You're not going to be that high life total, and you're thinking that there's thirsty drifters hanging around all over the place. Oh, okay. Uh, one more time. <laughs> yeah, one more because he, he, one he knows more he's, time. Not, he, he's not dead, right? Yeah. And it's re equipping the hammer just to spend the mana. That's uh, <laughs> efficient. I like it. <laughs> yeah. It's going to be at three health at the end of this, though. This is. Uh... Okay, so if it's sanitized off the top, you could. Uh, Razor Fen, Reno, Verse Rift, and it'll recast the other Verse Rift, and then you attack, and you get a ton of. Oh no! <laughs> Eight cards, two of them are sanitizes. Oh, yikes! <sighs> Held on for as many turns as possible, but we're just in the same problem, right? Except less health. That's the issue Bunny's got. Every single turn, the problem is. Uh... It is just no sanitize, which means the same problem, but less health is just a disaster. Insane's going to be able to clean this up, I think. Because there's goggles, there's the blade storm options, but as we've keep men like, kept mentioning throughout the whole game, and what this game's really revolved around is kill anything, Zarimi comes out, you giga dead, right? Like, that's just how it works. It's also the, just the same level of removal. There's not additional removal tools being generated either. 8, 11. Reno. So it's that's 16. At yeah, I was going to say that's the magic number right now. It's just insane. Just can't even spend to get the, <laughs> uh, the power cords. Oh my god. What a game uh... of Hearthstone. I love it. What a game. <laughs> Insane's got a full hand, though, so no Thirsty Drifters can come out, so the damage is limited to just the Zarimi plus the Leroy next turn as well. The Zarimi Missed plus whatever again. stats you play. Yep. Oh, bottom and that... seven. Yep. <clears throat> That's it. Yeah, because that, that is the armor hero power, but last time I checked, right, the armor hero power wasn't 100 armor, so yeah, that's going to be it. Insane way <laughs> to... Yes, that <laughs> is the response. He's like, I just uh, made uh, a board and, and s s put them to face every single turn, I, I guess. That's the game of Hearthstone. <laughs> but it's just funny yeah, because, that's... like, that, that was actually a pretty high-level game of Hearthstone, but in the simplest of ways. It sounds really stupid, but it's true. It, it was, yeah. Uh, from Insane's perspective, you know, Insane, like you said, Insane just built a board and then <laughs> eventually killed Bunny. Like, that's it. Um, from Bunny's perspective, it, everything was super complicated. He needed to gain as much armor as possible per turn without allowing a single minion from Insane or on his side to survive. So Insane couldn't trade in and get that extra turn uh, with the Zarimi to push for lethal. And if the Sanitize had come out, Bunny Hopper had the ability to gain a, a ton of armor and swing the board, whether that was through Reno before it was played, or even in this turn, it would have been Forge the Sanitize, uh, Razor Fen. Um, there was Hero Power. Play the Sanitize, start. and then Verse Riff, and then a Swing, and that's what, 50? 15 or 16 armor gain 15 armor gain just from mm -hmm. that alone yeah uh and maybe that's enough uh to to end the game or uh, for for you to survive through zarimi if there was no thirsty drifters which at that point you just have to hope there's no not too much power that insane could play with the zarimi to push that damage which was pretty unlikely but it was bunny's only chance yeah so it pl played as well as he could have given the information, and now Bunny's okay. <laughs> Enough of this. Right, My this, turn. <laughs> this time, now insane, you have to let me just build a board and then swing every single turn to win. <laughs> Those are the rules. Is there Bunny playing anything different? Uh, is there what sort of variations are outside of there? Uh, we won't talk about Habu Gabu's build, for example, but 
uh, for so for like the main builds, is there a lot of variation in these Zarimi priests? Like generally speaking, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's a core of the deck that's always there, um, but the tech cards that we're seeing, Bunny has the Glacial Shards and one Speaker Stomper, right? Uh, in the in the priest deck, um, so uh, you know that's Glacial Shard, a lot of great uses, but I feel like the main one um, is well. A couple of main ones but i would say it's demon hunter just because it's so uh po popular of a choice and mm -hmm. uh delaying the um uh, umbral umbral grass I, I can never remember the umpires. weapons umpire's grass yeah there you go it's a mitt uh for more turns allows you to keep tempo higher but it looks like with bunny's strategy be with the banned demon hunter it's got to be focused at shaman to uh, block the potential for drive insect I mean, there's so many classes that utilize powerful weapons in some sense. And Glacial Shard also has the flexibility of just being a good tempo card in board-based matchups to be able to freeze something that could potentially trade over your minions. So, um, and one Speaker Stomper, no Leroy, Bunny Priest deck. So that allows you to have that extra burst uh, in the uh, Zerimi extra turn, yeah. uh, which is nice. Uh, Times be dead in hand for quite a while, especially if you have, if you don't have enough dragons to complete Zerimi, and you have both, and you have two dead cards, and you get awkward. Um, Hearthstone Brew is the greedier end. Neither player had Hearthstone Brew uh, in their list, and then Razor Scale has popped up in a couple because it is a dragon and it is sort of a, a, a disruption effect. It's also very good against um, Shaman, uh, a lot like alongside Speaker Sopper, and You can guarantee that mm -hmm. it, that you can. Almost guaranteed they can have it because of the scale replicas in the deck. So, a lot of variation. But only and in so tech cards, have... really. Yeah. And then just look at this matchup overall as we are getting going. Bunny Hopper does have access to uh, a few dragons and also got that funnel cake for uh, as and when ready. But then, um, how does this matchup typically play out? Um, does the Shaman just get access to enough AoE or are the potential priest boards a little bit too big to clear off with like, the sort of lower damage AoE Shamans are uh, uh, kind of specialized in doing at the moment? I mean, it all de depends on how it lines up, right? Um, if, if you're not getting the tempo tools early on uh, as the Shaman, if you're not getting just things that can fight for the board early, you're going to be in a lot of trouble because you may not have the luxury to wait until like a natural crash lightning on turn five right. um, to swing the game. So uh, it's an arms race of a matchup, mm. basically, well, where the shaman is trying to n stifle the early board so it doesn't get out of control uh, while also trying to piece together um, enough damage slash resources to, to go for the big plays uh, at the same time. So. Well, and Saints managed to do that okay right now with Flowrider and the uh, Salesman. You know, it puts something early on the board, right, as you mentioned, to be able to start to fight back, uh, which is not too bad so far. Nice three health uh, well player, though, for Bunny Hopper is going to be a little bit annoying to deal with. Like, does this warrant a double trade? Is this just pass and then try and lightning bolt maybe next turn uh, with some trades? It's uh, really tricky, but no. Insane's going to respect it and say, you know what, I can remove one minion now, as opposed to waiting and hoping I can remove more minions going forward. You can't let anything get out of control. That's a problem. You also don't want to overload on on uh, potential key uh, breakpoint turns uh, for mana. But Insane with this hand is not really playing towards anything in particular. Um, Flash of Lightning can be really big. Uh, even just as like a defensive tool, not as like a combo setup, yeah. like we're traditionally used to seeing it. I mean, in, traditionally, this deck's been around for a while against all board-based matchups. The Flash of Lightning can just be used to uh, try and set up for a swing turn on the following turn. Um, yeah, it's more, I need something big to happen now, as opposed to, oh. this is my OTK. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Bunny Hopper really didn't want to spend two mana to just go scale replica here. Um, yeah. So just goes projectionist and a non-active gift wrap. Well, and then next turn can follow it up with if the sport sticks, scale replica, funnel cake, and then be able to play uh, some additional things that turn to just keep the tempo up. Mm.
And that might have been signaled by the double trade, right? If Insane felt, or it, it seemed like Insane had to commit two minions just to kill the one Torn. It's like, oh, well, it might be struggling, so I'll just uh, go a little bit heavier on the old minions that turn instead. And there is a little bit of removal yep. here, though, for Insane. Just get to uh, try and keep up on board, at least. Yeah. It's just Replica Cord, maybe? You could go Replica... Funnel cake, play the um the the one one drop uh dragon that you pick up and then dream boat. I think that's max stats. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. I think I get too locked in to trying to, you know, like oh wait, we could finale the power cord this turn. Do it at all costs, right? As opposed to looking for alternate plays oh, I that mean, might actually equal more power. Yeah, uh, Sometimes that's good because going for the uh, power cord this turn means that you still get to preserve all this power on board, and that makes your turn five even stronger. And it also, with this hand, Bunny needs more dragons. Right. Scale replica guarantees the Zarimi, but you need more dragons. So I, I think I like this play better just because number of dragons is really a concern right now for <laughs> yeah. Bunny because you don't want to wait forever to play the Zarimi or your the Shamash is going to have infinite time. Well, that's the thing, right? The, uh, something that's common in all these matchups against the Shaman is that you cannot just let them chill. Because after that, they will make you explode. So, yeah, we'll yeah. see how this one goes. Yeah, though the uh, Fizzle not really going to achieve too much, apart from maybe a weird tempo play in and of itself. Needle Rock Totem, though, not too bad. And there's that other Flash now been picked up. Ooh, and some Spirit Claws as well. Got some uh, a lot of defensive options, or I guess uh, the options are actually burst options, but can be used in a defensive way for insane next turn. Yeah, but there be some dragons, TJ. Yeah, that's and I believe that's the um, the final dragon needed to activate Zarimi that's picked up with the surgeon. Um, so and Gifrap Welp being at four now at five. Oh. oh. <clears throat> Oh, didn't even need the surgeon. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Chirurgeon. Because yeah. there was the uh, the taunt as well, wasn't there? Yeah. I don't know if we counted that. The happy whelp. That was the one that I was missing. Yeah. Yep. So what's that? 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 19. 18. Is that one off? Uh. Oh, no. 18. Is it? Sorry. So it is one off because the power cord synchronized can can go plus one. Give, right? yeah. give plus one, yeah. So is this just chuck it all in, right? Because that conveniently leads to exactly six mana. <laughs> If you want max max power, you go Dreamboat, synchronized Dreamboat. Oh, well, yep. Bunny wants max max power. Yeah, and just making it enough because that's as possible. the thing. That, that's how you can be resilient versus the Shaman, right? Is you sort of survive the potential AOE response by just having a seven and eight health minion on board. Okay, well, hold on. Yeah, I know. Bunny <laughs> just kind of sits, sits back. Okay, there's aftershocks. Okay, no lightning bolt. Okay, it's just going for the win, I suppose. Another flash. That's not damage. That could be damage, but it's one mana for damage. Um. a lot of spell damage though. Crash. Oh, lightning storm. storm. Can still get down the uh, zapper, still get down Thanos, and still has additional sort of lightning bolts to help out deal the extra big damage here. To clear off that. 
This is a clear. Yeah, that is yeah. a clear, right? I was going to say, I'm just trying to quickly add it up. But yeah, I think that should be a clear. And I don't think he has to use the Thanos, right? Uh, wouldn't have the mana to use the Thanos, I don't think. Connectivity. Connectivity snake. Okay, connectivity lightning bolt. Yeah, it's got to be lightning bolt. Wow. Yeah, Insane's going to be feeling pretty good about that turn, <laughs> honestly, because he had to make something happen there and then, because if not, he was very dead. Still got a yeah, flash. And in hand, still got options as well. Completely overloaded, <laughs> but, but still. And a lot of damage is gone uh, from Insane. There's no drive. But Priest, unless it's one plug on duel, there's really not much. And Amphibious Elixir is fantastic uh, to be able it to craft. Spirit Claws this turn, right? Uh, but spirit claws would have been okay, honestly. Would have put him down to eight, and then Leroy picked up off the top would have been lethal. Oh, there's no Leroy in Bunny's list. I was gonna say, say I was I just double checked. I was just like, hang on a minute. Yeah, I thought Bunny no Leroy. wasn't playing Leroy yeah. here. <laughs> yeah, maybe maybe Spirit Claws is correct there. Just to help I stop made... the, the shenanigans with the dragons. Obviously they ended up using a lightning bolt on that regardless, but um yeah, just I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Maybe the spell options were gonna end up being better, insane thought about something I didn't, which is uh, very valid, of course. Yeah. Ooh. Goganeth. Okay. Well, so there. That's a draw. <laughs> yeah. Are you just killing the Ziliax? You're just killing the Ziliax. I think. Yeah, just, empty board, right? Because Zarini's gone. Yeah. You, you don't yeah. have to worry about that. So there's no surprises coming out from Bunny Hopper now, uh, apart from, you know, arguably uh, Amonthal. So there's no surprise yeah. shenanigans going to happen. Play the board, keep it clear. And I think from there. Insane's got all the, the stuff in the world left still. I mean, there's picking up a crash as well. There's Geomancer to help out. Spirit Claws are still there as well. I think Insane's in a fantastic spot. Now he's able to clear that, hold off the Zerimi push, and now just don't. Especially the thing I struggle with the most, just don't mess it up. Okay, couple draws here for Bunny. Yeah, options, options, options. You clergy heal and then pick up the second clergy funnel cake. And easy you're cooking. Oh yeah, easy peasy. You do that kind of play in your sleep, don't you, TJ? <clears throat> yep. It's clergy every time. And it's not. Bunny really has a choice. I guess the consideration was: is it just pass and? Gain oh. more cards to like try and do better next turn, but oh, I told you it's clergy always clergy every time. <laughs> the only uh, the thought process there for Bunny was okay, is Amanthul my only out right now? Um, hmm. because then it would have been clergy plus funnel cake if Bunny thought that there was a chance. Oh, to, to just rip it and then go, sort of thing, yeah. yeah. And get a draw to see the mana first. Ooh. Oh, Speaker Stomper, Thirsty Drifter. I mean, oh, holds held. back the Thirsty Drifter. <laughs> T Jake's getting more and more shocked by every minute. Ah, uh, because the AOE is still there. Okay. Usually, when you pass over a, a, a Golganath, the it's the AOE that's been used. Yeah. But just an AOE plus a crash would have been enough. Uh, to clear off even the Thirsty mm. Drifter. So wants some type of reload on the backswing of this. Nice fizzle there as well, because that is that hand is kind of ticking all the boxes, right? There's AoE, there's damage, and there's heal. Yeah. All right, and it, it's got to be Amadou right now. Because the AoE is still preserved on the uh, Golganeth. I decided to go for the... There's no dragons left. 
Is there any dragons left? Oh, there's a Chirurgeon. Okay. There's always a Chirurgeon. Always. <laughs> oh my gosh. <laughs> and there's the AoE. Just all that discover, all those options and the fizzles in the hand. Uh, in, in the deck, sorry. This is a lot of damage. <laughs> He's going to hold the crash, it looks like, though, and just go max board presence. Yeah, I like it, right? Because then crash, even if Amathil yeah. comes down, it's yeah. it can only take off a couple a couple points of damage. So, I mean, this should wrap things up for Insane, because I think this is a lethal setup even through oh. Amathil. <laughs> it actually was Amathil as well. There's only eight cards left in the deck. Well, tell that, to the, uh, tell that to the Sanitize last game, TJ. <laughs> yeah, it's got to be random, li random lifesteal minion. Uh, Mom Pa has the most health? Yeah. Taunt on the Toy Captain, though. Well, it's getting taunt no matter what. Oh, sorry. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Oh, no, that wasn't... Uh, sorry, you don't get to pick. It's a random six drop. I was getting mixed up. That was the legendary choice. I was so, definitely yeah, toy also captain. getting the, that mixed the, up as well. <laughs> yeah, the the battle cry. All right, we and there's both the snapshot. got razzle dazzled, but yeah, that is going to be enough. Another tough one there for Bunny is insane. Takes a, a two zero lead again. Just being able to stabilize there, I think, was so huge. Like the huge push from Bunny, but being what one damage off lethal was it with the one buff? damage uh, yeah so oh so so close but we know what shaman's like we've seen enough of it overall uh, how flexible it can be with those spell discovers and the mixture yep. of aoe damage and healing all being available in the in the shaman sort of spell pool and makes it very very strong in that kind of recovery state so yeah real tough one for bunny hopper but insane kept his cool i managed to stabilize and take the victory so uh really uh really good start there for insane now just one win away from making it to the semi-finals yeah there's one thing i've learned about bunny hopper though is that he just refuses to lose games of hearthstone <laughs> uh the the correct play is through and through even when it, it's looking like a dire situation and yeah. only dips out of a game if it's a hundred percent lost 99.9 .9 lost nope he's playing for that point one percent so uh, hoping for a little bit of a closer series here, but insane looking fantastic uh, with being uh, 2 0 up currently. Yeah, 100%. And now uh, I think Insane's just got the uh, the pain lock left, I believe, as the last deck. So another uh, pretty aggressive one. And one we've seen. Uh... We've seen the highs and we've seen the lows, TJ. <laughs> so far, I feel like so. I feel like it's been mostly lows, but uh, but the highs are really good, so it's fine. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Regardless, they're they're quick games. Yeah. Okay. All right, all right, all right. Yeah, I that's mean, the, uh, that's a three key, but that's looking like a three key to me. It's already a better hand than we've seen in like ninety percent of post Mulligan hands from, from these yeah. warlocks. Yeah, I'm taking this. And Tane's like, yep, yep. Uh, this is good. Look, if good the enough. game's telling me, then the game's telling me. Yep. I, I feel like Flame Imp um, and oh, the Imprisoned Rook. Horror are the two. Oh my gosh! <laughs> oh my gosh! <laughs> it's over. This is one this of is the good ones. Series. Wrap it up. <laughs> Spirit Claws coming out for Bunny Hopper is good, of course. Just get that equal. <laughs> Sorry, um, get that equipped to be, you know, potentially be able to fight back against some of these minions. But yeah, this and, is uh, so disgusting. All right, Bunny saw a three key, right? Saw the three. He key. knows. Yeah. 
and a flaming plate off the top. I'm flashing lightning here 100%. every time. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. Every time. You coining out the uh, the book as well? <sighs> I wouldn't hate it, because I think you just don't want to take damage at all. No, I'm saving the coin for next turn. You need a pop, you need a pop off turn next turn. I'm okay, saving okay, it. Okay. And you need to block the damage of whatever, whatever comes next. Rook. This Rook. all comes down Rook. to like... Rook. Rook. <laughs> This all comes down to what Bunny can pick up like from these elixirs and what Bunny yep. can pick up off the top. This all comes down to being able to piece together forms of removal. I mean, it's possible that Insane even says, you know what? I'm not even going to go all in into this. Uh, um, oh, you have to, right? Surely. You can't space it out one turn. Just to avoid the flash. Like the the, the, the problem is if, a flash swing turn. if you space it out, are you not just making it easier for Bunny to like dismantle you over multiple turns? Don't you just have to go all in and say they're not going to clear? It's Hearthstone, Raven. You don't have to do anything. Yes, you have to go face. You have to go all in, and it's you have a beautiful to part of this game is, is creative expression. What about one horror? I could meet you in the middle at one. I, I am a fair person, okay? I could meet you in the middle at one. Zero? I'm okay, good. I was gonna have to report insane then. But uh, yeah, one I'm, okay. I can accept, yes. Because because yeah. also this opens up horror uh and projectionist next turn, right? Which without that projectionist, I think there's not a good enough argument to hold, but with it, I'm with you. Yeah. Another oh. pop book. Wait, what? Oh, did you want the uh, gift into storm? Yeah, Maybe? gift into storm was a full clear. Oh, with yeah, lightning you, bolt pop up book. Yeah. You, you you lightning bolt pop up book and then storm. You're not wrong. Are we missing something? It wanted to draw. That would have been the entire turn. It would have been overloaded a ton. Mm. Actually, oh, not a, not a ton. Yeah, just it's just storm, right? Would have been the overload. And lightning bolt. Oh yeah, would have needed a lightning bolt. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. you're completely right. Yeah. Gonna just try and stall it out with the pop-up books, I guess. I mean, that is a lot of taunts. Uh, Bunny Humper really wanted the draw. Mm. Ooh. Or wanted to hold on to the lightning bolt for burn. <laughs> yeah, I doubt this tree ends. Because sometimes down you look turn. up and you're like, my I, my point at six. <laughs> yeah. I mean, there was was it? I don't know if it was Friday or yesterday, but there was like an opening from a like I think turn one or two from a warlock where I was like. The Shaman should start counting lethal, and it was like the Shaman's first turn of the game. Because I think they opened with like everything, like double Trient and everything. Yeah, there you go. Oh, they are going Trient as well. I'd say just played the Trient. Is that necessary? I, I, don't, I don't know. I don't think so. I guess it's it's something small that can take a totem, a totem, a taunt, right? Is that the reason? Insane just says all in... This 2-2 two, two kills one of the taunts, so that I get to push more damage and then speak a stomp of the turn after. So this is what? Let's... It's just 20, right? So it's... Let's just say everything lives, which is unlikely, but let's just pretend. It's 20 damage uh, to it... face if everything lives and then speak a stomp a go. But some of it's going to die, so you... Mm. So, it... uh, Bunny Hopper can set up for a lot of outs for lethal here just by going cobalt geomancer overdraft face lightning bolt face and then swing with the spear claws that's nine damage that is very okay can still do that oh and this is a guaranteed lethal setup yeah just do do the swing and then do the rest of it next turn no but but speaker stomper blocks it One cost for fracking as well. Maybe there's better options. 
Because if he if he if Bunny Hopper just goes overdraft there and Lightning Bolt face, that's six damage. Puts him to three. Yeah, gonna trade this away to play the Molten Giant that picked up and the Stomper, of course. Gotta make sure there's enough board space. It's cost two more, so Lightning Bolt is gonna cost three. Ne Surely you kill the spell. Yeah, 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 you have to. And then insane hands up and just say, okay, I'm on nine health. Zapper? It's not enough, right? The Speaker Stomper. I got. I gotta be missing something. I gotta be missing something. Yeah, I'm sure. Hang on, let me see if there's a message from Saul. Oh wait. Oh no! This time TJ is right. Screenshot that TJ. Oh yeah, and that's a good point. Gift isn't nature, so it, so it will cost mana. Earlier on, when we were talking about the the gift turn. Yep, that looks like it's only seven. And that's not going to be enough, just like that. TJ and insane, can't believe it. That is the kind of victory you want. It was tough. It was a lot tougher than the score may look, but. Insane takes it 3 0 and Bunny Hopper's knocked out. Insane moves on to the semi finals. What a match, TJ. Because again, even though it was 3 0, there were some extremely close games. That one we just saw, the uh, the priest where Bunny Hopper was one off lethal and then Insane managed to hold on. Uh, what a series. That was. It, it felt like a back and forth series. But it really wasn't. Like, Bunny Hopper was just on the ropes, like, for two of those games and yeah. couldn't find ways out. The previous game was Bunny Hopper just playing Priest how you're supposed to play Priest, being a damage off lethal, and then Insane having an insane comeback, uh, finding the board clear with the two giant dream boats, which was very, uh, very clutch. And this game, again, you have so little margin for error in the matchup. On both um, sides, though, right? Because we both saw sides. how close. Because that tree end was played. It took. It ended up trading itself away to a minion that didn't do anything. So that tree end actually kind of achieved nothing, and it could have led insane to destruction. Yeah, that like the the tree in play. Sure, and like you know, you have a two damage bumper for. Uh, the pop-up book frogs, but holy moly, um, <laughs> if Bunny Hopper, I, I got to know what what's going through his mind on that last turn. Um, when when it's when it's Bunny Hopper, um, like if I was watching like, you know, myself or like Lorinda play, I'd be like, all right, there's nothing else. That was just the wrong play. With Bunny, had to be there's a something. reason to not go to not go for the lethal setup. After this, so I understand with the um, like the geomancer being played to try and set up lethal that way, but after the to the spell power totem is rolled, not going for over the play to set um, insane to, to three, and then having mm -hmm. spell damage plus the spirit claw swing in, in hand, hand, yeah, 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 that's yeah. that's protected against speaker stomper, um, is tough. I mean, there's obviously ways that. Uh, insane would have been able to play around it uh, with the pop pop guard had five mana. Just could yeah. have pop guard, yeah. pop guard sludge, right? And that would have healed healed out of range. But then wouldn't have been able to speaker stomper, and then there was still there was still could have been burnouts yeah. um, for uh, for bunny at the end there too. So again, tight margins and <laughs> it's uh, like I do not have. <laughs> enough confidence in my play to to jam that tree in that spot and just go to that, that was that was with right. with with at least two turns uh, before i have lethal right not a, no lethal yeah. setup it's two turns before i have lethal Whew. yeah really really close series overall we have now got our four players for our semi-finals we're going to go to a quick break while we get the first semi-final ready for you guys so make sure you don't go anywhere and we'll be right back
Hello, everyone. Welcome back to the Hearthstone Masters Tour Spring Championship. But we are getting ready to kick off our top four. So to help me do that, I have with me Saddle. Ready for this top four, Saddle? I am ready indeed. It looks like uh, in this tournament, I'm just the designated Habu Gabu caster. It seems to have lined up <laughs> that I just get to call all of Habu's games. And I'm not complaining about that at all. I'm a big fan of... Habu, I like his lineup. He's a very, very, very good player, so I'm looking forward to getting my teeth sunk into this one. I think it'll be uh, hard pressed to be as unique a series as we just watched there with uh, with Bunny Hopper. Like at one of the most tenacious zero three defeats I've ever seen. Right, like losing all three games, but having a decent attempt at fatiguing a nature shaman, leaving fifteen damage up on board for like six turns against Dragon Priest, like. Bunny gave it a good old go, but unfortunately he is going to fall by the wayside. So we are going to be dipping back in with uh, Pjatnica now. And luckily, we uh, we do have this little player card for him. Because coming into this tournament, I did not know an awful lot about this player. So uh, you know, he's been hanging around playing Hearthstone for a good solid eight years, which is most of the game's life at this point. And taking a look at his deck list, no great surprise that he's listing Hearthstone Brew as his favorite card because he has packed that bad boy into just about every deck he can realistically fit it in. Just about. Which, let me check. Uh, yeah, that is in, what, three of the four decks? I believe. No. Oh, it's only in two. It's, it's only, only in, in half. two. Yeah. It's I mean, fine. I mean, come on, try hard. You could have got it in the warrior as well. It's a pure Highlander right. warrior. There's room in there for yeah. a half. Come on, you try hard. You can fit everything in Highlander. It's fine. Yeah. But as you mentioned on the other side, Habu Gabu, definitely no stranger to these Masters tours, but hasn't really had that uh, it's like definitive finish, I think. Uh, there was the Summer Championship winner, but really looking for more than that at this point wants to make it to worlds wants to get there uh and this time around has the chance to do that because top two of this tournament are getting there so this is a very very important match for these players and uh one of those really interesting decks that we have seen habu gabu uh bringing is this sludge warlock the only player to bring the sludge warlock yeah, and it looked like Genius in the first series that we watched, or maybe the first couple of series that we watched, because he was preying on uh, the Custom Warlocks for quite some time on the first day that we saw him. Uh, both of his series now, including this one, have been a little bit trickier because of the lack of that deck. It's not the only deck that he's got uh, tech and targeting tools in his lineup against, but I think it's certainly uh, one of his best matchups of the one available. Um, and in those other decks, I was talking about this with Lorinda, I think, where um, you know, when you come up against decks that aren't necessarily what you're specifically aiming this Sludge Warlock at, it is then just kind of a tier 3 deck that you've brought to the tournament, right? Which gives you a little bit of an uphill struggle. And that is reflected in the overall stats. Uh, the deck is now down to 40% win rate overall going into uh, day 3. So it's, it's you know, choosing to... Be, uh, sorry, proving to be... A, uh, a kind of polarizing choice for Habu Gabu as it's always going to be, but that is how he plays tournaments, right? He takes wild swings with his lineup construction. When it pays off, it pays off huge. Yeah, and it's been really, really fun to watch uh, his reactions and pop-offs on camera as well. Just, I think a lot of the players, but uh, Habu Gabu definitely has been a very interesting one. And not only the kind of interesting inclusion of the Sludge Warlock, but on the other side for this first game uh, for Paitna, Paitna, ugh, I am having a hard time today. Sorry. Uh, Paitna, nope. Pjatnitsa. Pjatnitsa. <laughs> yeah, I had it just fine the other day, and then was, <laughs> my my mouth just not formed the word Look, today. In, uh, in your defense, <laughs> so, like... So, I don't think we've actually clarified this enough, right? The re so Piatnica does not read in like the, the Latin Roman alphabet anything like the characters that are on the screen. We did ask about it. Essentially, his name means Friday, but it's been weirdly translated from Cyrillic into our alphabet. So it's Friday or it's Piatnica, which is the word for Friday, is uh, what the guy's name is. So if you're at all confused why we're saying something that sounds entirely <laughs> different to what looks like it's on screen, that's the reason why. That is right. 
Well, I know that you have been a big proponent of this priest deck, especially uh, that we are seeing. So I want to hear your thoughts about this sludge warlock into this priest, because I don't feel like this is one that we really get to see very often, uh, except for maybe this tournament. Yeah, I am. I'm a big, big fan of it indeed. And I think we've seen a great deal of why I kind of set it up leading into the tournament. And we've seen a lot of the players who have brought to, who have brought it. These are some of the best players in the world. Um, kind of making my point for me that when it's when this deck is played at kind of a medium level, you're just seeing like players tempo out all of their stuff early and they play their Zarimi. And if that wins with the two turn lethal and the extra turn, then they win. If it doesn't do that, they're kind of out of ideas and they lose. Whereas We've been seeing players uh, both leveraging in interesting setups with it by holding back stuff so they have stronger two-turn setups, by finding really cool like infinite value engines with discovers from Amenthal and with clever use of power called Synchronize. We've also seen people like Bunny Hopper finding creative ways to play against it with varying degrees of success. He kind of failed to do so in the previous series by just not allowing a board space ever for that Zarimi to come down. He actually did that successfully in a previous series to even make it to this top eight in the first place. So I feel like this priest has added a lot just to the the difficulty level of the tournament. I think it's been um, one of the most skill intensive uh, decks to play both with and against in the tournament. And as I keep saying, that's kind of what you want when you get to this level of Hearthstone. Yeah. Oh, speaking of also things that you want, how about some sludges that finally have gotten to be uh, put on the bottom of the deck and tossed away with that waste remover? I think uh, in the previous series, we didn't really get to see that. There weren't uh, barrels of sludge that were actually getting put onto the bottom of the deck. Uh, there is, interestingly, the second waste remover that was just picked up. Not sure uh, how relevant that's going to be currently. Just kind of missing something like a Forge of Wills uh, to be able to create yeah. additional bodies on board at this point to start contesting some of those minions from the priest side. Uh, and also, I find it a little interesting here as well, the Zilliax for Habu Gabu that we do see in hand. Uh, is not one of the variants that has like rush and taunt and, and lifesteal uh, to start immediately clearing things up on board. It can get a very large uh, attack total because it is the one that uh, will add attack and double every time at the start of the turn. But uh, once that comes down onto the board that first turn, it's not going to be doing much to answer anything uh, from Beatnut's side. It is. And you see the nerf coming into play on the waste remover as well. The nerf down from 7 attack to 5 attack. Kind of making a huge mess of this turn from Habu Gabu because he can't really challenge the Drifter anymore with the 6 health on the other side. So um, Habu Gabu would at least be pleased if he could see Pyapnitz's hand that there's not going to be a great follow-up to this. So he might still be able to just dominate the board with the Zilliax over a couple of turns. But uh, that Drifter is providing an awful lot of stability for Pyatnitsa right now, and actually enough to cause Habu to divert, try and go for the sniper, wow. gem tosser, and now <laughs> his tossers have been working out fantastically well for him so far in this tournament. There was one absolutely outrageously unlikely one. That one was more likely to go in his favor, but still an absolutely massive outcome to be able to snipe out that 4-1. Yeah, those were just the most incredible hits. Uh, uh, on this other side for the priest here, Hearthstone Brew and Amundul in hand could potentially uh, put some work in in the next couple of turns if uh, chooses to go that route. But that Zilliax looking pretty nice to start contesting a little bit of this as well. Or at least get some stats on board. But uh, what uh, what does Pietnitsa really want to uh, start doing at this point or, or hope for? I mean, right now he needs to draw well off the top, which is not a thing this deck does particularly well. We've seen Habu Gabu's deck uh, a little bit better adjusted to doing that kind of thing. It can draw Gaia Worm off the top, which is a really great top deck of, in and of itself, which there aren't many of in the deck as a whole. Because even the problem with like playing this hand out, right? Like, Alanthal is one of the best cards in your deck when you don't get like really fast blow ups, uh, blowout starts. And if he plays half first, like it's it's replace, right? So he just straight up lose access to that that Amenthal curve, which gives him a really really big problem over the next couple of turns. 
Yeah, it is kind of uh, really awkward. We'll see if he does get to actually top deck anything great here. But on the other side, the the top deck for Habu Gabu of picking up this Popgar is is kind of interesting. There could be some um, trading manipulation here to uh, to try to clear with both of those barrels of sludge that you get from the Popgar, but. Also, that Zilliax being at five health, I think, just makes things a little bit awkward versus those barrels. Yeah, that Zilliax is just far too much of a monster here, I think. And unless this is something particularly powerful... Okay. I mean... So you have an option now this turn. You actually have to, at the very least, think about your lines. So your three available lines, really, are... Synchronize the Zilliax and just play your own Zilliax trade in your salesman and just go for the tradable on the snake oil and try and hit something but even then i don't know what like individual card would get you out of this or just put your faith in the hearth and just slam it and hope it gives you a hand that can get there do you believe in the hearth i don't but i'm not the one playing 50 percent of my decks in the biggest fair. tournament of my life yeah. you know yeah i, I feel like a Pretty much all of us on the casting desk are not huge fans of the uh, the hearth, but I know there are quite a few of the uh, really well-known players who are, and obviously quite a few of them have brought it in their deck. Um, yeah, it does look like yeah, Nitsa just going to go for that synchronize on the Zilliax that you mentioned, um, and also making the trade, which uh, seems pretty good here. Yeah, I like this, because what this now allows you to do is you spend your turn 7 dealing with the giant Zilliax and one other thing that gets played this turn um, with the Armenthal, and then from yeah. there you can start thinking about Hearth if the uh, the legendary that you find isn't particularly effective. Decent chance, honestly, depending on what Habu Gabu can come out with here, that your Armenthal does <gasps> just dominate the board and gets to stick for a turn, which would be absolutely massive if you can do that. Oh. Habugabu just picked up this Forge of Wills, which does seem pretty exciting, but it just get an gets answered immediately by that Amundul that you already mentioned. So yep. it, it seems like a cool pickup, but it's only kind of uh, just for this single turn. So, and the the Amundul and Hearth have both been sitting in hand for a while now, uh, and there wasn't a really great kind of uh, turn five, even. Turn six uh, seemed a little weird, and yeah, and it's uh, really spent a lot of time thinking about it. So I'd have to imagine Habu Gabu already kind of had at least the Amundul in the back of his mind. Come on, big money, big money, big money. <laughs> very, very medium money. Alvaria is at least a rush minion. I guess you take it. Better than the other options. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Seems a little awkward here for Habu Gabu now. Okay, finding the poisonous, but without rush and poisonous. Uh, it's not really doing much against the Amundul. The rest of the hand was looking a little bit awkward uh, in terms of how Habu Gabu might want to answer it. The most, uh, I guess straightforward way of answering it is what we are seeing which is the pop bar and double uh double sludge barrel there to just clear that up but i kind of like the setup of just getting this little poisonous one one out on the board mm -hmm. so that you're just setting up ahead of time saying well whatever you put down now i have this poison and can clear that up but if the board were to go wide that's only clearing off one thing but we see this just really slow hand that's Definitely not going wide at this point, unless uh, a lot of really miraculous draws happen all at once. Small detail, by the way, but just to highlight like the, the level of small decision that a player like Habu Gabu is getting right without even particularly pausing to think about it. Check out the positioning of the minions broken up by the currently inactive location, which means if Pyatnitsa had a funnel cake in hand, for example, he cannot aim it at three consecutive minions on the board meaning he can't get the full three mana refresh, which actually ends up being uh, disturbingly relevant this turn, actually. Oh, it's Mill right. Rogue again! <laughs> oh, all right, the Antique Kill Bot. Are, are we going to see it uh, win another game? Honestly? 
like, Milrogue against Sludge Warlock? I mean, I've seen things that give me less hope. <laughs> if Harbu Garbi plays Chaos Creation, and you're kind of in business of just milling his entire deck at that point, right? Why not? Yeah. You've got to believe. Just the availability of Prep Vanish is actually quite uh, huge as well, because this, this board's going to get pretty massive from here. So what kind of approach does Habugabu have to take here now, looking at the the potential? Of course, Habu at this point doesn't know what the the hand is that was created um, no. by Hearth. Uh, there was not any of those cards played yet, so no indication of what it is. Uh, but also still kind of missing additional... Uh, things to create barrels of sludge at this point so even something like the waste remover isn't going to be doing a whole lot uh, to try to push a lot of that uh, sludge damage can burn a card here with the posic though small victory at the very least we all know that as soon as you make your opponent burn a card you automatically <laughs> win the game of hearthstone that's just how it works But yeah, this Vanish could end up being really, really huge for Piatnitsa in this game. Can start weaving some heal bots in there, can weave the cold light in there instead. Yeah, a lot of ways to go about this, and there's only 10 cards remaining yeah. in Habu Gabu's deck. You can also just choose to just spend the mana now. Get the brand down, possibly? Yeah, it doesn't quite work out, though. Just thinking, like, play the brand, get some use out of it, bounce it all back to your hand, use it again later, but I don't think the mana quite works out on that while clearing the board, or at least uh, returning the board to hand with the Vanish. Habu Gabu right now must be utterly terrified, by the way, because he still has no <laughs> yes. idea what hand he's facing off against at the moment. Just brand bot. Okay, Brand Bot all the way back to full. And then are we stepping the Heal Bot or are we stepping the Brand? Stepping the Bot, okay. Okay. And so this is looking very similar to what we saw earlier when this uh, same Hearth Hand was kind of created. I think this is kind of bad news. Like, I definitely think this is top half that Piatnitsa could have hit here for outcomes from the hand because suddenly, like, Waste Remover yeah. in Harbu's hand is kind of scary. As a, as a self-mill kind of card, Chaos Creation is extremely yeah. scary in Harbu's hand as a self-mill tool. Yeah, both of those just kind of feel pretty dead at the moment. Getting down all the way to seven cards now for Habu Gabu left in the deck. And then also, the yeah, the Cold Light Seer can really just... Uh, pump up that fatigue damage that Habugabu would face too. Yep. So the Bran is gone, of course. So you would almost certainly assume the Bran is dying this turn, <laughs> yeah. but there's still a Brewmaster. There's still um, a Prep Vanish available. There's still Gang Up available that can get extra copies in there if you need to. So there is still a lot of potential gas when it comes to, uh, to fatiguing Habu here. This is not quite the game plan that uh, I would have expected from the priest, but here we are. Has to remove this whole board, but as you mentioned, the vanish there and replay the antique heal bots. Oh, for more healing. Oh, hello. Why didn't we get to play funnel cake in Mill Road back <laughs> in the day? This seems exciting. Can you imagine? Oh. I oh. So you could now like Cold Light Oracle funnel cake the opposing side of the board, and then still potentially heal bot prep vanish. The problem is, is you're returning a gem tosser and a pop guard to your opponent's hand, which are both pretty good cards to return again. Although actually, yeah. if you Cold Light first, I think you can burn the gem tosser. So you're only giving the pop guard back, which is pretty huge, actually. Yeah, 
Oh, now there's a Leroy what? as well? Oh my gosh. This would be the moment where if I were casting with Raven, he'd see seven mana, he'd see a Leroy and a gang up, and he'd just be saying, All right, let's get let's get some Leroy's in my deck. Nah, nah, you, you always have to stick with this Vanish plan this turn, I think. Once you started going for it, you just have to follow through. Yeah, as you mentioned, that gem tosser burned and a sludge on wheels burned. Yeah, really good recognition from Pjadnica as well. Just, you know, uh, minions returned to hand in the order that they were played, so he knew if he could fill yeah. a couple of cards up first with the Cold Light Oracle, then that, um, that gem tosser, which is by far the scariest card representing 10 damage, would actually get burned, which is phenomenal news. Yeah, can't uh, can't set up any sort of fill the hand, burn another card uh, from Habu Gabu's side either with the Pazic. Yeah, I Speaker Stomper slows something down, but it doesn't feel like it's doing a whole lot other than putting something on the board at this point. Right. So many is just building up another board uh, and threatening lethal with stats enough? With four cards remaining. Oh, oh, it's not active. Didn't play enough no. dragons before the half. No, there really wasn't uh, much found. And I think the the Wrangler got uh, killed pretty early. So there wasn't very many happy whelps. Yep. Is there a funnel cake remaining? No, one was played and one was transformed on the turn the hearth was played, right? So there's, I'm thinking, yeah. I was thinking of that some line where you play like Cold Light Oracle to pick up some dragons and then also pick up funnel cake at the mana back. You're able to get the Zarimi down in the same turn, but way too far away from that, I think, even if you did have funnel cakes in the deck and you don't. So that is a complete non starter. This is just going to be lethal for Habu Gabu if yep. uh, this board doesn't get <laughs> answered right now. Yep. There's no way this has to be like a Leroy How trade, is that the right? rope already? I feel like I've been thinking about this turn for like three seconds. How is the rope already yeah. here? Oh, Cold Light burns the Drifter! That was potentially an out if he could make something happen, but just did not find the line in the end. Decision paralysis. Piatnitsa is going to lose game one. Chaos Creation is going to burn that last remaining card out of the deck, but it is not draw five. It is simply destroy the bottom cards of your deck. So no fatigue worry in the end from Habu Gabu. And that was a difficult game to navigate from his perspective because he had to play the last three to four turns of that game essentially without playing his two highest threat cards which were the Waste Remover and the Chaos Creation. Those were the easiest ways to yeah. generate pressure. And Harbu Garbage just couldn't play them because he realized if he did so, he'd be uh, quite easily fatigued out with the Cold Light Oracle combo that came from the Hearth. So a pretty crazy game number one, but Harbu kept a cool ahead, I think, of the two players in the end, managed to navigate his way through. Worth saying, I think Piatnitsa had a pretty terrible draw. Uh, with the Zarimi Priest, yeah. but uh, almost was able to make something happen. Would love to go back and like revisit this game basically from this point, just to try and figure out if there was uh, any different route, because there was so many different combinations of healing, vanish, with or without prep, with the Brewmaster thrown in there as well, maybe using gang up on Healbots, maybe using gang up on Leroy, maybe using gang up on Cold Light Oracle. Like, there's so many different routes that you could take there to try and find yourself some kind of win condition. I think that'd be a pretty interesting game to like break down long form if you had the time. But as I called out in the end, sometimes 75 seconds is not as long as you think it is once your turn starts and you run out of time very, very quickly. Yeah, it really did, which was interesting because I think what, like two turns before that, there was a turn that uh, felt like it went on for about five minutes just for that single turn. <laughs> so then we had that turn that was five seconds, uh, which felt like 
But that does mean that uh, that the warlock, the sludge warlock, has gotten through. So for Habu Gabu, just has the jive shaman and uh, the priest of his own to get through now. Uh, how are you feeling about these two decks into uh, Yetnitsa's lineup? I feel pretty good about it. Double Demon Hunter ban as well, this series worth uh, calling out. But um, I think the X Factor here is going to be the Rainbow DK. It's a deck that we haven't really talked about significantly because uh, it's it's uh, unique to Pyatnitsa. He's uh, done brilliantly with it so far. I believe coming into day two, he won every game with it. And I'm not sure how that stands because uh, Pyatnitsa series was the one we joined in progress where the, the DK had already got out, but I don't know if it went 1-0 or 1-1. But either way, he's doing fantastically well with it. He's uh, coming into day two and shout out again to OnCrowd for keeping the stats for us on Twitter. Um, he'd played three games, he'd won three games and Rainbow DK had been banned in one of his series as well, which makes it a, a pretty effective bring to yeah. the tournament so far, you'd have to say. But it uh, looks like Habu Gabu is going straight back to the Zarimi Priest of his own. Uh, this is the most uh, off-the-wall build of the deck, I think, that we have in the tournament with the Razor Scale, the Double Gaia Worm, and the Ignis thrown in there as some of those uh, those extra tech tools to find some roots um, against Warrior in particular uh, with the Ignis representing extra damage. And then if you caught Habu Gabu's interview at the end of day two, I believe it was, he went very, very in-depth about all the different things that uh, the Razor Scale can do for him in this tournament. Yeah, an incredible inclusion. And even uh, Habu Gabu during that interview did mention just uh, just having the, like, the one copy of Razor Scale. Um, but I think beyond those, what we've gotten to see in action that has been uh, pretty standout as well is the inclusion of those gyre worms. Uh, it was very, very exciting to see the kind of uh, excitement that Habu Gabu himself had when drawing those back-to-back -back <laughs> turns for a yep. lethal uh, to close it out in one of those matches yesterday. It was very exciting. But we'll see if he can pull off something like that in this second match Uh the warrior on the other side and this is the full highlander warrior uh the right. complete one of list just uh of note so the things like the bran and reno will be active uh, as soon as they are in hand and ready to go but there is two miracle salesmen and a whelp wrangler in hand for habu gabu how is that looking for uh this pre-start yeah, Welp Wrangler in general is such a strong opening card in most matchups, but against Warrior in particular, if you can coin it out on one on the coin or if you can drop it on two on the play, it's actually pretty damn difficult for uh, Warrior to interact with. It normally, more often than not, will stick for uh, an extra turn or two, which means you can absolutely get those happy Welps going and basically have complete peace of mind uh, about your Zarimi turn moving forward. He has also hit that Ignis, which I think is one of the best cards in his deck for the Warrior matchup. But of course, it's a very strange Ignis. It's a very awkward Ignis because you do still have to find that uh, Gaia Worm and be able to forge it to activate the Ignis. And a lot of times right yes. now, right, any turn from now onward where you draw a Gaia Worm, your first instinct is going to want to play it as a quick draw card, right? Because that's how it's designed. You're just going to draw it off the top on any given turn. And you're going to go, oh, okay, cool. I'm going to slam this card. Um, but that's not necessarily going to be what you want to do long term with that Ignis in your hand representing so much extra value as a plan B. But that might be a long, long way in the future and maybe not even come to fruition at all because if Habu Gabu just keeps curving out like this, he might just get there real quick with that Zarimi. Yeah, already a Thirsty Drifter, already the Zarimi, some Dragon Creation, looking pretty good. And on the other side, uh, oh, and the Razor Scale as well. Oh, this is going to be so interesting. Uh, the <laughs> Trial by Fire? Is that the only removal in hand right now? Uh, there's a Bellowing Flames that was just picked up on the previous oh, turn, yeah. which, which is discounted as well, so it can be forged and played on the same turn here. Of course, it will still cost two, even through the uh, the Razor Scale. But yeah, it, it will say that that spell that was drawn was a discounted Trial by Fire instead. This would stop Coin Trial by Fire, for example, which would be a huge uh, swing in favor of Habu Gabu. I love it's that also... we're finally getting to see it, though, the Razor Scale. 
Yep. I, we really didn't get to see it much uh, before. Yep. So yeah, this is stopping what it's stopping. So it's stopping coin discounted trial by fire. It's also stopping safety goggles coin sanitize. There's another thing that'd be shutting down, I guess, in this position. So there are uh, there's a few things that Harbi Garbi would be switching off. It just so happens that none of them are actually in the hand for Pianitza right now. So it's just a 2-4. <laughs> yeah. But it's doing great. He's doing his best. And, uh... Yeah, gonna go for the Bellowing Flames, as you mentioned, forging it and getting to play it this turn. Just try to remove as much as possible there. Does clear off uh, a couple of the, the bodies, so not too bad, but doesn't clear off the Whelp Wrangler, which I think uh, here is pretty key, considering that that uh, mm -hmm. Zerimi needs to have just a little bit more more dragons to go with it. Oh my. It is, uh, Dawn, it's become time to pick a line and commit <laughs> to it here, because... Abu can choose to go two different ways here. He can choose to go max tempo this turn, just play his one drops, play his first thirsty drifter for zero, play the other, uh, sorry, play the first one for one, play the second one for zero, and then just try and follow that up with a Zarimi at some point, or he can try and hold those back for the guaranteed two turner with Zarimi instead, and that is looking to be what he wants to go with here instead. Yeah, I think using that tradable to pick up that second uh, Whelp Wrangler kind of helped with that decision too. Harbu Garbu giving it the go on. Go on, do your worst. Yeah. I'm ready for it. I'm ready. Sure. Does this just have to be the coin trial by fire and, and clear the board? Ugh. So the ETC <laughs> is a gatekeeper, an armor vendor, and a dirty rat, which nope, none of yes. that is doing anything for you in the long run. So yeah, I think it just has to be the trial by fire. Harbu saw the coin, had a sharp intake of breath, but then I think he saw him mouth the words, nope, that's fine in response yep. to uh, what he's facing down here. Safety goggles from Pianitza as well to gain the six, just hoping <gasps> that that six armor might just get him over the line against the two turns. Saddle, we have just seen one of those Gaia Worms enter the hand. Could be forged, could be played, but does Habugabu even need it at this point with all of these other bodies and Zarimi? I don't think so. With one dragon left remaining, right? If I got this count, yeah, yeah. So I this mean... is now active, and you can just play the uh, the double the double thirsties, which gives you thirteen damage going into the next turn. Ooh, okay. Well, now we've got options. I was gonna say, then it's probably forge the Gaia Worm, play the Ignis, and just take um, a five mana weapon, possibly try and hit Wind Fury for massive damage on the next turn. Just to go face with. But Armenthal is a pretty exciting top deck. It yeah, is. I respect it. Okay. I'm just going to clear up a couple of things. I am curious to see what this Discover is. Yeah, this could be huge. Any form of damage. Sonya is usually Whoa. such an exciting role with this deck as well, but Thess uh, Thessarian does represent direct damage potential, which makes this a somewhat yeah. tougher choice than you might think. I mean, even Fi has natural synergy with the deck, right? It's got to be said as well, <laughs> even though it's not necessarily what you're interested in. <laughs> Never mind. Apparently, that's exactly what you're interested in. It is. It is the best. It's actually my favorite card. I love that card so much. Uh, not that it necessarily is the pick every time you see it, but is it sure, just an art here vibe? I know a lot of people kinda... really, really love the art on Fire. It, yeah, I, I love the art. Mm -hmm. I also just, I love dragons, so you Fair. gotta go with it. Uh, I, I do like that Amenthal play, though, just going for it. Uh, definitely, there was consideration for that Forge Ignis play that you had mentioned as well. Yeah, uh, but this just creates more, more threats. It just keeps those threats going. This is something that uh, Aitnitz uh, really wants to answer or remove, but there's not 
great ways to do that at the moment. No. Uh, and and then the the forge Ignis play can still happen on the following turn if there's not lethal on board yet. Uh, plus the crucial additional one damage or uh, one mana next turn that if Habugabu instead is very close to lethal, uh, the Gyre Worm being forged, Ignis, and going for a one cost weapon to potentially just get that extra bit of damage. Sanitize just barely out of reach as it was for the entire game for Bunny Hopper earlier on as well. Yeah, needs to can drop the forge on it now at least though, which gives him some hope for future turns. Just going to summon a copy. Yeah. Uh, well, none of these. <laughs> yeah. The Memoron could be interesting in some other decks that are being played, but there's not anything that uh, is super exciting in these uh, discover options here. No. Is, is there any... Okay, I was like, is there any undead either? <laughs> I don't think so. No, right, most things are a dragon, Crimson Clergy yeah. is nothing, Glowstone's an elemental. And here it is, gonna go for that forge and the Ignis. Okay, no, no one for... Deal ten. six with Battlecry, though? He went ten, okay. Yeah, I mean, that makes sense. He's got enough gas to keep going on turn nine, I suppose. I guess the goal here is to... Uh, try and potentially set up a uh, two-turn lethal through the Reno. Because said, because you've played Zerimi sure. this game, you've essentially played Wild Growth, right? So your 10-mana turn comes in response to your opponent's Reno in uh, some positions. Yeah, and also if there is uh, some more board removal or armor gain uh, on uh, turn 9 here as well, even without Reno being set up, but if everything else uh, goes away, there is still the forged Gyre Worm that Habu can continue just push a little bit of damage uh, with yep. playing that out as well before yep. that turn 10 weapon comes down. Yeah, I can also have some fun with the uh, projectionist and the fire, right? If you want to just make another huge board at some point, which is kind of cool. I think we're probably past sure. that point in the game. But worth keeping an eye on anyway. The only thing that I see that's potentially awkward with the 10 mana weapon, because you didn't hit the Wind Fury, is if you do end up in that spot where like you make another board next turn, like this board gets dealt with, you make another board next turn, it gets renoed, and then your response is the weapon. Uh, Piatnica does play Viper in the deck, right? Because it is pure yep. Highlander, so you could potentially just lose access to your entire uh, 10 mana turn. But as it stands, yep. there is just not a significant uh, board clear coming out here. 10 still being represented on board. Habu is so close to being able to close this out. <laughs> He's been offered three different Highlander legendaries from Discovery so far. <laughs> and summoned a fourth one from the random summon as well. What the hell? What's going on? So I believe one damage off. Yeah. Oh, and one mana off being able to... Uh... Use the Gaia Worm, Celestial, Projectionist, and Gaia Worm. Yep, yep. Ah, oh, that Thelderin looks so exciting if there weren't duplicates in the deck. The Discoverers have not been uh, super favorable here for Habu either, but still been able to piece together tons of damage, keep the pressure on, and I feel like we have seen this... Uh, repeatedly so far today in our top eight, where these warriors just look like they are sitting there doing nothing, just desperately grasping at straws to stay in these games. And that is the Reno coming out from Piatnica. And we saw Battlecry deal damage was an option for the weapon, and it there was it the one that was chosen, which means 
with the six damage, Habu Gabu is going to go off to a 2 0 lead. Habu Gabu did the smart thing of recognizing that setup three times in advance, uh, three turns in advance. All I've got to do is the easy job and spot it as it happens. But as it panned out exactly as we expected, loading up that damage on board, taking the 10 mana weapon, and even with the miss on the Wind Fury, just enough damage to uh, get over the line in the end. And you've got to say, you have to point it out. I pointed it out on both sides. I've been very, very fair. When Habu Gabu's deck choices have looked quite silly, I've made fun of them. When they've looked like genius, I've caught, said they look like genius. And that is at least three games this tournament that specifically the damage from hand from Glowstone Guileworm has got Habu over the line in difficult spots, right? You could argue yeah. that one of the cards that's not being played in this deck to make room for these choices is Leroy Jenkins. And Leroy Jenkins with an Armenthal sticking to the board would have mega ended it, right? Because you can go Leroy, copy the Leroy, and then they both charge at the face on the same turn, um, which is one of the coolest interactions with it. But Habu Gabu's list, Habu Gabu appears to have cooked here, particularly in the Warrior matchup specifically, where this Ignis and the, the Gaia Worms are doing some real, real work for him. Yeah, it's been really interesting. I was thinking about it earlier uh, during one of the matches that it does seem like the the success stories that I think we have seen over the course of this tournament have been the decks that are able to push some early game damage and then close things out with something from hand, whether that is those demon hunters with discovering inquisitors or yeah. these like Ignis weapons, you know, or something to that effect uh, has has been kind of the theme, I think, for a lot of the decks this weekend, because there are things like the armor that can potentially uh, come out from things like the warrior or uh, some of those other kind of control decks that we've seen. And I think that's another point why it's so critical that we have seen a lot of these players also taking their time a lot to really count and consider a lot of the different break points that we've seen. Yeah, for sure. It's almost uh, a bit of a lost art in Hearthstone. The ability to just set up two to throw, uh, three turn lethals by, yeah. by partitioning out direct damage because we don't necessarily see a lot of those classic face hunter styles of deck anymore. Like uh, most of the best aggro decks that we see are very board based aggro decks. And most of the best damage from hand decks that we see are um, save up blow your opponent out with a with a 30 damage plus otk kind of thing right so that idea of like my deck just hits you with consistent damage and i partition it out over multiple turns isn't something that you see a massive amount of these days but we have certainly seen a little resurgence of it in this tournament with some of the decks and uh, particularly with uh, with habu gabu's lineup and particularly with habu gabu's lineup against warlocks when he gets to face <laughs> off against them yes well, uh, this game, we are seeing Habu Gabu's Jive Shaman. This is the last deck that he's going to need to get a win with. Uh, and I, I think another thing we've said all throughout the weekend is it has to feel good being up 2-0. But that does absolutely not count the other player out. Uh, so how do you feel about this uh, matchup of the Priest into this Jive Shaman? I think it's pretty close. Um, I think it's very, very difficult to navigate from the Shaman side. Like, I think the skill edge goes to the Shaman, if you like. Like, if you look at stats, I think you can adjust that a little bit towards Shaman for the very best players in the world, because it's super tricky to be able to navigate through potentially using resources to clear a board, uh, but then also preserving enough to be able to kill the opponent, right? Because you can't really set out to go long against this deck because you're not resilient enough to be able to survive the double turn if they get to the double the double turn so you have to ride this raise a fine line the entire time of preserving enough to be able to at some point flash and kill your opponent but then also just not letting them run away with these like four fours and three threes that they can just flood all over the board in the early game so very very difficult to uh, navigate from the shaman side but in the hands of a good shaman player i think uh, a pretty close matchup overall yeah and the bringing up the things like four fours uh pretty relevant as we have seen the gift wrapped whelp come down uh on the other side here, which did mean that the lightning bolt was not able to clear. Uh, nothing kind of able to come down and uh, actually clear these up. This is extra damage that uh, pain, man, uh, that there's able to be pushed to face. 
This just starts that chip damage. Yeah, and just following up with the Starlight Whelp, just another massive minion. I think that was probably the best target to receive the buff and has done here. To the point that, yeah, something that Neil and I was were talking about earlier, sometimes you do get put under so much pressure earlier that you've got to look for that tempo flash earlier on, and uh, that is where Habu Gabu is already at this point. Going to try and make a big tempo swing happen in the early game. Tricky turn now because essentially your whole hand is playable here with the pip. Yeah. But there's no payoff card to go with it. There's no drifters. There's no dreamboat. Nothing to actually like add more massive minions to the board. So really everything that you commit here just becomes Crash of Thunder fuel if it ends up getting played. Yeah. It was quite a bit of added stats with the duplicated gift for up whelps though. Which is kind of what we've been talking about already. All of these added stats. Uh, and I, I guess if there is that breakpoint of being able to buff these outside of Crash of Thunder, mm -hmm. uh, that's pretty significant. But uh, the question then becomes, what uh, what is Hobby Gobby able to do to actually clear these up? A lightning storm. Also, again, only at that three damage. Uh, and there is no additional spell damage available to use no you do have a crash in your hand that's absolutely going to go to zero this hand that, uh, this turn though so i don't think you're super yeah. worried about clearing the board from here i think you are just looking for the most advantageous cards in general uh, which is probably now amphibious elixir try and look for some uh, some off the wall tools as opposed to the regular tools that you have in your deck not sure another pop-up book is going to help you out an enormous amount here yeah i agree with this so you can find something helpful. Altered Chord, very nice. Yeah, Crash of Thunder can clear this up. And actually, very, very nice. Manages to spend uh, such little mana that he can actually drop the Jazz Base and get that rolling this turn as well. It's huge. Yeah. That was an incredible turn. Uh, really made possible by the uh, Flash played the previous turn, which was yep. an incredible... Uh, draw uh, for Habu Gabu getting to play that and set that up. But at the same time, I like the under committal from Pjapnitsa on the other side because, you know, what was adding four Miracle Salesmen to that board with by using both of your funnel <laughs> yeah. cakes really going to achieve, right? Like, not a great deal. As soon as a storm or a crash came out, those are all getting swept up anyway. So at least now he has... A, he's, seen a, he's seen an AoE get used and he can actually re refill the board pretty effectively with uh, something that's vaguely threatening. Yeah. Thank you. Stop there for the what? world's most symmetrical <laughs> hardstone. But boo! Come on! What were you doing? Four snakes versus four the... frogs. That's the real hardstone we want to see. The jive insect coming into hand, and that conductivity not going to be able to come out quite yet. But the jazz base is already set up. Uh, there could be some Ragnaroses. Yeah, it's Ragnaros the first overload five? on the Jazz Base, I think, right? Rag <laughs> could be coming out very soon. Another Crash of Thunder. I just dropped the Altered Chord. Yeah, it means zero damage yeah. being taken this turn, and we are back to Unity, Precision, Perfection. Don't you dare hit one of those Salesmen, how we go. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> just want this board it state forever. It's thought wonderful. about it for a second. Yeah. It is. Uh, again, uh, this game, another kind of uh, awkward turn six with this Hearthstone brew. The Amonthul coming into hand now already. Uh, how, how many uh, salesmen can go onto the board? <laughs> Projectionist and another salesman. Hooray! And this is, what, twice in three games that Pjadnitz has been in this position? With Half and Armanthul yes. in the hand at the same time? I would not now be surprised yeah. if this fifth salesman is being ignored. Yeah, and we're just going to go Funnel Cake, but Funnel Cake can potentially jam the Half? No? Okay, he's going to hold on to the Half. Okay. Oh, yeah, true, true, true. You no, can get two extra yeah. healing as well. Yeah, yeah, I would have missed two healing there was not paying attention to that at all. Makes sense. 
Ooh, okay. Ooh, this is not right. the rogue. <laughs> not the rogue hand we've seen before, but uh, that's a lot of potential damage. Big minions. Oh, man. Carnivorous cube. I miss those days. Yep. One of the undisputed greatest Hearthstone decks of all time, if you disagree. Oh, you are wrong. I hate to break it to you, so much but fun. you are. Hmm. Magatha burned. That actually could be detrimental, but I don't know. How long do you think that this game really continues to go uh, before Habugabu is actually able to piece something together and close it out if uh, if it goes that long? Yeah, I think because... So Pianita got... Yeah, you know, we're excited to see it because we love Q-Block, but in reality, this is one of the clunkiest hands that you can get, yeah. right? Because if you look at the actual minions in your hand, Doomguard is not the first thing that you want to play because you're likely to discard the other cool things in your hand. Cube, as the first thing that you play, does absolutely nothing. Faceless Manipulator, as the first thing that you play, does absolutely nothing. So realistically, the first thing that you have to play is Skull of the Minari to get a demon out of your hand, yeah. <laughs> which is a ludicrously low-tempo turn and leaves an almost entirely empty board only saved by this drifter for Habugabu to just be able to potentially uh, commit a conductivity play on. If he found a, a pop-up book or something here, like this could mm -hmm. be pretty close to game over already. I mean, still, there is still one in the deck, right? I think so, I yeah. I believe one that was played earlier was discovered. Yeah, we saw two of them get played, and I think one of those was from hand and one of those was a discover, I believe. But hey, there's always a way to find a pop-up book. There, Yeah, there really is. And there it is. Zappa is free, so if you play the Zappa... Mm -hmm. The pop-up book then deals three damage to the 4-6. Your weapon finishes it off. You then have three minions yep. in play. Habu seems equally as excited about this as I am. Don't think the crash is going to zero this turn. Although you have already played mm -hmm. Reflexes. You've already played pop-up book and you're going to play Conductivity this turn as well. So it does get down to two yes. already. Doesn't go for it, though. Chooses the flash. That's fair. Okay. Which, yeah, respectable. But now we are getting to see this, and three bodies going to be transformed into Ragnaros, but that is only going to mean 24 damage going to face, uh, setting uh, this health total to two. Void Lord immediately coming down. Drifter again as well. So for those of you that didn't play mm. back in the uh, the Q block days, the spells in hand we've got Dark Pact in there, which will destroy a minion, restore eight health to your hero. Uh, Carnivorous Cube uh, eats a minion and stores two copies of that minion inside its death rattle, so that's a natural combo. You can, for example, eat this Void Lord and then heal for eight and spit two Void Lords back out, which can protect you uh, from this Ragnaros board state. And that looks like exactly yep. what we're going to be doing here. Now, the other uh, kind of fun and fancy play is going for the Doom Guard and that cube. Not able to use the Pact if he had gone for that, but th th that's kind of line would be if uh, if he were actually going for some sort of lethal damage or sadly had to make any trades with that. Ideally not what you want to do in that situation, but uh, yeah, the, the heal, just putting up taunts seems absolutely fantastic against these. And especially on a turn when there is so much overload for Habu Gabu as well. Yep. Habu just smashed end turn with his face and tried to see if it could happen. He had a tiny, <laughs> tiny chance. He, right there, he could have been the first player in Hearthstone history by going to the World Championships by skipping a turn, which would have been incredible <laughs> if it had happened. 
Because reminder, by the way, we probably haven't harped on about this enough. Uh, two players from this Masters Tour now go to the World Championship, both finalists. So we are in semi-finals one. So Habu Gabu is currently a couple of rag shots to the face away from going to the World Championships. And it could have, no matter how unlikely, have happened right there. Is there any sort of trades and defile math here that can happen to clear these Ragnaros oh off the board? It, it's puzzle labs all over again, Dawn. Don't do it, this. It, <laughs> hey, that's why I asked you, because then I wouldn't have to figure it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll no, just let you figure fine. it out. You're learning the host <laughs> role very, very well. Just uh, leave all the hard work to your analysts. Wait, what happened here? Uh, started making trades and is playing the defile. Oh! Oh, just creating his own Ragnaros. Yeah, the defile was literally a whirlwind there, right? Which I'm not sure if that yeah. was just a colossal miscalculation or whether it was just played as a whirlwind. But in the end, Faceless Manipulator on a rag. I think might just be good enough to get there. Not finding burn is Habu Gabu, and unfortunately too low health total himself. That he might just be dying to the Doom Guard here on the backswing. Well. Taking a look at what's left in the deck, I think for spells, it's Flash of Lightning, Pop Up Book, Lightning Bolt, and the Overdraft. I think we're the only spells available uh, that could have gotten drawn off of Cactus Cutter. Hmm. Yeah, Harbu searching for a line. <sighs> Soto also searching for a line. Neither of us finding one. No. And Harbu knows. He'll know the hand. He'll know that there is a Doom Guard being summoned from the hand for free here, no matter what. There is a message to my madness. It is actually significant that the spells did get to get played and give those Cactus Cutters taunt. But there's still so much compiling on the board here. And now the scale replica. How many yeah. dragons have been played? There's a Zarimi coming here, and there's three dragons in hand at the very least, and space for these to be traded into. So I don't think the answer to that question even matters, which is excellent news because I Fair. didn't know. <laughs> Perfect. I think we're doing this uh, very well. Yes, we have I agree. Uh, succeeded in our roles here. There is the extra turn. The answer was four. One needed to get the job done. And now, Pjatnica, if you have any style in your body, you will let Rag finish the job here. Oh my goodness! What are you doing? Come on. Ah, oh, not good enough. Pjatnica, of course, has far more important things to worry about than the uh, whims of a random <laughs> irrelevant caster while he plays for a spot at the World Championships. But come on. Ruining the perfect board with four snakes versus four frogs and not letting Rag finish the game? Come on. I'm disappointed. Ow. It's almost like he's trying to guarantee the win. I don't know. So it's a little weird, but all right. No, uh, very, very nicely played. That was a really interesting game and the uh, really cool to see the kind of uh, callback to that cube as we see the hearth uh, in the replay as well. Man, I really wanted to see this turn end it. It would have been so cool. Oh. Just skip your turn, win the Just... game, go to Worlds, march off into the sunset. <laughs> it would have been glorious, but it was uh, not to be. No. Yeah, I think, you know, I kind of expected when that turned into the cube block hand, I'm going to be honest, I was expecting it to be kind of a walk from Harbu from that point because limited healing, sure, like there was the one dark pact that could give a little bit of a boost, but the fact that you essentially have to AFK your first turn after you get that hand, it's so low tempo for two turns in a row, right? You, you play a six mana 5-5 five, five, and then probably skip your, the rest of your turn while you do that. And then you have to play a, a five mana Skull of the Minari, which is essentially skipping your next turn after that as well, which is what he ended up doing. And still, you can uh, you can start to see 
why that deck was uh, so beloved by so many people for such a long time when it was part of the meta game. If you didn't play it, it was one of the most absurd board tense eras of Hearthstone ever because um, Spreading Plague uh, Druid with uh, Malfurion Hero also existed in the same meta game, so you'd have these weird back and forths where one player would have the potential to spawn like seven doom guards out of carnivorous cubes but there'd be a one five taunt in the way of every single one of them the entire time you'd have these absurd games where there'd be 14 minions in play for 20 straight turns and both decks would go to fatigue uh, it was awesome it was it was a good time an incredibly complex era of uh, of high level hearthstone although the less said about the druid mirrors the better i will just leave it at that yes Yes, let's please not uh, <laughs> talk about that. We don't need <laughs> no. Uh, but we can talk about this Rainbow Death Knight uh, that we will be seeing because that is something that we really haven't gotten to see on broadcast very much at all. No. Only two players did bring it. As you mentioned, uh, one of the um, other matches that uh, it that we talked about it i guess it was banned and then the other one it was played off stream yeah and won the first game and then we came in far way through so it hasn't really uh shown its face but we will maybe see it at some point here but uh, yeah we, we got hit with is... the bait and switch again dawn it's, he's <laughs> queuing up the warrior this time so your oh. narrative your narrative oh, fits no, perfectly no. We might just uh, spend this entire tournament never get, getting a good look at uh, Piatnica's Rainbow DK because it is going to be the Highlander Warrior that comes out to play here. The pure Highlander Warrior uh, that we already saw once. This is a hearthless deck uh, for Piatnica. Look, so I, I was see. just setting up the storyline of it going to game five for us to see the deck. That's, That's what it right. is. Yeah, yeah, 100%. Safety goggles? No. Okay. No. Probably one of the most powerful uses of safety goggles is that it enables you to uh, play stone skin armor for effect very, very early in the game, depending on whether you have the coin or not. But uh, no such luck. Nope. And for Habugabu, the uh, Needle Rock Totem just uh, come down here on turn two. This hand isn't looking incredibly exciting at the moment, but an ancestral knowledge to start drawing some cards, work towards some other things, and it does overload and create the opportunity for a flow rider to come down as well. So there's something. Yeah. Yeah, we've seen Harbu a couple of times already have to go like bolt flow rider on turn two, which is less than ideal, but uh, is yeah. normally a sacrifice that you have to make when you don't get these uh, very, very strong starts with the card draw to get it rolling early. Certainly against Warrior. We are talking about this earlier again. Like This is a very tempo-less version of Shaman now. It used to be against Warrior yeah. that you'd uh, like to curve out with you know, maybe early schooling, into an early Feral Spirits, into uh, Turn the Tides, and just try and keep putting minions in play for the first few turns against Warrior to try and get some chip damage going. You can't really do that anymore. The deck isn't equipped to be able to do that. So instead, you need to just focus on probably just playing a card every turn that uh, draws at least one card. So you can start to turbo through that deck and pick up critical mass of, uh, of burn damage in hand as quickly as possible. Yeah, and it's really interesting with those cards specifically that you mentioned because uh, both the uh, Feral and... Uh... Now I'm just drawing a blank on the other name. Turn the Tides? Uh, turn the Tides, yeah. Yes, okay. Uh, th they're both able to still be discovered, so it's or included in decks if people chose to, but they, they're just not quite in that same vein doing as much as they were. And even being able to uh, take them off of discovers because their cost compared to something like the new card, like pop-up book, I feel like pop-up book just does so much better uh, in terms of being able to create bodies on the board for things like the jive or uh, other synergies like that, that kind of have to be used now that bio uh, is not in standard. Gets hit by the Viper. But you do still get that uh, that one-off discount, at the very least, to be able to work with it. Double lightning reflexes and some spell damage in this hand, by the way, making it 
Not the worst snapshot I've ever seen. And yeah, Hubby Dubby's going to go for it. I wouldn't say this is a dream snapshot, but double reflexes, bolt, and a flash with a spell damage minion. It's probably, you know, the worst spell damage minion that you can have access to. But certainly good enough. Nothing else really to spend mana on effectively here. So I, I respect this. Yeah. Still maintaining this discount. It's very hard to process this, right? That, like, Jazz Base is one of those rare persistent discounts that just last forever until you use it. <laughs> yes. Speaking of things that last forever, are you interested in double battle cries? I'm always interested in double do you know how angry i was dawn when they were like oh uh we're putting bran back in the game i was like, okay <laughs> go on i love bran i love me some bran doesn't matter whether it's standard whether it's battlegrounds i freaking love me some bran tell me more yeah it's a highlander card oh come on what <laughs> you can't honestly i feel so conflicted i cannot stand playing highlander i absolutely adore my battle cries going off twice so I've been I've been in a weird state of flux ever since this card was revealed. Wait, I need to get my Pikachu face ready uh, for response to you saying that you're not a fan of Highlander. <laughs> Hold on, let me get that prepared. Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, I barely ever mention it. You know? so, <laughs> barely. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, speaking of that persistent effect, these spells being. Uh, Next spell, still having that discount, but the Golgoneth just entering hand on curve here for Habu makes this a little bit awkward as well, because ideally uh, you would want to play something afterwards uh, with the Golgoneth having a spell discounted by three, but it's the first spell, right? Ugh. So if he wants to play something first, then the Golgoneth, he doesn't get an additional spell after that. Still going to yep. go for it. Just going to rip the Flash of Lightning. Just gets the discount by one in the end, or uh, essentially wastes the jazz base discount if you want to look at it yeah. that way. But still, very, very powerful turn. Like I said, double reflexes next turn with spell damage, with conductivity. A lot of stuff that can happen. Found pop up book as well off the flash, which you can potentially mm -hmm. make some magic happen now with the Jive Insect. Jive Insect, of course, Fire Spell does not get discounted on the flash turn, but still, everything else yeah. in the hand is going to cost nothing, so. Yeah, and this is kind of that uh, that point that I was alluding to earlier of don't even need to take Feral Spirits, things like Feral Spirits, off of Discovers when you just have Pop-Up Book that's already cheaper. And usually you don't even have to pay for it. It's usually just zero. And even when you do have to pay for it, it's only one and you can usually fit it in pretty easily. Um, oh my gosh, Habu getting very excited here. And rightly so. He has Pop-Up Book, he has Lightning Bolt, and he has uh, yeah. Jive Insect available with a Miracle Salesman for three minions, which is already 29, which means he needs precisely one spell from Lightning Reflexes and a way to kill off this Loot Hoarder for, Luth for Lethal here. One relevant spell from Lightning Reflexes. Those are not relevant. <sighs> no. Yeah, the recognition on the other side, though. Uh, Those are not relevant of... either! No! <laughs> no. <laughs> How, we have seen this so many times, I feel like, of either the players getting to hit like, everything that they wanted off of the Discovers, or nothing at all. There's been, like, no in-between. <gasps> Zapper is huge for next turn, though. He won't have the reflexes, which definitely cuts into the damage potential. But the Zapper coming out in place of the Miracle Salesman for the Triple Rag will represent extra damage with those burn spells. Gotta drop this elixir, right? Yeah, making the board space because this was, sorry, the hand space because this will replace itself in hand. Crash of Thunder will Crash. cost zero already, so he can just rip that this turn to deal with the Hoarder if he wants to. can hold on to it again for next turn, which is probably the smarter play to be able to clear up. Yep, I agree with this. And he just waits, patiently. Uh, 
Ten cards in hand, by the way, mm. and a snapshot still in the deck. Something to yeah. keep an eye on. Absolutely not a mistake. The Reno also going to be available next turn. Can Habu put together enough damage to be able to actually close out this game uh, before it continues going along and this armor gets out of control and Reno is only leaving one board space? So as of right now, it's seven from the two damage spells in hand and then another 24 from the Conductivity and the Aftershock, which is only 31, which is shy of the 41 we're currently seeing, let alone the, what, 46 this is going to go up to. So Habu Gabu, I think, needs to not yeah. burn exactly this, the photo here. Step one complete, and then just try and do this twice over the course of the game. Ooh, okay. Bolt is Actually a nice bolt. bit of bonus damage, yeah. Yeah. So, Counting book is three, up. bolt is four, bolt is four. So that's 11, plus the 24 from the rags, 35. Plus the crash of thunder, 39, I believe, currently. Actually, because it's double flash, you can actually get the Blood Mage Thanos in there as well, which is not damage that I've counted. So that'll add another four total. I'm getting even closer. Is there a way to do anything tricky with the Miracle Salesman to get an extra snake oil out of it and throw that damage as well? I don't think so. No. Alright, here it is. Yep. Conductivity, Jive Insect, transforming these frogs. Notably, also the uh, the board placement. I think you've mentioned a couple times, but yeah, going to transform one of those spell damage minions, but not the one that will give Habu additional draw. Yep. So so easy to get that wrong because you know you're thinking for so much of the turn, you're counting, you're double counting, and then you have to play your turn very very quickly at the end. But Habu still had the recognition to uh, separate the Blood Mage out. Of course, entirely irrelevant in the end because uh, the Reno sweeps it all away without the card draw happening anyway. But just because something works out that way doesn't mean that you shouldn't uh, play your turn correctly. That's what Habu has been doing. Absolutely. So at this point, for Kitnitsa, there has been so much already used from Habu Gabu. Probably does recognize and remember that there is that snapshot at some point in the, either in the hand right now or still in the deck. Uh, you may not know that, but is, is this just a point where he wants to Kind of step oh, back and say, okay, I'm just going to try to stay alive and run you out of resources. Build up as much armor as I can. Yeah, that's definitely the plan, I think, because, um, you know, limited number of flashes mean that the, the damage from the photo is not as explosive as that turn that he just took. So if he can restabilize back up to a very similar health total, then uh, I think Harvey's going to be in trouble. And that turn could not have gone any better. Excavate into Discover the Excavate card to gain double the armor and then also hit the mole, which is one of the best things he could possibly find for potentially soaking up rag shots in the long term as well. Absolutely yeah. huge outcome. And if the goal is trying to add in additional armor or other ways to stay alive, the uh, that bullet from Reno of adding four more armor always, uh, always just helps that little bit extra as well. Yep. Alright, well here so it is, is now. Yeah, that's the one flash that was caught in the photo. Does draw into the remaining zapper, so he has basically the exact same setup as he had on the previous one. And actually, let me correct myself, 
This is potentially still much more explosive than the turn that we just had, because I forgot there were two reflexes shoved in this photo that were used not on the big pop-off turn for Habu Gabu, so this could potentially be ludicrous amounts of damage still, if Habu can piece it together. The problem, though, is the board that can be made on the other side is going to be quite hard to deal with in order to get uh, rag shots to go face, because the, the Azerite Ox is now in hand alongside that Mole, which is so many stats in play. Yeah. What else can be fit into this turn? Just go for the Ox first and see what minions you get. Yeah, for sure, because whether you get rush minions here is going to uh, affect the rest of your play, I think, yeah. There is a rush minion. There is, yep. You just tack with that and you work out what happens later. No one understands how that card works. It, it don't really matter. <laughs> uh, beautifully, beautifully played here as well. Uh, going for the trade getting the Needle Rock Totem to actually come into hand and then clearing off the Salesman with Habu having a full hand, ah! so. Oh God, that's about as bad as it can possibly get. I guess technically Turn the Tides is damage. Oh my God. Oh. No pop-up book. You're going to have to no. find at least one pop-up book here, but you need another AoE as well to be able to sweep this board up. You do have that Aftershocks that Habu Gabu just innocuously took about six turns ago, by the way, <laughs> that could end up being a potentially game-winning card in this position. Like, you can try and say Tumbleweed and just take a clear turn and then reset for a, for a later turn, but I just don't think mm -hmm. that's good enough. I don't think there is a later turn. I think this is the turn that you have to make something happen. Oh god, go. Just go! <laughs> yes. Just go, play cards and hope you end up at Worlds. That's the best I've got for you right now. It sounds like uh, how many people play Hearthstone. Maybe not the Worlds part, but the uh, just play cards and hope. Oh my gosh, did it. Did all of this get played? There's no way. There is no way. No. Absolutely no shot. I am stressed. I am stressed watching this right now. These animations are still going even though the rope died out. And I, I can't tell which way it went based off Habu's reaction. Oh no, he's out! He, so he had pop up book for another four. He had turn the tides for another three, which is a seven. Don't think he had additional damage after that point. There wasn't any damage offered from that last no. discover, so it's not like he roped out a choice that he couldn't pick. So I'm not sure he was getting there either way. Amazing recognition, by the way, to understand that the out was um, conductivity elixir on the opposing minions to, to get three shots at burn. Recognizing that the Jive Insect yeah. wasn't getting there, right? Because there was too many minions on the other side of the board. So burning his uh, his potential win condition with the conductivity to look for burn. And very, very nearly getting rewarded for it. That is really, really good stuff. And the level of pressure that he's under. Yeah, and I think as well, working through that much of the armor, uh, there might not even be the necessity for having the conductivity with the Jive. I uh, might just be able to whittle him down and one Ragnaros may be enough to end it. I think we've seen that a couple times before as well. So yeah, not only that, but just uh, recognizing that uh, you can use it in that case and might not be necessary to uh, use it for some combo. Snake Oil mm. does now seem pretty useless without any spell damage hanging around. Yeah. That mole, as you mentioned, making things a little bit awkward as well for Habu Gabu now. Not able to target that. Doesn't have enough to clear up, even with both Aftershock and Lightning Storm. Still has to deal something else. 
to clear off just the first part of that mole and then still would leave a 3-1 behind. Yeah, you have the uh, the Turn the Tides Rush minion that you could potentially use as well, but it's all just a little awkward. Yeah. Feels like using a lot of resources and committing a lot just to clear off one minion. This is all before he's even seen anything like the uh, Zilliax or the resummoned Zilliax from the boom. Yeah, and he knows, right? Because the um, the town crier is being played. He hit the 25% for the spell damage totem. There wasn't spell damage on board, but hey, at least got a little bit of extra uh, damage push to face there with that snake oil. Somewhat sure. relevant for uh, one. Yeah, smart line as well, because as, as I was about to say, he saw the town crier get played, so he knows uh, summon a copy Zilliax is almost certainly in the hand at this point. It would be an outrageous outcome, like if on whatever we're on, like turn 12, turn 13, Burrow Buster and Zilliax were both still in the deck, and then Town Crier hit the Burrow Buster and not the Zilliax, which is the only outcome that would result with Zilliax not being in the hand right now. So he actually blows up his entire board afterwards to prevent any of the uh, the rush healing coming through. Okay. No armor available with the Reno hero power. And as we can see here, not, uh, not any armor in hand at the moment either. There is a chance for Habu to be able to turn the tides, hit into a minion, clear with lightning storm. And can he, I guess he can't fit in <laughs> the cactus cutter and jive. Now, if he had just had unlimited mana, <laughs> you could be able to clear the board and play just had... in and turn it into Ragnaros. 300 mana and like permanent plus five spell damage at all times, then we'd be in business. That's right. I don't, I don't see how we don't get there with that. <sighs> there is the altered court, which I don't think Piatnica has any information about, but it's just not getting there. Even with the heads-up play from Habu Gabu of removing his own board to play around that lifesteal healing, Piatnica said, you know yeah. what? Lifesteal healing it is anyway. We'll just get it in there. You won't. Uh, those extra Divine Shield minions are resilient. It means that they're not easy to clear from the board, and that means that your rag shot is going to be very unlikely to go face. Obviously, at that point, Piatnica is playing around a couple of unknown discovered cards, like I was talking about, the Altered Chord. That could have been a source of damage for all he knew, right? So he's having to play around a couple of things. Um, just hypothetical sources of damage that he might end up losing to. Uh, the turn the tides kind of thing, a, an extra conductivity that's been discovered that can make three rags instead of one, all that kind of deal. But in the end, just about hanging on in there, both in that game and in this series, which he has been doing for the past two games. And now we come all the way down to match point the way it should be. Semi-finals of Masters Tour Spring, two games to two with a spot at the World Championship directly on the line. That's right. And uh, come full circle, we've gotten to that game number five, which means we will see the Death Knights that I <laughs> mentioned earlier that we weren't sure if we were going to get to see. But this means we will get to see it now. So it is going to be uh, that kind of rainbow Death Knight uh, versus the Shaman, which we have seen struggle. And this is kind of that other line uh, or story that has been talked about a couple of times, right? Is that, sure, it feels great for these players to have to be up 2-0, but that does not count the other player out by any means. Still, uh, still gone to a lot of Game 5s over this weekend. Oh yeah, we've had some uh, some real meaty series. Like even with the, some of the, the quicker ones in terms of score, score line, the 3 zeros and the 3 ones, we've seen... Uh, some very, very long, grindy series, right? Exemplified even by that Bunny Hopper <laughs> series that we were just looking at recently. Yeah. Zero three, where Bunny just absolutely dug his fingernails into the side of the cliff and refused to fall off for the entire series, even though it was uh, was largely one way traffic. But as you uh, set up so eloquently and beautifully early on, 
it is going to be the Death Knight entering the fray for the purposes of the stream for the first time with the Shaman on the other side. And I do think this is a pretty compelling matchup to uh, round things out on because uh, as time has gone on with this Rainbow Death Knight, it's kind of been refined as a more of a pure control deck. Uh, more of an anti-demon hunter deck where it can stall things out uh, with the Quartzite Crusher, for example. Threads of Despair being one of the most efficient removal cards we have ever seen in Hearthstone. Like, just don't even bother counting. Just play the yeah. card and the board disappears. That's how it works. Um, and outside of that, a lot of the outright tempo, like the Corpse Bride, for example, has been cut from the deck. So when you go up against something like Nature Shaman, where your principal job is to generate pressure and slow them down and try and drain damage out of their hand by making them shoot it at minions. There aren't that many cards in your deck that really do that. I think I was talking to TJ about this on day one. I think it's exemplified by the card Mining Casualties. Because if you're playing an aggro deck against Rainbow Death Knight and they play Mining Casualties against you, you kind of just want to concede at that point because they're dominating boards so heavily with that card. Mm -hmm. But if you're playing Shaman, that's zero pressure, right? Like, you can just ignore that and just get on with your life. Um, so I think this is going to be a difficult, difficult deck for uh, Piatnica to try and navigate here. Uh, picking up some of the plagues early on, as you can see there with the down with the ship, might be uh, particularly useful. But I'm not sure whether that's a robust enough game plan to be holding on to here with, uh, with no other real curve going on. So we will see. Whereas Habu Gabu, by the way, fantastic start with the double cactus cutter. Yeah, double cactus cutter on coin as well. Um, yeah, I am really interested to see how this Death Knight deck actually performs because, as you mentioned, it is kind of more of that control style, double threads of despair, all these things going on. But I wouldn't imagine that this shaman is really Oof. the. Uh, matchup that you would want a lot of that removal in. There's not really going to be a lot of boards, maybe a couple boards, but they're already small anyways. Uh, and I guess the the big Ragnaros uh, board at some point for clearing that up would be great. But outside of that, uh, these removal tools don't really seem like they are matched up very well for this matchup. And the Jazz Base as well, the Needle Rock Totem, this is looking like a very good starting hand for Habu. Yeah, mega consolation prize there for Piadnica. He mulliganed away. A uh, The weapon discover, got it straight back, had to take a Staff of the Primus, which, as I mentioned, like getting a decent amount of plagues in the deck is one of the better ways to uh, go about disrupting this Shaman deck. Like I said, you can't really achieve pure board pressure, so uh, plagues are potentially the best thing that you can go for. You can mess with things a little bit with the Frost Plagues, and uh, just by having those extra unique spells in the deck, you can mess with Flow Rider a little bit as well. It's weird, right? Because I've been the number one Plague Death Knight hater for the longest time possible. And now here someone is playing a version of Death Knight that I actually prefer. I think this is a significantly better deck than Plague Death Knight. I think this is a better bring to this tournament than Plague Death Knight was to Worlds, which lots of people brought. And the one game where it's on stream, I'm like, yeah, you just kind of want the play cards and nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. I mean, I completely agree with everything you just said, but also I think that speaks to this matchup especially as well. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I think especially this Jive variant, uh, the Plague, uh, the, or the Unholy Plague, putting a 2-2 mm -hmm. two -two on the board is also pretty obnoxious in some cases as well. Yeah, sure, those 2-2s two can get, um, you know, kind of cleared up easily by like lightning storms or crashes. But I would imagine in this matchup, those types of turns are probably going to be focused on Whoa. trying to end the game rather than clearing a board. But hell yeah on turn four, more, uh, more plagues. This diamond hell yeah too, it is beautiful. Picks up down with the Cygnus as well. And then has the uh, Quartzite Crusher to be able to potentially block, uh, block off a proc of the Jazz base a little bit further yeah. down the line. Could be actually very significant uh, for stalling out that Jazz base, but it could also wait a little while potentially, uh, depending on how many... Uh, overload cards, Habu Gabu ends up actually flying <laughs> here because oh, there's one of those frost plagues already. Well, 
Yeah, it wasn't on my list actually. I mentioned it can mess with Flowrider, but it can also mess with the Cactus Car as well, of course. Uh, makes the the effect of the card uh, unactivatable. It's not like you know if you were to play the next card that's drawn, that doesn't activate the Cactus Cutter. The Cactus Cutter has drawn the Frost Plague, and that cast went drawn, and that does not count as activating it. So you have just played a vanilla tutu. Unlucky. Yeah. Another thing that I think is uh, worth mentioning with this Quartzite Crusher as well is that's just damage that oh, yeah. uh, can be pushed every turn as well. Um, and we've we've kind of spoken to it a lot over this weekend with some of the other matchups where there's these mass amounts of armor or even like maybe some healing but even with some healing uh there's not a ton of healing but some chip damage some weapon damage and plague damage all combined oh! can certainly do a lot why is it a plague uh, frost plague every turn what is happening oh that shuts this turn down so hard as well yeah. You can still go like single flash, pop up book the hell yeah. I Ugh. guess. I do think the uh, frog taunts yeah. here are really interesting as a as a breakpoint for the game plan because they do protect you from the quartzite crusher, right? If you play yeah. them preemptively. Which is a little interesting dynamic that Habu Gabu can <gasps> play no! with here. Oh no. No, going for the tradable first to see what the draw is, and it's another Frost Plague. Absolute disaster. And now he can't even Ugh. weave in that pop up book anymore, no. which means the Quartzite Crusher will be able to lock out this Jazz Base turn. I mean, if we wanted a game five, this is certainly a game five we're getting here. Oh, and there, there is that Quartzite Crusher, the attack from the Helia. Sure, squeeze in a hero power as well. Uh, all of a sudden, this Death Knight is no longer a control deck. It Ooh! is an aggressive deck. Another Frost Plague! Oh, I can't even. I cannot even right now, <laughs> Saddle. Okay, it does hit Bolt this time, though. Things are looking up for Habu Gabu. Okay, another Lightning Bolt as well. Oh, he's going to play the Flow Rider. At least with this, it is a discover and not just an automatic draw. So if there is a plague, there's two plagues. <laughs> you just pick the non-plague card. Perfect. Okay. <laughs> Easy choice. Yeah. Double plague and a card that's just going to draw you more <laughs> plagues, though. Probably not what uh, Habu Gabu yeah. had in mind no. for that discover. You gotta drop a pop-up book here. It is absolutely mandatory to try and block this damage and prevent the freeze on the following turn. Oh! oh no. <laughs> okay, good ordering though, because this way, yeah, this is good. This is really good actually, because if he hit either the uh, Unholy Plague or the Frost Plague, he's able to clear both of those with the Crash of Thunder, because I believe it still would have cost zero, even through the Frost Plague. And if it summons the 2-2, it gets caught up in the AoE anyway. So that was really, really nice ordering at the end of the turn from Habu Gabu. And I, I was going to mention that there really isn't uh, things like the Threads of Despair that we mentioned earlier, but uh, not really as much removal. And then there is an Army of the Dead that is drawn off the top. Uh, could just go for the Rainbow Seamstress and a Hero Power, I suppose, to try to clear a couple of things and still be able to uh, smack that quartzite into Abu Gabu's face to prevent that jazz base uh, weapon, but board seems good. Getting a couple things yeah. on board here. Yeah, board seems good. It's just a matter of whether you value that uh, lifesteal or not. Just to try and get you out of mm -hmm. range, right? You're getting the lifesteal from the weapon. Do you want the lifesteal from the rainbow seamstress as well? Now, even if there is a Three minion Ragnarok. Oh, oh my no! Another frost plague. Oh, it just killed him! It just killed him! 
I take it back. Like I don't want eight. a game five. <laughs> that was like eight <laughs> plagues in three turns. That is absolutely I outrageous. <laughs> Sometimes uh, we see games like that, and I, I just, wow. I, I think for me right now, the thing that's that's getting me is. This was not just a game of Hearthstone. In this case specifically, this was also for a spot at Worlds. Absolutely incredible. <sighs> was that four consecutive turns of Frost Plagues? Yes, with like multiple other plagues put in there as well, and like the worst possible outcome from the Flow Rider as well, that wasn't straight up just the three different varieties of plague. So many things had to go right for uh, Piatnica to get that to line up at the end. But you know, this is this is not a burial of Piatnica. Like several things had to go oh, very yeah. wrong for him at the beginning of the series to be in that position to to start with. Um, and he's played excellently to get to this spot at the start, but oh my goodness, that is a brutal outcome. But sometimes Hearthstone just does end up being like that. To go, you know, discover weapon, hit the weapon, hit the hell you're on curve, hit down with the sickness as well for basically maximum number of plagues in the deck as fast as possible. And then on top of that, having the weapon to freeze the jazz base and then having the clear for the taunts from the frog, right? Which uh, which meant that the the freeze could um, keep going on the following turn as well, get that yeah. life steal through as well. Inc absolutely incredible finale coming all the way back from 0-2 to 3-2 and becoming our first yeah. player making it to the World Championships this time around. Huge, huge congratulations to Piatnica coming out of nowhere to take it down in this tournament. Yeah, yeah, completely agreed. Uh, Pietnitsa played incredibly well, uh, and especially into the Shaman that was last, that uh, lineup seemed incredibly interesting. Uh, I also wanted to point out that in that lineup of his, there what, are no speaker stompers. So that's kind of been another one of those things that we've been mentioning a lot uh, over the weekend is all of these players bringing things like speaker stompers or expecting a ton of speaker stompers or even specifically Shaman. And he just went three games in a row beating Shaman without those at all. So incredibly, incredibly well played. And congratulations to him, as you mentioned, on making it to Worlds. We're going to see him again in a little bit, uh, competing for just some additional cash prize and to see if he can take this whole tournament down and be crowned the spring champion but we do still have one more match to go before we get to that point so don't go anywhere we'll get into our second top four match right after this
Hello, everybody, and welcome back to the Hearthstone Masters Tour Spring Championship. It's time for semifinals number two. My name is TJ. I'm joined by Lorinda. Lorinda, it's been a day of Hearthstone. There's just been Hearthstone over there. There's been Hearthstone over there. We just watched Hearthstone. There's Hearthstone ahead of us. There was Hearthstone yesterday and the day before. We've had a, we've had some Hearthstone. Would you agree? We have had a whole lot of Hearthstone, TJ. And we've had even more Hearthstone today because it, it keeps going 3-2 by the feel of it. We've had comebacks. We've had comebacks. And we've had people trying to come back and not making it. And we had Hearthstone everywhere you look. And there's more Hearthstone coming up, as you said. And we're going to have some customized Hearthstone here for WeQ because he's playing that custom Warlock that I love so much. Uh, he's going shopping. He, he's going to hit people with armor. It's going to be great. Yeah, it's going to be opening with the Odin Warrior, which we've see, actually seen quite a bit of uh, today. We've seen a little bit of a mixture of the uh, true uh, Highlander Warrior, uh, in, in, especially in that last series. Um, and then we've also seen Insane, who's running the Warriorless lineup. Uh, ha has been having success with it, though. So, got to commend him for that effort. Um, and just the, the sort of fat... Uh, lineup overall. So there's the custom warlock. A um, lot of, lot of custom. Yeah, going so you on customize there. some opponents with a, with a custom warlock. You just customize your health total down to ten or so. Then you just play a load of big things. Then you customize your opponent's health total down to zero, and they get customized and they die. Yeah, as we've had some highlights uh, from this deck throughout the weekend. It goes fast one way or the other. Um, both custom and so when I was preparing my notes for this match, uh, Nature Shaman through, have been so, Habu, some Gabu, very fast games, some very slow games. But let's jump into it. We Q, opening hand. Nah. <laughs> no. Not, not the things you're Say an opening for. hand. Nah, okay. Yep. Uh, yeah, a lot better. A lot, lot better. Malefic Rook uh, is big. There was um, a point very large during the the Habu match when Habu was two zero up when I was okay, going to make a point opening that he was for insane here. Got flame imp. Gonna need the payoff cards sooner rather than later. So I was making the point that um, I, don't, I don't know who heard me. I don't think TJ can hear me. Can you hear me now, TJ? Just going to check. Of course, it's easy. I can hear you now. Okay, but good. Um, yeah, well, so I was making the point that um, when okay. Habu was 2-0 up, Wiku looked like he was going to be the only remaining warrior in this tournament. But then you know, Habu didn't win in the end after that marathon series. And it came back to 3-2. And now we have lots of warriors. But the warrior has done badly in this tournament is the point I'm going to make. And so I think we should focus on how the warrior does. And talking of which here, it's tempting for Insane just to play the, the Treant and the Neophyte and say, hey, you can't warrior these things, and I've got some stuff going on. And they can coin out a speaker stomp of the turn after and do it again. I like it. Now I'm afraid to talk, because now I'm afraid I won't hear you again, and then we're going to talk over each other. That's fine. If we both talk, we're going to talk at the same side. We might say something useful between us. Or if we both talk at the same time, nobody's going to understand either what either of us is saying. And that's just a benefit to both of us. Yes. And he is going for this line. Do you coin out the Stomper next turn as well? Just insert another eight. Uh... Obviously, you should play the Rook, really. Yeah, I think it's probably got to be Rook. This protects this board. It doesn't let Wiku go for any type of setup. Ah, this is a tough choice between the Forge and the, uh, the Needle Rock Totem. But going for Needle Rock Totem, next turn probably going to be um, Craft some Hammer, start getting those swings in. Do it insane! Just coin out the Stomper and start customizing. I don't think ah, that's the right play. I think, I think you play the Rook. <laughs> It's hard enough to deal with, right? And it, it, 
expanded your game plan. Means you can stomp into Popgar with coin the turn after the, the stomping. That sounds pretty good too. Yeah, going to insert 10 and also Stomper and then Pop Gar Coin and, and Double Sludge would be 8 more. There's a lot of damage coming in here. You just go for it with a Stomp. Yeah, this is a very big board to protect. Turn down that racket. Blade Storm's no good against this either. Yeah, could just go bellowing flames on the speaker stomper, but ooh, this the health is split. Yeah, not, not in a great way. Do it. So if if you go if you attack into the treant with the hammer and then bellowing flames on the speaker stomper, you're likely to kill the flame imp and just leave uh five damage on board. Right? You know what five and eight is, TJ? Thirteen. Uh it, it, if, Oh no, this is Garen. Uh, no, it's not guaranteed. No. If the fight close, if close attack lives, the game is over. And Wiki would have been at 14. That was the case. Because oh. you would have attacked, you would have attacked into the treant. Um. Yes, yes. So it would have been slightly off. Now what do you do? Now I think you have to geode and hover. To see where you're at, and then maybe furnace fuel. Yeah, geode happens first, though. I definitely agree with that sentiment. Well, now we can frack for some more stuff. There's some stuff. Oh my goodness, there's so much stuff. Oh, ah, uh, ah. I want to take the symphony and not. Take I want to take this. Am I crazy? Yeah, I want to take the symphony too. The symphony gives you a little bit more longevity in the game, right? There we go. <laughs> the extra projection is from the furnace field that was discarded, of course. <clears throat> Just an extra 8 7 of stats. Yeah. Sanitize will clear this up, though. Uh, no, it won't. Not quite, because it's not forged. So silly. Gonna have to be the brawl. And if it's brawl, that's game no matter what, right? Right, yeah. You'll have to target. Uh, oh no, you get the plus three from the armor from the attack, so. Oh yeah. <clears throat> Not quite. Oh, it's so close though. Oh my god. Oh, goodness. there we go. So you Symphony first, in case you want to deal six. Do you ever want to deal six? Can you take four from a warrior? I don't think you can. I don't think you can take mm. four. Um, no, you can. Maybe you I'm want to pop Gar here. Get the eight into the head while you can, and then the Symphony can do six the turn after. Yeah, Verse Riff and Craftsman would be uh, the danger. Oh, you can just... Oh! It's tough. The Lifesteal one, uh, well, the, the six to face is good, but six, six repeating is probably better. Yeah, I don't think there's a way out for weak you here. Yeah, we've seen this a few times this tournament actually, TJ. When, when there's no way out for the warrior, let oh, them shield hit you slam! And get as much as you can. Oh my goodness! There is a way out. There's always a way out. Yeah, just just take some damage. Is is the way out? Remove are the top you, six card cards from burner? your opponent's deck. <laughs> no, <laughs> just gets them closer to Reno being active. Uh -huh. <laughs> So close to lethal because that spirit bomb removes the 
thing that is in the way of the sludge. So, 14 available for Insane here. Feels like it's been like that every turn. One short, four short, three short. Four to six, six is what I want to do. And I want to run it into the two, two just to play around sort of Blade Storm stuff. Yeah, that makes sense. Back to you, Wiki. Have you got a way out this time? TJ says there's always a way out. Goggles, good start. I think you might be right, TJ. I think there might always be a way out. So much on the line. Uh, trial by fire would be a fantastic yeah. way out here. There's two in the deck. So, you know... There it is. And with the discount, playable this turn. So it'll clear things up. They do all get removed. They one, two, three onto the left hand one, then the four. Four, 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 four and then five. Box. So they do all die. Yep. But that's perfectly fine. Uh, it's not perfect. It is okay. Um, there's, not, there's not much big stuff left. The, the remainder of the sym symphonies, one Molten Giant's gone. There's an Imprisoned Horror left since the uh, first one was uh, used with the Projectionist. Um, We're two mana off lethal this time. With Popgar for eight and then the symphony and then the with movement and then the um, spirit bomb. <laughs> Zero mana. <laughs> That's funny. What would the movement do? Oh, I thought it was a six damage movement. Sorry, has he already used that? No. It's in the deck. Oh, he hasn't used it. Okay, I thought he had it in his hand. My bad. Good question. It was one of the original choices, but went with the, the uh, yeah. uh, Reborn Demon instead. Yep, yep, yep. My bad. <clears throat> so, yeah, it was miles off lethal then. My bad. Alright. So, like you say, there's not much big stuff left. Okay, shield block is good. Yeah, Wiki looking a lot more confident than he was a few minutes ago. I'm not surprised. Starting to feel like Insane has run out of stuff here. Yeah, could keep it simple and just go Craftsman Hammer plus Bladestorm. I mean, the more that Insane gets damaged, the closer Wiki is to just finding Lethal with just Odin plus Swing with the hammer. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, it doesn't take much. Yeah. Oh no. No, there's nothing there. Okay, 5-5, okay. five, five, and another 5-5. Five, five. Everyone gets a 5-5. Five, five. He's getting towards the point where he's just going to rip the movement at some point um, because he can and just see what happens just in case, I think. Uh, yeah. Because the warrior does use I'm... all of its cards, so burning stuff is sort of relevant. Yeah. I believe Verse Riff off the top. Okay, it's not Verse Riff. Verse Riff off the top would have been lethal because you can Odin Verse Riff, and that's exactly 10. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's so stupid. Hasn't touched it a single time this game. And just has a, a random lethal out. <laughs> oh, this Warlock deck makes me so happy to watch. Oh. I 
Okay. Probably just keep it simple and sanitize, right? Yeah, just just don't die and you're probably fine. I mean, you could even forge it just for the extra three. Yep. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, when it looked like he had no outs a few turns ago, all he did was basically leave the minion up that he couldn't deal with and just gain as much as he possibly could. That was his decision. Yep, and now it is lethal presented next turn. Don't play with that just card. Odin. That card kills you. Don't play that one. You can play I, this don't, one. I don't think there's anything left for Insane to even have a shot at this. Gain a tiny bit of life here. Yeah. It was all going so well. But it is going yeah, well just for Weezy right now. Loaded. Yep, there it is. You can't kill me from 25, you random assortment of minions <coughs> and silly spells. I'm just going to kill you instead. Yeah, weak you with the, the celebratory drink that we see so often from players. Taking this 1-0 lead, TJ. Um, weak you sort of struggled a little bit last year, I felt, with Masters Tours. It was his first really prominent season, uh, getting a lot of finishes on ladder. <laughs> but this time around, looking a lot more confident, a whole year's experience behind him, and going to go within two games of reaching the World Championships and reaching this final, which is a big deal as well. People like to win things. As he takes this very quick 1-0 lead. And the Warrior is out of there. And that's a big deal too. Because Warriors have been struggling in this event so far, I feel. The I think the Odin Warrior uh, specifically has had some, some rough games against Tempo decks. Despite having all removal, they have no proactive gameplay. Um, <clears throat> and then they're, once they get to a certain point, we've seen like not active Renos so often. It feels like in times when they're desperately needed, um, but you know that's you're, you're playing that deck for the consistency of the removal and the armor gain for the Odin as your win condition later on. So very nicely done by Weak You, spacing out the removal, uh, that that <sighs> solving the puzzle of how to deal with that kind of final push from Insane. Yes, it wasn't the final push, but it ended up being the final push because once the mana unlocks <clears throat> for the Warrior. Yeah, so, so many things uh, start to come online. So, a nice little game one victory there. Now <laughs> he's got to play this deck again. This deck is so stressful to play. Wait till It'll you see the mirror warlock. later. <clears throat> yeah, it's it's over on turn four. Whoever sticks the board first wins. Yeah. This is going to be great. It's like, oh yeah. Got to reduce your health total down to zero. What, you reduce it down to 15 yourself? Oh no, and now I'm dead? Yeah, it's, it's so silly. But the Shamans as well into the, the Warlocks also. Actually very interesting as a matchup. Um, as is the Mirror. Because the Warlock has got some game there. But if they go too far, they just get like triple bolted in the face. And that's the end of the game. Uh, but Shaman versus Shaman, we've seen quite a lot of this. And it's tough. It's like this game of chicken, waiting to... Um, trying to force your opponent to, to pop off and fail, so you can beat them. A weird game of... Nature chicken. Nature chicken. The chickens are pretty natural, to be fair. Yeah, it is a an arms race a lot of the times, just who can get who can get the goods the fastest. Um, but yeah, a game of chicken where yeah you're trying to say, all right, I just flash a lightning. You got to go right now, or else I'm gonna I'm gonna beat you. And then the other player saying, you know what? I don't believe you. I don't believe you have enough damage. So I'm gonna flash a lightning too. Now you got to yeah. beat me. Yep. Insane has a very, very slight edge, in my opinion, because he is playing the the more standard version, if there is such a thing in the deck, the, the spell damage version. 
Uh, we keep playing the Jive version, which is just a little bit more clunky in the mirror. But basically, it's a mirror with nothing in it. Does mean that Insane is, is likely to win just a little bit more because he's just got a little bit more consistency in the deck. <laughs> yeah. I think I like the Lightning and Reflexes here. Because guess what? Lightning reflux Reflexes could be Pop-Up Book and Lightning Bolt at the same time. <laughs> I it does you, go with the Pop-Up Book. The best infinite yeah. yeah. You, you gotta just have faith. Pop-Up Book's a more consistent option. Damage. There was a 3-3 three, three that let you get a spell and then you could get another spell. You always explained how it was infinite damage. That was a card. I forgot, <laughs> but it was my favorite card. <laughs> I don't remember what it was. 3-3 three, three Person of Doom, I think it was called. Pretty sure that was it. Right, yeah, so there's... I think you're right. Do you want to um, just try and make a little board here? You know, a little pop-up book, play another zapper, <laughs> chip a bit of damage off your opponent? Hope they don't crash you I... or lightning storm you? I don't want to play the uh, other zapper. Um, I think a trade and then maybe, maybe oh, flow rider. Hmm. You could pop up book just to preserve the board. However, yeah, yeah. just to be able to uh, potentially stick this five, uh, which is important. Yeah, it's so important, right? If if you can get your opponent down to twenty and you're on thirty, that. That little game of chicken I was talking about, suddenly you don't mind being the one that goes first because you just kill them. Yeah. <clears throat> Alright, flash. And then a pop-up book on the Nava Zapper. A lot of story time going on right now. Yeah, a lot of frogs. <laughs> Ooh. Does the, does the giant taunty frog has anything from WoW lore? Is that a thing? Giant taunt frogs? Are they are they existing in WoW? The storm is in me. Um, the, the spell Hex yep. came out in like a later expansion of WoW. It's a sha it is a shaman spell in the game. Does it frog you? Yeah, t Hex turns something into a frog for a limited amount of time within the game. Can you turn things like smaller than a frog into a frog to make them like feel like they're big? No, because the frog a is really small. Into a frog to make it huge. I actually think you can. Yeah, there are like little bugs in the game that are just neutral creatures that I'm pretty sure you can hex. I don't remember though. It's been a long time. Just give them a promotion. Isn't that nice? <laughs> so nice little bugs. They can become frogs for the day. Yep, insane going to just make more stuff. He needed to get that spell damage on the board so he could uh, operate the second flow rider, trying to build a hand of some sort to go with that flash that he has. But not much doing on his side. On the other side, WeQ, obviously far more cards in hand because he hasn't been doing as much, but he's facing down seven damage on the board, which is an amount of damage. <laughs> It is. Uh, yep, that is correct. It is an amount. This is tough because you, you don't want to use too many resources, but you kind of have to. Okay, there's a crash. That's good. You never know what to do when your opponent plays flash on four. You're assuming you're just cycling, but you might. You flash play. also. Yeah, you have to, I think. But the hand just isn't conducive to it. You might have to flash just to draw something. Though. Which makes me wonder if he's actually going to play the elixir instead. Because if you're flashing to draw and you don't think you can win, you might as well elixir and just try and get stuff that way. Or just totem, nope, nope. sure. Any 
Yeah, the elixir, I don't think you want to use it in case weak you does end up putting some damage into face, like with Crash. You want to be able to heal that back up. Okay. Is <laughs> it conductivity and yeah. pop-up book? No, nah, conductivity amphibious elixir. Yeah, yeah, to draw three cards. It's tucked right? on over there. Yep. It's whenever you play a minion, you get a shot, you get a random shaman spell. Oh, I know what you mean. Yeah. Oh, pretty, pretty bad. Not really going his way on those, but now he's gonna get a load of <laughs> random stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, chill vibes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, this game's gonna go forever, isn't it? <laughs> oh, just, the, cho the, the choosy healing. spell. <laughs> oh, another elixir. <laughs> oh, what did you do on your flash turn? Well, I generated some people um, and healed and my hand was still the same at the end of the turn, but it then became full of complete rubbish. Oh, what a pickup, oh, though. Oh, my god! Insane with the Titan. So, Wikiu did pick the, um... Was it Digging Straight Down? Is that what the card's called? Yeah. Um, I think so. The like, damage excavated treasure. I'm guessing with the intention of answering a Titan if it were to come out. <clears throat> I don't think you can leave this these um Nama yeah. Sappers up. I think the question for Insane is what do you do at Oh 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 just gonna go crash here? Sure. Is that what we're doing? Yeah. So right, what, okay. what you were alluding to, right? You were thinking about going for the leaving at the zappers was something you wanted to try and do and then realize you couldn't and just um draw three <laughs> and play flash, was that your plan? And then you say well you, you uh, just that that, that was away. Yeah, that was like the greediest play, right? Then you go to the next next one, which is all right. Just play Titan and deal three heal. And then if it, the next level to that is, well, if I do that, do I just amphibious elixir to heal back up to max, or do I use flash of flash of lightning and go for a turn like that next turn? It looks like insane with the way this hand is right now. Really wants to draw uh, with this Golganeth. And so if you really want to draw with the Golgoneth, you can't use the last turn because you can't leave the Zappers up. So you got to clear with the Crash first and then use the, the Golgoneth to draw this turn. So I went yep. through like four layers of thinking there. Yep. And he so went through the flash same layers, and then draw three. a little quicker. And he, he got to this. And now he's going to yeah. do the thing that we talked about. Presumably. Yeah. If he thinks he's not dead from 23, which he shouldn't be. This represents some damage, but if you're going to draw your three cards... If you tradable into one of them first and then draw three, obviously you get a lot better hand. So yeah, he's going to go for that. Good choice. Sure. Off you go. Be sat on the flash. Oh, the rock! the best treasure I think the only better one would be the uh, discover two into spell damage additional spell damage discover the free two cost card uh-huh <clears throat> reflexes off the top I just want to pack the house right there <laughs> <laughs> just Perfect look at mana. the numbers in the corner no one... unless it's five and it's crashed then you might have to think about it numbers how much did he doesn't have a whole lot yet eight nine thirteen yeah, it's really not that much it really isn't no it's just it's just not worked out for him at all has played another flash I think so and if you ship it, Wiku's hand is just all healing. <laughs> yeah. And he's shipping it.
Weapon swing? Yeah, okay. Weapon swing and in that overdraft out of the way as well. <laughs> Weak is like, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wait till you see this, though. Oh, there's. Well, there can be overload. Pop up book's really annoying, isn't it? It's just so difficult to um, get around. Yeah. I think um, the, the longer this goes, obviously it favours Wikia because he's got the um, the jive ability as well. So he starts getting two ways to win the game at some point. Insane's deck must have um, another reflexes in. So obviously critical that he wins this one to avoid going two zero down. You don't get don't get many reverse sweeps, although we did just have one in the other semi final. 19? Can you do 19? It's plenty. Reflexes! Let's go! Yeah, what do you want to do? Do you want to fizzle and try and do it all again next turn, or do you want to just go and save for three mana? Six cards left in deck. But these are not really good fizzle cards. I guess the reflexes. It's just is the decent. reflexes, really. And I guess the elixir. But other than that, I don't know. I don't want to even want these. I don't want needle rock totems. It's too late for needle rock totems. We've got six cards left. Well, we could play one of the needle rock totems. Give it a bit. <laughs> and we would, I think, in fact. Trying to insta hit it. <laughs> so there's a reflexes and a thalnos and a snake oil in there when it comes back. The rest is irrelevant. The elixir, I guess. Sure. Just a couple altered chords. <laughs> yeah, what are you going to do? Heal yourself to death? Yeah. <laughs> Just keep back going. To, back to 30. Push a little bit of damage. Back to 32, actually. <laughs> and sticks these minions on the board. This is a lot to get through for Insane. Yeah, he's going to need to crash off these reflexes, and then he's going to need something else from the, the second time around when he gets the snapshot. There's the snapshot. He's just got to go. Huh. There's six cards in the right. He copied one of the um, totems, which again was something he didn't have to do. Seems like he wanted to for the extra stuff. Okay. This is why Shudder Block got dropped, by the way, for the, the triple fizzle. Because you never get it done. All right. Reflex is number two. It's not enough, is it? No. It's just not hitting good stuff. Well, that was quite a lot of stuff, but it just wasn't all the stuff. <coughs> Nobody drew damage. They just still got a healing. It's not helped anybody. Pop-up book is damage. It is. 
It's just a fatigue war. This is bizarre. I don't know how much overload is in this. Uh... <clears throat> it's in this jazz base. But it looks like we Q's going for it. Yeah. He'll know a lot more about what's going on in the hand than, um, than you'd expect There's as well, because obviously he'll have deck tracker running. Uh, he'll have better calculations on whether he's just going to get there over a couple of turns. He clears these boards up. He's got the jive insect combo next turn to just win. He doesn't die. I don't think. Yeah, I don't think he needed a pop up book there. So now it's going to be no. harder to create minions. This is kind of it for insane. Yep. It's got to be once started. upon a time. <laughs> the once upon a time is the only one. I guess yeah. wish upon a star could be Kill good also, totem. but <laughs> you can yeah. yourself a billion. <laughs> yeah, right. Once upon a time. Took the real card. By real card, I mean not really a real card. There's just nothing going on <laughs> for no. either player, really. Overdraft, that's some damage, sure. Uh, what's was... the last spell in the deck? Lightning, Lightning Bolt. Bolt. Is that Could enough? <laughs> That's it. it. There's a crash. Um, plus one spell damage can you, available. Can you just go lightning bolt? <laughs> Overdraft, crash. And then next turn you have five from hand. Put me down, oh, swing, snake oil, snake oil. Yeah. Push the five. Push the five. Could be seven with the spell power totem. Literally nothing left. Three Needle Rock Totems that do nothing. Once Upon a Time, I can't... Oh, what, what could come out from Once Upon a Time? He get like... I don't know. Yeah, I was going to say, he can also just win in the Fatigue War, but because he's so far ahead, but there's all this healing still... Hanging around from about turn five in Weak U's hand. Ah, oh, Weak U. Could have excavated his way to victory by now, I think. Well. Jazz base. You hit with the jazz base. Pack the house. <laughs> I think so. Lightning bolt first. Pack the house, but yeah. Smack and pack the house. Yeah, I think you might. You might. He's gonna save as much life as possible, but it should have almost perfect information outside of the one discovered spell. Yeah. Got him enough overload at this point to pack the house. Realizes it's not needed, and that should do it. Weeku should be going two up in the series unless something crazy happens from the once upon a time. Um, oh. well, there's a board. <clears throat> Protect your face from Ragnaros. It's fine. The rest of his hand is all card draw. <laughs> I mean, there's no way this is enough. <laughs> you just ship everything, yep. Yeah, yeah. Because this is the only time we're ever going to have Blood Mage plus Spell Damage Totem. State of this hand... All right, you're at 13. Let's go. Back in the house. That's... Mm, oof. There's <laughs> um, conductivity bolt in some worlds here. Just to remove stuff. I mean, conductivity plus um, 
jive is <laughs> the same, <laughs> kind of. I guess. Except it can yeah, go yeah, face. Yeah. yeah, no, you're right. In a weird way, it's the same. It, it'll kill two things all of the time. Yeah. It's actually only, it was, there was that play with Habu Gabu earlier where he had to um, hit face on a full board twice. And I, I worked out at 4.3 or 4.6%. I've got it somewhere stored. So this is more like 10%, I guess. To, to miss twice. But yeah, there you go. They're doing their job. That should wrap it up. Absolutely should do. No way out of it now for Insane. Yeah. He gives it up. Uh, Riku's on the cusp of making it to the World Championships. Again, fairly mediocre last year in these tournaments after his first year of doing really well on ladder. We've seen players time and again, TJ, do that, right? Going right the way back to Frozen, Crane, Muzzy. They're all ladder grinders to start with. And then it sort of all took, took them a year or so to get going, and then boof, top players. Boom! Yeah, a very bizarre game of Nature Shaman vs. Nature Shaman, but that's supposedly the game of of chicken you were mentioning, where you don't have perfect, you no longer really have perfect information because of all the discovers that happen, um, uh, like with Amphibious Elixir. And just the random nonsense that can happen throughout the uh, the game, and especially there, weak you double altered chord and chill vibes uh, was the amount of healing. I I don't blame Insane for popping off when he did, because usually that damage will stick, or at least most of that damage will stick. And maybe yeah. you have amphibious elixirs, which will heal back up a little bit. But Insane had plenty of damage throughout that game, dealt so much damage when everything was said and done, but it just ended up not being enough. So 12 healing from from Altered Chords, uh, another 8 from Chill Vibes, that's 26 from the Titan, that's 26. Um, what, was it two Amphibious Elixirs played? Uh, so 36. Yeah. Uh, 36 health healed. That's a lot. Oh, oh here we go, Talking we got it! Health. We got the match. Someone, TJ, is going to get customized. And if WeQ customizes insane, WeQ goes to the World Championships. And gets to the final. Like It's a big deal. Getting to the final, winning a big tournament. Um, should not be understated as well. Uh, Sotomay made a very right. good point earlier. Like With so few tournaments now, you don't get many chances to be a champion anymore. So, yeah, it's a, a rare specimen that you really want. I think you just keep the flame in. Fracking is the maybe for me. Uh, I think the forge is too slow if you if you whiff. Stomp is definitely too slow. Fracking can tidy up your hand nicely. Yeah, okay. Yeah, I was thinking one of fracking or forge of souls you keep just because you kind of need a bailout. Um, this is a great hand, and Insane missed the uh, the one drop here. So, well, Insane has a pretty good hand too, assuming mm. no other spells drawn, uh, because Charlie Problem into f Furnace Fuel uh, would also be a a great tempo swing. So you always draw Spirit Bomb. It always happens. <laughs> Deck is hard coded that way. Trust me, I played it enough. Okay. Or don't trust me. Maybe I'm a liar. Oh. Horror on turn two. Yep. That could be it. Seriously, that could just be it. Like, not immediately necessarily, but... Trolley problem's good. This card is a furnace fuel. Let's you. Oh, it didn't take out oh. the horror. I mean, we ha we can see perfect exactly. information, but. Oh my goodness, oh, TJ! Oh, no, it's gonna be. Shh. 
three five fives. Oh no! Insane is gonna get customized, and Wiki is gonna go to the finals and to the world championships. I'm pretty sure. Just uh, throw you... in a blood treant. Yeah, but you treant, and then you can um, celestial the treant, and then you can play the other treant, and then you can play the giant and the five five. I want to do that. That's what I want to do. I want to have an 8-8, eight, eight, a 5-5, five, five, a 2-2, two, two, and another 2-2, two, two, and a 3-2, and the 5-5 five, five already have, and clear the board and say, beat that. Yeah. Nope, I like it. Oh, no, it's just going to go for... Doesn't want to be at 9, I guess? <laughs> huh? Sure. Fine. Okay. <laughs> if I did this on stream, I'd be called a coward by everybody, including Sottle. But to be fair, with a chance to go to the World Championships, very, very, very close. It, it is easy just to say, okay, nine might be terrifying, but this isn't. Weak, you could barely... Bear the pressure, he's pacing around his room, TJ. Again, last year he sort of struggled in these events, but here's his chance to go to the World Championships and the final of the event. He's come a long way in a year of competitive Hearthstone, and he cannot look at the screen. He probably needs to, to finish the game, but, you know. He knows it's so close, he just can't look. He's just listening to the sound <laughs> effects to hear what's played. He knows it's a fracking, he knows that there's outs possibly here for insane, but they must be so slim. I'm racking my brain trying to find, like, you know, perfect combination of cards any way out of this. Yeah, you've got to set up counter lethal and clear. You've got to be able to play, like, two Molten Giants somehow. You just can't do it, I don't think. Yeah, and insane's going to be at one. This 17 damage minions, on the board. Please. Like half, like half the deck can't even. Exactly. Insane's hope is that like that weak you damages himself down to four. Yeah, and then <laughs> and so then he then he can pop gar forge trade off the two two yeah. and then weak use the lowest health minion on board. You know. Yeah, that's funny. Uh, there's, a, there's Symphony as well, which is something Wiki would have been scared of to, to no degree, but yeah. Symphony doesn't end it. That's why you need to put the 8-8 eight, eight on the board, I guess. Or you, you end it yourself with Symphony. Wiki is pretty sure he's going to the World Championships, but here comes the Giants, and there's a lot of them. Just to make him sweat also, that a little bit more. You can also play Zilliax. Yep. So you can trade off two of these and play Zilliax. Uh-huh. Is the lifesteal Zilliax, just to be clear? Oh, I can't do this. There's no board space for the Zilliax if you do this. Or you could trade off the Molten Giant first. We've created a temporal yeah, so you do this. Then Zilliax. Then trade off. Then Molten Giant again. Is he alive? Is he alive? No, he'd be exactly dead. Exactly dead. Yeah, trade to Zilliax and still hits. Yep. Protect. Exactly dead. Oh. Yeah, they've both just seen it now. Insane salutes. Goodbye. We will see Insane again. He has blessed this tournament with um, a lot of exciting stuff. But we Q. Last year struggled a little bit, using that experience to an advantage now. Gets himself to the final, gets himself to the World Championships, TJ. And he's put in a lot of work for that. He's got a lot of first place ladder finishes. And I'm, I'm glad to see him get there. Sorry for insane, but he'll be back, I'm absolutely sure. Yeah, very impressive uh, turn of performance by insane, but Weak You. Oh, it makes me stressed just watching Weak You. So many times, especially over the course of today, in the quarterfinals and semifinals that we watched from Weekyu, where Weekyu just left. <laughs> <laughs> 
just got up and couldn't even watch the screen uh, mm. because of how stressed. Yeah. Like, oh. and, and then waiting for the one answer that he knew was there. And like I said, I was racking my brain for the ideal situation for Insane. This was probably it. Uh-huh. Right? This was an insane turn by every account. In a single turn, Insane was able to make four 8 8s <laughs> rush two of them, get I'm a free 4-5 lifesteal with rush <laughs> to effectively gain 10, and still was exactly dead. Like, by all accounts, that's the most insane turn possible, but just fell a little bit behind, and that's the nature of that matchup. It's on a knife's edge, right? Yeah. And same as on the play, but didn't have a, a, a minion to put on the board first. Whether if it was Blood Treant or Flame Imp, couldn't get a minion down first, and the amount of tempo that Wiki was able to generate very quickly in the game, um, you can capitalize on, on those types of misses from your opponent so fast on Custom Warlock, and you just have no time to recover because all of your strategy revolves around damaging yourself. If your opponent has tempo, if they're playing big stuff first, you can't even damage yourself because then you're going to be the one to, to, to die first. So um, uh, a fitting end to that matchup. But we queue, moving on to the finals, moving on to the world championship. So big deal. Big deal. Talking Congratulations. Talking time to recover, TJ. wiki has got a final to play. He's going to need some time to recover to get into that final in a state where he can actually hold a mouse, like point at things. Do you think he's going to be okay there? Do you think he'll make it? I, th how, how I think he'll make it. Yeah, I don't know. Uh, five minutes. That's all you get. But maybe the stress is a little bit relieved. A little bit relieved. But we'll see. Um, we got that final uh, coming up next. But we are going to have to take a, a little bit of a break. Um, of course, like you mentioned, give WeQ a break. But don't go anywhere. The conclusion to the Hearthstone Master Tour Spring Championship right after this.
Hello everyone and welcome back. We've got our grand finals ready to go. I'm Raven and joining me for this one is Sotl. Uh, welcome my friend. Uh, are you ready for this finals? We've had a, a, a longer weekend than we've been recently used to, obviously having the three day play. Uh, but also I felt like I've aged just watching some of these matches with how close they've been, whether the end score actually relates that or not. A lot of moments like that for sure, um, with Bunny Hopper having to grind out kind of an epic series um, in in defeat 0-3 to, to kick things off earlier on in the day. That brutal uh, plague defeat from Habu Gabu Sai, but a glorious plague victory from Piatnitsa, the player that we're looking at right now, and some incredibly grindy shaman games coming out from Wiku to uh, get over the line there as well, followed by that just ridiculously explosive Warlock mirror yeah. <laughs> towards the end with a matter of a single point of damage coming into play for the Zilliax at the end and even just number of minions in play being tantalizingly on the line. So uh, that insane couldn't even do the uh, the double Zilliax play with the uh, the Celestial. I think he was one right. off from being able to do that. Couldn't quite clear enough with the Molten Giant. It's the finest of margins, right? Which when it comes down to the World Championship being on the line, that can be as fine as it gets. But both of these players have achieved goal number one coming into this weekend. Both of these players, Wikiu and Piatnitsa, will be going through to the World Championships. They just have a good chunk of prize money on the line. I think most importantly, the title of Masters Tour Champion, which is becoming a rarer and rarer beast these days. You're starting to join a very, very exclusive club of mm -hmm. players who can call themselves a Masters Tour Champion. 100%. And I think it's, it, you can think of this finals in, in two ways, and I think they're both kind of right. There will be just as an element of pressure off these players, because as you mentioned, they are both qualified to Worlds, so that goal has been achieved for these two. But as you said, one, no one plays this game at this level to come second, right? That just isn't why they play the game to this level at all but also as you mentioned like there's a prize money increase so yeah damn right you want to play some more and get some more prize money so uh we are just ready to go let's get straight into it we've got priest on the top versus shaman along the bottom uh is in this matchup is it just the same old same old game plan for priest at all are they just trying to just pump out the dragons as quick as possible and go or does the fact that they're against shaman make them have to consider some alternate routes it is to an extent um the trojan and the uh the gift wrapped whelp are very key early on because through various combinations of those two minions you can start to make four health boards, which are ludicrously annoying for Shaman to have to deal with. It's very, very hard in the early game to activate a spell damage Crash of Thunder. That's just a very tricky mm. thing to do. So if you can start to get a few minions in play as four fours or three fours, uh, picking up some buffs from the ship's Trojan, that can really represent a ton of damage in the early game. We saw, uh, we've seen a couple of players have to go for like real early tempo flashes in this matchup just to try and clear out some of the early pressure. And uh, in terms of early pressure, oh, this yeah. is about <laughs> as good as it gets right here. What order are they going to go for, honestly? Because there's a few different ways you can go about this as well, right? And I find like this is definitely one of those decks where how you approach the early game can actually have such a huge sort of ripple effect into the rest of the game, even as early as, for example, going into this two drop, as opposed to just going 1-1 one, one, um, uh, with the coin as well, just makes a huge difference. Yeah, I love coin 2-3 here. You can get hit by, uh, like, Bolt Flow Rider would be the best possible turn into this as a response, but even, like, a pop-up book would be kind of awkward. You still have to trade as well from Wiki's side. And with this hand, if you can get these Happy Whelps rolling with the uh, Thirsty Drifter already in hand, mm. then uh, I think you are going to be in business very, very quickly. And that is already now a guaranteed five dragons lined up with the four one-drops in hand already. Yeah. Uh, plus the guaranteed one drop that will come from the draw two. And of course that lines up the Zarimi as well. So looking yeah. like a solid uh, solid turn six Zarimi here potentially. I think this is something that really helps uh, these priests out a lot is 
when you can guarantee some of the outcomes and when, right, means that you can set up the plans as opposed to saying, well, how, do, how heavily do I commit to board if I don't have Zarimi ready for, like, the lethal, blah, 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 you know, all this kind of thing. Whereas if, it, if you just know you can do it, it'll basically on curve, you can really plan this out and uh, Gnitsa might be able to just really go in. I'll have to see how it's going to pay off though, but Jazz Base being able to be equipped and clean up the majority of the board, and as you mentioned before, and we've seen it as you said throughout the tournament, the Flash is in hand to be able to just say, you know what, okay, I'm going to try and stabilize, I'll Flash the next turn, and that'll unlock a lot of options going forward into that turn 5 potentially. Yeah, a lot of needed options as well, yeah. because now the power cord synchronize has been picked up as well. Uh, with these three one drops, you will then get the drifter down to one, so you can play like a one mana drifter on the following turn. Use the synchronize on it. The copy that you get will then cost zero because you've then cast uh, another one cost card with the first drifter. So looking pretty promising from here. Yeah, these answers need to be very specific here. We can win, Sid. Seeing the uh, the pressure coming out, and as you said, a couple of four health minions yeah. there, and they are yeah, 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 quite well. a lot more difficult to deal with. <laughs> Deliberately manipulated that way as well, right? Played yeah. the one that was already four health first, then played the gift wrapped so that the uh, that buff guaranteed to go onto the other minion, yep. which then became a two three, and then got buffed into a two four <laughs> oh, by the Jurgen in play. And would you look at that crash of thunder with the blood mage? Kind of yep. awkward. <laughs> so hard to do four yeah. damage aoe in the early game if you haven't already played the flash and the flash is only just coming down now this turn oh well 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 <laughs> what are you doing here okay wellity 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 <laughs> it's one mana off the utterly disgusting turns though unfortunately can't get a drifter down, sink it, it, and play the dreamboat. Yeah, but it's it's just replica enough. It feels well. You can't guarantee it's stuff obviously because of removal, but I think like that plus drifter seems fine. Yeah, I think so. The scary part is that your opponent's played Flash, right? Otherwise, yeah, if, yeah, if, yeah. If there was no Flash played here, I think you'd replica, you'd play your Dream Boat to get your big minion in play, and then you'd be locked in for the Zarimi on the following turn. You'd be not really thinking about it whatsoever. Uh, I still think that is the play. The issue that you have, though, is because you're not playing an additional one-mana minion on this turn, mm -hmm. if you do get full cleared, then you don't, you can't get that drifter down alongside the Zarimi on the follow-up turn, which is quite annoying if you do end up getting cleared. Okay, lightning reflexes. We could trying to dig deep here. It's tricky, isn't it? Because like tumbleweed is a good card in this matchup, but not right now. <laughs> yeah, pop up's great though. Pop up yeah, gets the job yeah, done. Yeah. Blood mage with the uh, pop up on the five seven, followed by the crash. Get this done nice Such and easily. A good card. Find yourself another lightning reflexes as well. This is a crazy turn for this early of a flash. Ooh. I was going to say, yeah, flash again. I like it. Yep, yep, yep. I feel like the pop up book is just carrying Shaman on its back right now. Yeah. Because, for like, sure. the, the card just it, it ticks so many boxes. And finds double crash as well, so can now sink <laughs> the uh, the pop up book to face. Wow! Has the double AOE to clear down. And this is why Shaman just it, it just keeps ticking along because it's even the hardest. We've seen this throughout the weekend. Even the most tough spots, you can find a way, right? Do you do you find a way is a different question. But the ability to clear these boards and fight back from like almost nothing. Of course, we Q locked the flash in on the previous turn to say yes, next turn I need to do something big, so I'll lock the flash in now. So of course there was some level of setup, but Shaman just has the ability to claw its way back into games that you think are over. We're seeing it now, we've seen it in previous games, even today. Now Pianita has to like think about just 
how to fight back again i know you've spoken about this before but you know pr this priest isn't just it, it, the only thing it does uh, it can do more than just play some dragons on curve hope they lethal and if not it falls over right you can do more than that but in this situation is it possible yeah, particularly with Pjotnitsa's deck because of the Hearthstone Brew that's in there as well. We've actually yes, seen him yes. find some uh, very <laughs> off-the-wall solutions to problems. Oh yeah, seeing Cube again, so I'll just... Made me smile. Actually doesn't go Zarimi here, interesting. Just gonna max out with the Drifters and the Power Cord Synchronize, I would assume, and just hope that this board six, uh, sticks into I mean the... Charge damage. With it's a lot of health, isn't it? To be fair, it is a lot of health. Yeah, you could, of course, have just played the Zarimi and then just done all of this on the following turn, and you'd have like one extra big minion in play. Mm. But I think, all, gonna... all things considered, this is pretty reasonable. Considering the whole board was wiped, this is a good answer, isn't it? Like... Yep. We jiving? We could be jiving. Just Altered one, Cord though. for 7 is also very nice, though, here. Yeah. And I uh, don't actually think Weeku overloaded much, because all of the cards played on the previous turn were like Pop-Up Book and Crash of Thunder and Flash of Lightning, right? Mm -hmm. So It was just the Lightning actually, Bolt, wasn't it? Yeah, not too many overloads that have gone in there at all. So is this Conductivity Altered Chord instead? Don't hate that. Good positioning, mm. by the way. Again, from Pjatnitsa having the uh, the minions separated out. I think ideally, perhaps, the, uh, be the two five nines on the left could be a little bit separated, but having them on uh, far sides. Mm. I guess it wouldn't do... I guess because it... Yeah, I guess it wouldn't matter too much, though, for the one... If they put, like, a different minion in the middle of them... It would still achieve the same thing. Yeah, there's right? no so, way like, with there's five no not to have two but, next to each other anywhere, right? Yeah, You're always going to have two next to each other. But the seven being away from the others actually worked out perfectly, right? Because it wasn't one shot in any of the. Uh, it wasn't getting one shot by the uh, the spell with the right. Thanos on board. Yeah, that was right. really nice. A lot of little frogs on the board now, though, so it's going to take a while to punch through. <laughs> Why does it summon two taunts, Sol? <laughs> it feels like at least one too many. At least one too many. Yeah. One mana, deal two damage, end of sentence. That's the card yeah. you're pitching. <laughs> I mean, as long as it can go face, I think that's a reasonable card. Okay. <laughs> Gonna drop the Zarimi now. I mean, one must spend one's mana, surely. <laughs> Apparently not. Oh, it's. I mean, it's tempting because that taunt's going to stop the whelps, isn't it? Yeah, the taunts stop the trades. Yeah, I, Your opponent I'm, only has two cards I'm down, in hand. honestly. I'm down. I'm kind of in favour of it. Gets and an extra 6-2 in play, clears out another frog immediately, exactly, and adds yeah, plus yeah. one, plus one to the dreamboat. Yeah. needs <laughs> a You can tell just having exactly the conversation we're having and trying to yeah. convince himself either whether to do it or not to do it. Obviously, the Zarimi is now gone, which is... Um, the best card with Leroy in terms of like back to back charge damage. Yeah, yeah But you yeah. do still have the Ananthal in your deck, which is incredibly powerful with Leroy as well if you manage to stick it or get some ridiculous uh, turn mm. with, with Funnel Cakes. The, the worry is it's a 1 in 17 right now, isn't it? Exactly, I mean, yeah. It yeah. feels quite uh, off into the distance. Golgoneth is a. Exactly the card we will be after in this specific situation, right? Low on cards in hand, got a bit of a board to deal with. The options are all there. Yeah, three damage AoE plus the four damage lightning bolt is really, really strong here. And with the two frogs. 
probably quite safe as well in terms of being able to use another ability next turn. Saying that, could I interest you in transforming a frog into an elemental fire lord of doom? Oh, that's happening. Yeah, that yeah, is, that's, that is the yeah. fairy tale that was uh, never told, wasn't it? No, no, no. The clock has struck 12. This frog turns back into its natural form. <laughs> Bolt AoE. I think the real point of contention there for Wiki may have actually just been pressing draw 3 yeah, instead of the yeah. AoE. Oof. Yeah, because that's the thing, right? Like, now, let's just live in the world and where... And he's gone. <laughs> just live in the world where this gets cleared up. Uh, the thing Wiku doesn't have is cards right now, right? Whereas he has health, he has yep. the board for now. But, like, the cards was definitely the missing factor. Virgie, yep. though? Has to be Funnel Cake. It is Funnel Cake, okay. Mm -hmm. I wasn't prepared for what the next step in this chain was, <laughs> but it definitely did have to be that. Ah. No. <laughs> no. Uh, if, this, if there was a Tempo Leroy on board, I mean, it would be dead, <laughs> but, it, uh, but still... Power cord synchronize the frog. Put a wall up. <laughs> They'll never get through theirs. Maybe <laughs> maybe this frog will turn into a Ragnaros as well. Is it like synchronize the blood mage Thalnos in all seriousness? Just to like find another card draw to find your way out of this? Uh, but you can't draw it now, right? No, no, no. You can't draw it now That's because you're two outs for the yeah. next turn. I mean, sure, at this point. Yeah, why not? Yeah. The issue is weak, you just presses draw three on the well, Golganeth. And can draw four, right, with yep. the Thalnos extra. So there's just like about 8,000 outs at this point for uh, weak you. Yep, yeah, that'll, that'll do. That do will it. do. Wiku taking game number one, and again, just shows how flexible this Shaman deck, or this Shaman deck, you know, archetype, let's say, uh, actually is, and off to a great start. But Piednita, like, almost got there, and I feel like I feel like that's been the story of the tournament. Like, so many games where one player, it's not like uh, that often players have been getting wiped out and it's super one-sided games it's like one place that like, almost there and then someone either stabilizes or they just about get lethal and it's just a, i don't know it's been a, a, a definitely a roller coaster of a tournament so far and i expect the finals to be exactly the same but yeah look at this setup the setup was good but miku got hold of that clear and managed to stabilize from that point really good play from both players though i think extremely solid game one here yeah, just one mana off on a couple of crucial turns from Pianitza to be able to fully load up with everything and have a much more powerful Zarimi turn. Uh, chose to try and hold out on the Zarimi for that one extra turn to try and give all of those uh, Thirsty Drifters uh, charge damage, essentially. At the end, could have just played it out for that extra turn earlier on, had the extra 4-6 in play, maybe could have made a difference if it had been, happened that time around. But I think uh, once the Golgoneth came down as a follow-up to the two yeah. big clearance turns for, for Week U, it just felt like uh, pretty insurmountable to that point, I think. Um, it was going to need to be Amenthal or Bust, and there was not really enough time given to uh, to Piatnica to be able to find that Amenthal to find a way out. Yeah, because there was not really... Uh, the, the clergy showed up very late to the party, right? So the card yeah. draw, sometimes in the priest games, you get the clergies early, and you can actually cycle very quickly through your deck. But when you miss those, that's pretty much it, outside of uh, pulling the dragons, of course, but that's pretty much it for card draw. So if you miss those, you're not digging deep and playing with those sort of expected draws off the top. So it can be a little bit tricky sometimes, but that means we are one up in our series with Wiku taking the lead on that Shaman, but there's, uh, I still think there's hope because there's a Death Knight on the other side. So, and I know uh, you've spoken a bit about Death Knight this weekend, and oh, here we are. Um, and, uh, but it's a deck I, uh, I genuinely enjoyed uh, this set. Uh, so far, and it's uh, probably the deck I've played by far the most now. Here, though, going up against the Warlock. Oof. This, <laughs> I feel like 
the strength of this warlock deck or the outcome has so little to do with the opponent a lot of the time. <laughs> it's, more, it's more just like you play, you're just like, right, okay, how low does my health go versus how many minions can I put out? And that just decides the win. <laughs> so good. It still seems strange to me to be seeing the Felstring Harp in there as well. I think yeah, yeah. Uh, Wiki might be the only player in the tournament who has gone with the Harp in the, the Warlock. Um, I, you know, there's this kind of two contesting school of thoughts where like instinctively you're like, okay, you know, I've got a whole bunch of self-damage cards in my deck, so the Harp does make sense um, philosophically, but then you realize that as soon as you start preventing that damage from any of that, those self-damage cards, your deck just ends up doing mm. absolutely nothing, right? So it really is only there as a late game stabilizing tool, like after you've already pushed yourself down to the yeah. point where your, your horrors and your molten giants are active. I think my struggle with the card, because, I, I mean, I've not tested the harp tons or anything. It's not like, you know, Wiku will know a million times more than I will about this. But my worry is I struggle to think of the situations where I would rather draw a harp than other cards in the deck. Right? Mm -hmm. I think that's where I sort of land where it's like, I can't imagine drawing a harp and being like, oh, yeah, great. Now I'm going to do well, apart from, like, hyper-specific situations. Already, though. Convince her off to a fantastic start. This is the opening you want. One drop into these uh, two paladins, soon to be uh, ghouls. Gives you so much board presence, so much uh, ability to react to your opponent's board as well, because those ghouls do have charge. Yeah, when you actually engage with the flavor of the card of Mining Casualties, it's freaking morbid, isn't it? When you actually oh, yeah. sit there and think about it. Not a very pleasant card. Yeah. To be fair, Death Knights are pretty morbid in general. <laughs> yeah, that's true. But just look at those pallets. Like they're, they're they're so they're so vibrant and full of life. They've got hopes and dreams for their mm. futures. And so they just did get Arthas. sent to the mines. <laughs> yeah, so did Arthas. Look how that turned out. Yeah, well, you've lost me. Oh no! You know that blue guy at the top of the screen in the big portrait? Aha. Uh -huh. That's yeah, I, I, I know. I know. I know who Arthas. Well, I sort of know who Arthas. Is, <laughs> I know, but I don't know what Arthas's hopes and dreams were before he became the Lich King. You know. So he was a paladin. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. Yeah, yeah. Actually, was a paladin. He was a uh, under Uther. Yeah, sounds like a good time. Mm. <laughs> there is the uh, Azerite Crusher, probably. Uh, one of the backbones of just this class right now, I would say, honestly, because like, this weapon is so powerful. I've seen a lot of people talk about it recently on social media, and it's just like, is it too strong to lifesteal, the freeze, the amount of charges you can get when you combine it with the ability to discover it and give it an extra durability as well? Uh, my answer would be yes, it's very strong. But when you're the one playing it, it's great. It's a hard choice. Oh, Takes the molten. molten. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Obviously, Rook was an immediately big thing, which would then allow you to, if it lived, you play the Forge the next turn, you can copy one big minion, you're probably taking a bit of damage again this turn, you can Spirit Bomb something and maybe get that one Molten Giant that you already have down. Mm -hmm. But uh, Weak you just, just going for Pader with the uh, the double Molten Giant instead, and immediately oh rips Spirit Bomb number two off the top. That is... <sighs> Huge. And the Zilliax is there as well. Like not not for now, but just the fact it's available is huge. For the follow up. The only issue we have here is you are making a colossal board commitment into a board where Threads of Despair would just absolutely delete you. You are oh you kill one. No no you kill three, right? You kill three, yeah. That's not too bad. So then you have two sources of three damage controlled, right? By trading off the other two. You have the weapon for another three. And then if those three attacks kill another minion, you're then AoEing for one. So if you just have eight eights in play, you might be okay. I think, yeah. But well, one will I be think... lower, right? One will be lower. One will be, one will be a six, six yeah. yeah. 
Oh, we keep going all in here with the smaller health minions as well, mm. which might just come back to bite him a little bit, but I don't begrudge this at all. Yeah, I, th I, I thought it was going to hold the Zilliax. I do philosophically vibe extra hard with, oh, I can play my entire hand this turn. <laughs> I guess I just do that. Oh, I hate threads math. I think I said this on day one of the show of I actually just never count when I play threads and just say, yeah, it's, there's a Correct. board. It'll yeah, clear. Yeah, it did. yeah, that's the right way to do it. <laughs> but this is a little awkward, that... actually, because the the near fight will go off immediately if you trade either of the two twos into it, which would then kill the other two two without it attacking. So you need to attack into something else with mm -hmm. the first two two first and then go into a near fight. Look how big a deal the Neophyte is, though, because it stopped Second Army of the Dead Threads, because that would have been a clear. It would, yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't, I don't think that's the thing that you should really like consider playing around, right? Because it's such a specific two-card combo with like, oh, the yeah, second I'm just, copy I'm of just Army. Oh, yeah, I'm just about the impact it has had, as opposed yes. to, you know, yeah, 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 it's, it's huge. Because I think there's, what, two corpses left? So even two extra ghouls would be a pretty big deal. Mm-hmm. Yep, take out Zilly. Oh. Yeah, this is just hold because you could just just take this damage, right? Yeah, just tanks the damage. Okay, fine, 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 fine. We could just play Symphony, right? Uh, we is playing Symphony, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, pretty sure everyone is, but we certainly is. Yeah, because that's a bit scary, <laughs> but hey. <laughs> Yeah, two outs for Symphony Lethal, the six damage lifesteal and the plus six plus six. Both would have done it. Mm -hmm. Now, you know what I'm like. I'm about to ask you a bit of a silly question. Does Weeku need to commit this minion to this board? It's a pretty good silly question, as far as silly questions go. Ooh. Oh, now you do. Yes, Get it agreed, in there. agreed. Yes. Get that now, thing okay. in play. Yeah, now you do. Completely agree. But I think before we saw that draw, it was a decent question, at least, because you just add in something that if there's AOE clear anyway, yeah, you're going to just dive into that and cause problems. Yep. 100%. And it gives you something guaranteed for Forge. But yeah, this is... <sighs> I mean, I can't. Oh, one off. Oh, the stomper. Stomper. The stomper Absolute is so nuts. powerful. Headless horseman kills one, gains five armor, but that's just not enough now. <laughs> <laughs> oh wait, hang on. Five nineteen. No, it's still not enough with the weapon swing, right? Oh, what a clutch draw. And there's nothing because it's just, oh, just not being able to hit the uh, the crop with the poison. Oh, my yep. God. like yep. the, that's the one combo this deck has that just nopes a board, isn't it? You know, like you play the, um, the grime, the crop. And you just say, the board's clear, it's fine, whatever. But that, oh, the speaker stomper coming down exactly now. One mana off. Disgusting. And we is just like, yes, burn rope, burn. And that is going to be game two, subtle yet again. Another game that's coming down to the wire. Because even though it looked, yes, WeQ put out a ton of giants, power, a ton of pressure. But without that speaker stomper, that board was cleared. And if that board's cleared, the game ends, but to the other person, right? So it's like, it's so close. But WeQ is 2 0 up. Yeah, and it made the decision so much simpler as well yes. as we were as we were about to talk about because when you have to sit there and break down like every world where you get punished for not playing the extra 5-5, five five, right? Because, okay, the easy part is, well, if I play the extra 5-5 five five and they just have some sort of threads of despair clear, then I've just completely committed my whole board. I have nothing to activate the forge next turn anyway. Right. I'm threatening lethal with this board. I should probably just hold it. But then you have to start thinking about, well, hang on. 
what if it is just um, the uh, what's the name of the card? The Summon Poisons thing. I, I don't think I've ever known the name of that card in my entire life, actually. It's the... Um... Sticky Grime Walker. A sickly yes, Grime, grime Walker. Yeah, I just call it Grime. But yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so, like, if you only have three minions in play, like, suddenly that plus crop rotation is a full clear, right? But, mm-hmm. like, does adding a fourth minion really change that? You have to go through all of those different things about whether it's worth committing that final minion to the board. But when you tap into Speaker Stomper instead, suddenly it becomes simple because you know at that point there's no combination that really mm-hmm. interacts with that board particularly hard. And I think even though WeQ knows that deep within his soul... The, uh, the current anxieties of the position that he finds himself in. He's like, nope, he's going to find a clear somehow. I don't know what it is, but the clear's going to find. I'm off. I'm doing laps around my room. You can't stop me. And that is what we've seen for uh, large periods of this tournament so far. But Piatnica is going back to the well one more time with this Rainbow Death Knight. He's brought it to the tournament. It has served him well. He had 100% win rate with the deck coming in to, uh, to day three. And WeQ is currently... Uh, making a huge dent in that win rate by uh, picking up a victory now against the deck. And now it's coming down to the Warrior from Wiki. Yeah, and in my experience, I found this to be a really weird matchup, uh, let's say as the Death Knight player, because on one hand, you might think, oh, well, because they, all the Death Knights now play like the two down with the ship, uh, you obviously have um, Elia, and then you want to put tons of uh, uh, tons of the plagues in right and stop some mm-hmm. of the shenanigans and, and basically kill the warrior through plagues and um, the problem with that is the second you don't do that at a reasonable rate if the warrior gets to land odin you do kind of just die so it gets really yep. tricky Um it's not even though the plan you can say is sort of simple you do still have to be pretty flexible because you, you can't really kill your opponent in any reasonable speed. So it's a weird one where y- you both kind of have inevitability and it just depends on like how the, if the plagues play nice or how early the plagues go in. And there's also the factor of how long does uh, does the Death Knight hold things like... Uh, I keep wanting, wanting to call it down with the sickness, uh, but down with the ship. Uh, oh, that's because, what I call it every single time. I yeah, uh, how is it not called that? Let's be yeah, honest. I don't know. So, mm-hmm. Hearthstone card names are fantastic. This one, though, I would have renamed it myself. But anyway, um, like you don't really want to do down with the ship before you've played Hellier, right? Because then those can just go away. So it's all just there's a lot of weird sort of hoops you've got to jump through to even give yourself a chance. Even though at the surface it looks like death knight should just stomp this warrior because you've got freeze for the face you've got plagues to shuffle into a sort of slower style deck it should be easy but honestly in my experience at least it's not but that is the factor you mentioned it towards the end right is if you can time those quartzite crushes uh very deftly then you can you can go through like the turn nine, the turn ten, and the turn eleven with the freezes, which means that the the Odin pressure isn't real because they can't actually do any damage with their face frozen the entire time. Mm. Um, and then you can use that time to allow the plagues through hopefully a hell year and everything else to to tick along at that mm. point. Uh, Warrior has a little bit of game against that because they can spend like one turn playing a Reno to unfreeze their own face and try and get a little bit of damage through if it comes down to it, but that's normally not going to be enough to uh, to threaten lethal in in most situations. It's tricky, honestly, because like like I said, a bit of the worry is if you don't stack up all the plagues quickly, and also if you just maybe get a bit unlucky with the plague ordering. Right? Sometimes you get three to you've got eight plagues in the deck and they just don't go off for three turns like that can happen and if you save the weapon and then swing after the odin because you kind of have to start freezing them after the odin right because Mm -hmm. they've played odin well you're also swinging for three and again you're not really killing the warrior if they can put out some armor so you need to really thread the needle i think um so we'll see uh, yeah, the part, be- that, the part that does work in your favor there, though, is that the Warrior is such a draw-heavy deck that they get down to, like, their last eight yes. to five cards yeah. very, very quickly, right? Normally by that point in the game, so if you I have also got have recency the bias. There, I lost this on. matchup right before we went live. <laughs> ah, I see. Okay, yeah, no, that makes sense. So it's impossible, clearly, if I lost it once. I mean, So it's, it's an just... unwinnable matchup. <laughs> yeah. It's the only explanation. It can't possibly be my choices. <laughs> Mm. 
It's always a Fred's good enough start. Despair, not quite as threatening in this matchup as it was no. in the previous one, even though it actually never came into play in the previous game. It was the defining factor, even though only one player had the full knowledge that it was available. Yeah. A lot of it comes down to actually uh, just clears of trial by fire is where Threads, I think, finds its home in this matchup. Yeah. Because uh, that's the, the awkward thing to deal with a lot of the time. I do love this, though. The, um, the early horsemen is great because you want to start generating these like j just extra threats because that is how you definitely can speed up the clock right not only are you hitting your opponent for three with the hero power but you can start choosing the most like actually like aggro style undead minions Weak huge is powering through Shield yeah. block, unsurprisingly, by far the most popular gift choice that we've uh, seen this weekend in the Warrior. Drop in the Needle Rock Totem for a bit more cycle, queuing up that Verse Riff as well, just getting it stored in there for the second one. And now there's Double Crusher already it's... lined up for Piadnid, so that's so much freezing power for the late game. It really is, but this is where it gets a little bit tricky as well, is there's the Trade Snake Oil, right, mm -hmm. which is fine, but... They don't want to play down with the ship yet, because no hell yeah. Yep. They could equip a weapon, which, you know, is fine, but they're not going to swing it. So it's like, is this turn effectively hero power pass, <laughs> right? Like, in a, in a broad manner of speaking? It's possible. I mean, you could. I think now that you have six total charges, you could consider just getting in there and, and giddying up with the weapon. Yeah. Oh, okay, okay. Kind of that mind. helps. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I was going to say the snake oil trade is where I would have also started the turn. Gets to whip in the three damage as well with the hero power. Pretty nice. I think Pianitza just wants to uh, get hold of this the horseman's head like ASAP, honestly. Because then you feel way more comfortable holding on to these key tools. Bladestorm and Armourer, I would presume. Not bad though as well. There's what, 10 corpses is going to be... Th oh, oh my, there we go. <laughs> Told you, that's the game. That is pause, fast. Man. And now that hero power is going to be pressed pretty much every turn. Or at least that's how I would approach it. And start trying to get some of these more threatening uh, minions down. Maybe generate some minions that can generate more plagues as well to try and cause max havoc. Oh, speaking of which, now you're here. Be honest. You would have had three Leroy's in your deck immediately that game, right? Yeah, did you not see the, the gif I posted in reply? Yes, Raven, but you know how this... But all of our viewers, who I am now addressing this question to in reality, did not. Which is why I'm now bringing it up. I was just making sure you saw it because it was works. funny. <laughs> yeah, I used the he's out of line, but he's right in yep. response because, yeah, you were coming. I was watching, I was listening, and I was kind of sat there going, Yeah, if he's right, he's right. What can I say? <laughs> and you know, you would have appreciated it though, as well. Yeah, yeah. Here, though, it's a bit of a tough choice. Who's the Zilliax? Are you doing a look at Puppeteer just for the value? But honestly, a part of me just leans to the skeleton crew, just playable stuff. Mornpaw is definitely going to help. I say Mornpaw is going to help. It's a high health uh, card. It's a semi-priority kill, let's say. But if you gain 5, 10 health here and there, it's kind of a rookie numbers when a warrior is hitting you for 8,000, isn't it? Oh, yeah. Already down to 8 cards in deck, by the way. Yep. 8 mana, 8 cards left in deck. This is what I mean. Like If, if uh, Pianitza can pick up the Hellia from here... And then start loading up those crushes. That is going to be ludicrous amounts of plate yeah. damage coming through before Weak is actually able to respond and do anything. And and that's the hurdle, isn't it? Nineteen cards left in deck, and you need exactly one of them. Yep. Oh, oh! oh my! Oh my! First Let's... the horseman into the head very quickly, and then hell yeah. With eight, well, 19 cards at the time left. How was that hell you already not hit the board? That's my question. Let's get cooking. Oh, Stitch Giant. 
Yeah, I don't think well, a, lot, a lot has actually been spent so far. I, I, was, I, yeah, I just ooed as well because I actually think now because of the Hellia, the Nerubians better, right? Deal with these three taunts for the weapon swings, and then you've got the freeze. Just add incredible defensive layers now because these plagues will do the work for you. Sure. And yep, yeah, <laughs> week is like, okay, you did your thing, I'm doing mine. Let's see. And this is where the taunts are going. So what is actually available? There's... Oh, there is a Sanitize. I didn't see it for a second then. That's huge. Yeah, Sanitize is there. It's already been forged as well. Which is a big yeah. deal. Yeah. Double Razor Fen. Weeku, please. <laughs> My heart rate's going up at this point. <laughs> yeah, he's not going to like the way this one ends, though, I don't think. Yeah, but how much damage can Weeku put out? It is a lot, isn't it? Yeah, well, none once he gets frozen. Oh, yeah, that's a slight issue. Reska there as well to clean up the Odin. Well, wait, I, I was doing a poor job as well. How many of those are plagues now? So there's the Hellier ones? Five, yeah. Is it five? Okay. Yeah, going to go for the Reno. Mm -hmm. To unfreeze, makes sense. Uh, Wait, is that lethal? With the ver Wait, is that enough oh, with the Verse it Rift? Is. No it shot! Is. It is! Oh, because the Verse Rift costs twice! Swing. He's already got yeah. one loaded in there! Oh, oh my god, I thought it was like 22! <laughs> I did not count! The second oh. Verse Rift being loaded in there, which ramps up so much extra damage! And in fact, WeQ is going to like how this one ends. He absolutely got there. He knew. He had it counted. I did not. What an incredible finish in the end. Able to get over the line with just a single Razor Fen and a Verse Riff. I did not think that was anywhere in the neighborhood. I was like mid-20s with how much damage that was. But I think he had like five over in the end with that weapon yeah. swing going through as well. Just was not accounting properly for the Craftsman Hammer and the, uh, the extra loaded up Verse Riff being thrown in there as well. Absolutely huge stuff uh, from Weeku. And as you were saying, there was uh, there were options there with the uh, the Nerubian swarmers available that could have been played out to uh, prevent that kind of thing from happening, yeah. which maybe Piadnitsa has to take a little look at because uh, the extra taunts in play might have been a big deal, even if it involved uh, leaving the 8 up on the other side. But week you saw what we didn't immediately. Yeah, yeah 35 damage in the end. And that is going to mean that week you is going to be your Masters Tour Spring champion. I'm sure if they were face-to-face -face in, in person, they'd have a very hearty handshake and a, and a warm embrace as they are both going to the World Championship already at this point. Lock that up by making it to the finals. But it is only one of them that goes home with the, the winner's share of the prize pool and the glory of being known as a Masters Tour champion. WeQ joins a very, very elite list of players. Yeah, definitely a tricky ending. Like I said, both players in that last game specifically, they were both doing what they wanted to do, right? They were hitting those targets. But yeah, just maybe the taunt should have come out because Reno was the only real threat at that point. But yeah, what a way to end it. WeQ all over those numbers and that armor gain. Always underestimated is the amount of uh, armor and then damage a warrior can put out after that Odin. But yeah, there's your top eight bracket. Um, well, we like we said this on Friday because, uh, you know, we were on pretty early saying like, yeah, we've not cast our on tournament, but feels like a while now. This is like the first major of the year. And what a tournament. I know you specifically were talking about just the sheer quality of player we have in this tournament uh, for this weekend. And I think uh, at least I am not disappointed. I think they've lived up to their uh, uh, the quality you were talking about at the start of the weekend. Yeah, yeah, it's been an awesome tournament. I think some of the series have been incredibly memorable. There have been mistakes and errors and so on throughout, but that is that is the way no one can play Hearthstone perfectly. No one has achieved that over, you know, more than a sample of one game, right? Like I doubt anyone can 
earnestly say that they've actually played like an entire series of Hearthstone perfectly, let alone an entire tournament perfectly. Um, it's an incredibly difficult game to play optimally, particularly as, you know, variance increases in some of these decks. And I do think we're in a meta right now that is uh, quite decision dense in general. And you can see mm -hmm. even there through the end, like Wii Q navigated that beautifully. I will say like the hand lined up very, very well for the warrior, you know, without um, Acolyte cheap aftershocks these days, it's kind of rare that you go through that quickly to the end of your deck. Yeah. Um, but to, to maintain your calm, even though your opponent was kind of hitting everything, right? Like, hit the horseman early, hit the head early, hit the hellier early, hit the freeze early, had everything. Like I said, both looked... players were doing exactly what they wanted to do in that matchup. It was crazy. Yep. Like... Looked like everything was lined up, and particularly for a player that is clearly that stressed out during the games, right? Like, constantly getting up burning some energy by walking around the room um you know people perceive kind of uh tilt or distraction in different ways right and if that's what it takes for you to actually remain focused on what you're doing to burn that energy out by getting up and being expressive and walking around if that's what works for you and if that allows you to focus on the game and play that well then you know more power to you because i think week you has put in a fantastic performance uh, over the last couple of years at this point you know putting yep. in a great grind in the previous year as well really clearly taking to this uh, this open grinder system like a, like a duck to water 100% uh, just qu very quickly turn into just a household name of Hearthstone but what feels like a blink of an eye that is the weekend over that is the tournament over we are done for this Masters Tour so just before we go I'd like to say just thank you guys for watching thanks to all the players for putting on such a great show uh, all the matches were fantastic we hope you had a great time and we will see you next time